मैंने तो कब बता दिया हम लोग तो इसके लिए वेलकम डॉक्टर देवराव मैडम वेलकम हेलो नीरज कुमार नीरज कुमार वेलकम डॉक्टर देवराय मैडम डॉक्टर देवराय स्टैन हेलो गुड मॉर्निंग सर हाँ गुड मॉर्निंग वेलकम मैडम गुड इवनिंग एंड मॉर्निंग एवरीवन नमस्ते मैम Good morning, ma'am. Happy to see you after a long time. 
मुझे भी बहुत खुश लगती हूँ हाँ आपसे कितने बार बात हुई और फिर finally we get got together on it thoda thoda bhul gaya bolta hai welcome we connected after a long time since 6 months we are talking on emails yes <laughs> i had to save some amdara something for you for the end thank you thank you I see Udaipur Circle is here. Rajasthani represent. That's good. So, are we waiting for everyone to join? Yes, madam. Okay, I will okay. mute myself. Just, 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 just two minutes, madam. Doctor Neeraj Kumar. Yes. I'm here. Oh, welcome, sir. Welcome. Oh, hello. Yes, sir. John, sir. Oh, good morning, everyone. And uh, now, second day, first session. Our eminent speaker, Dr. Devo Rai L. Stein, senior lecturer. history of art and visual studies california college of art and lecturer san francisco state university usa welcome madam our chair co uh, um, chair person dr neeraj kumar tripathi divisional superintendent department of archaeology and museum rajasthan and co chair person dr lalit pande former director professor sahit sansthan vidyapeet deemed university udaipur welcome all of you and i am requesting to dr neeraj kumar tripathi sir please preside the session and uh, introduce our eminent speaker dr devo rai stein dr neeraj kumar good morning to all our honorable members myself neeraj tripathi divisional superintendent archaeology and museums first of all my heartiest congratulations to professor iskan misra ji and his team to organize a, such a grand webinar and my sincere thanks to him to provide opportunity to me to join this grand webinar and i would like to also say it is my great privilege that i have got the opportunity to chair this session because metallurgical aspects of the rajasthan it is my also favorite subject because i am uh, basically i am archaeologist but my graduation in the science field bsc i have done bsc from physics chemistry and maths and metallurgy and somewhere metallurgy uh, attract to me in the especially archaeo metallurgy so that's why it is very great privilege to me and first of all introducing today's speaker dr dibura i feel proud that she is working in that area of the india that tribal section where it is not easy to work among them without proper consent salute to her because chatisgarh and rajasthan adivasi legacy of the rajasthan which was typical uh, i think that the she has done the lots of work in the adivasi uh, community especially uh, mewar and other region where the metallurgical aspects of the adivasi is very uh, prominent and they are, they have done the lots of metallurgical work in jawar area and the adjacent area where it is very popular and the just like the geo heritage side of the india also so it is my pleasure to introduce her and very good morning to him to her our eminent speaker of this session dr debora elstein senior lecturer history of arts and the visual studies dr elstein holds doctorate from the university of california us and she is the author of the hegemony of the heritage rituals and um, several in the stones recording the stone dr elstein spends lots of time of her life in rajasthan 
conducting architectural, art, historical, archaeological, and epigraphical researches. In India, she is involved in the studies of the tribal and types and the metallurgy. She is the author of a, several peer reviewed articles and serves as a peer reviewer of, for multiple publications in Switzerland and the UK. And she currently resides in San Francisco, where she teaches Indian art to US students. So now I don't want to take more time and I would like to request Dr. Sen to start a lecture on the topic Minerals, Metallurgy and Monumentality, Art History and the Adivasi Legacies in Early Medieval Rajasthan and Late Gupta era in Chhattisgarh. So please start Dr. Deepak. Thank you so much for this warm welcome. I would like to thank Alkesh Zaveri for putting me in contact um, with Dr. Mishra. I was very excited to working with the botanist. I think a lot of times, uh, and I also want to thank you um, and the Uday Forest Circle for such a warm welcome. I'm happy to be here among fellow Rajasthanis, um, including my own um, Rajasthani sister from Aiklinji of my adopted family. So that is extra special um, for me to get to have um, this virtual visit um, with all of you. Uh, namaste. That's my big sister. Uh, and so uh, I'm very uh, excited to be with all of you today. And I'm going to share a few slides with you. Um, this, as you mentioned, is a very big topic, right? Um, Adivasi studies is huge. Metallurgy is a very large topic. Uh, uh, Archaeology is. And I'm covering two different areas. One area, uh, which was the subject of an article that I wrote about Jawar, and one area um, which was actually the subject of my master's thesis, and I was excited to talk about it virtually in MP, um, because when I was writing about Tala um, uh, near Raipur and Ranjim, um, that was actually part of uh, MP. Now, of course, it is part of uh, Chattisgarh, as I'm sure many of you know, since you're right there in the neighborhood today. So without further ado, let me just uh, get these slides up and going for you guys. Let's see if this will work. Hmm, I'm seeing a weird infinity effect. Are you seeing that too? I can also no longer hear you. Can someone type in the messages? Can you hear me right now? Yes, ma'am, we can hear you. Okay, good. But you see my entire screen. I need to figure out how to just do a part of a screen. Uh, one sec. How about now? Is that better? Yes. Right. Okay, let me do this. Oh. This tiny Put this in the corner so I can see all of you. I'll make this very tiny. Okay, one minute. Thank you for the technical help. I am my own staff here in the United States. We don't have a lot of helpers. Okay, I am going to assume you're out there. And I'm going to ask you to unmute if you have any questions or need to stop me. I cannot see myself or you at this point. Can you see my screen? Yes, ma'am. Yes, we can see your screen. Wonderful. Okay, so I'm here to talk to you today about minerals, metallurgy, and monumentality. And what I'm trying to do is to bring together art history and Adivasi legacies. So usually art history and archaeology are about monumentality, which means we're talking about stone 
buildings, which are Brahmanical. Uh, I'm going to try to speak slowly. I know that I speak in West Coast California English and not international English or Indian English. So I know that if you're not used to my accent, it might be a little hard to understand. Um, and I'm leaving some time for questions at the end. So I'm comparing two sites where over the course of the past 25 years in India, I have found similar uh, situations where you have this kind of trifecta of uh, mineral deposits of um, really strong tribal presence, um, Adivasi presence, um, and at times um, contemporary political conflict between Adivasi and the state in relation to natural resources and minerals. None of those things are things that we usually think about when we think about temples. We usually um, think about um, puja. We might think about sculpture. Uh, we might think about different uses. We might think about dynastic history. But dynastic history often doesn't really capture um, the Adivasi side of things unless you get into uh, some mythology and I'll have a chance to tell you some stories today. So first of all, why minerals? It's a strange thing for an art historian to be working on, though as the many Rajasthanis here know, it's a normal thing for anyone working in Rajasthan to think about. So in India and around the world, indigenous people live near natural resources and have for millennia. And I can think of many examples of this, um, but here uh, we have some famous global examples. So one is the Dakota pipeline in the United States. I'm not sure if anyone has uh, heard of that in the international news. I'm, I'm not gonna be dwelling on that today. I'm gonna be focusing on our... Oh, somebody needs to mute. Can all of you please um, assure that you're muted? Otherwise, all of us get background noise. Thank you so much. Uh, so Aboriginal sacred sites in Australia are another example of this, um, where we see rich mineral deposit um, on sacred lands. And those two things um, come together long before any histories of mining. The Jawar zinc mines in Southern Rajasthan, I use a spelling because I'm a medievalist. So my perspective is usually around 1500. Those of you who are driving on roads in Rajasthan today in the 21st century might know this more as Zawar with a Z rather than a J. And the last uh, place I am thinking of as an example is the mineral rich newly formed state of Chattisgarh, which is near MP. Um, and you guys can put in the chat if any of you are zooming in from Chattisgarh today. So let's look at a few of these places. So I don't know how familiar you are or are not with uh, United States geography or indigenous peoples. I would not expect you to be, but the home of the Dakota pipeline protests um, were uh, by the Standing Rock Sioux. So the Sioux spelled here S-I-O-U-X are indigenous people of the United States. Dakota is in um, the middle of the country, not by a coast, towards the top yes, by sir. Canada. Yes? Sub TK? Can you hear me? Please continue, ma'am. Okay, so Dakota is a mineral rich area as well. And South Dakota has uh, leads in mica production, but it also has construction. It has sand and gravel, crushed stone, um, not the same marble that we have in Rajasthan, but um, dimension stone, feldspar, gemstones, uh, gold, 
uh, which is something that often leads to conflict between the state and uh, indigenous people. Gypsum, industrial sand and gravel, lime and silver. Um, they don't list zinc here. I don't know if they have zinc or not. Zinc and silver are also often found in mines together. And they have a protected water source on tribal land. So here is uh, on one side, the slide that Microsoft imagines when they imagine in PowerPoint what Dakota looks like. And you see an industrial farming scene there, big skies, uh, kind of manifest destiny view of what land is and what it means to own it from a settler colonial perspective. And on the other side, you see a really important reservoir um, at the top of the Missouri River. So if you're at all familiar with the geography of the middle of the United States, which on the coast, most of my students um, are not either. Um, Missouri is in the southern part, but this river runs north to south. Um, and so this is actually what the Sioux tribe is thinking about when they're thinking about this land and they don't want their water to be polluted. So there was a big um, protest against a pipeline because there was going to be oil spills and in it uh, then this water source um, would be poisoned, which is the main water source which feeds their uh, reservation uh, or their reserved land. Aborin Aboriginal Australia, I'm not going to get into in great detail. It's something that you could look into. Um, Aboriginal people have been in Australia since time immemorial. It's a mini mineral rich area. Um, there are several there and, oh, I don't have that slide with me um, right now, but uh, there are geo mappings of sacred sites um, in Australia in relation to minerals that you can zoom into that I can't really fit into a PowerPoint. Um, but if you want uh, links to that comparative research, I can help you with that in the Q&A. Jawar, a little closer to home um, for most of us in the heart, or in your case, geographically, and maybe in the heart, uh, we have the home of the Zawar Zinc Mines and Rajasthan Zinc Limited, as many of you know. Archaeological evidence of zinc smelting goes back to at least the 1390s for Mewari's or students of Mewari history, um, that brings us back to um, Lakshing um, Mewar. So one of the four to five earliest Shoshodia um, Mewari rulers in the region. Um, but I will get into that in a little bit. All of us these days in the 21st century are used to thinking about government and governance as nations as nation states, right? So you probably think of Delhi, uh, or if you're in South India, you might in a more complicated way think about Delhi. Um, if say your first language is a Dravidian language, right? Or I might think about Washington DC, but on the West Coast, I might be thinking more about the Silicon Valley, right? So these are how we think of it today. And in this lecture, I have a hand-drawn map that I made based on GPS points that I collected in the field 20 years ago before SMS had been invented when nobody knew what my weirdo GPS thing was. Um, and that shows us that actually if we look at the history of kind of governance and geography that you know, and some of you who live in more rural parts of India know the power of the panchayat or the village council today. The idea of a centralized government around one capital um, was very kind of different um, a thousand years ago uh, or even 500 years ago uh, or even in some parts of India now. So the key this this site at Jawar, not only is it an important site of minerals today and a thriving site of Adivasi culture, uh, it also uh, was the place where zinc smelting was invented. And I have a map for you of an alchemical site, which goes back to the kind of tantric origins of, um, of alchemy. 
And for everything tantric, I want to give a shout out and an honor to my now sadly late um, Rajasthani dad, Pujari Ji Dashora, who taught me everything I know about Tantra. So we'll get to that in a little bit. But basically in the 16th century, there was a silver crisis in all of Persia and in China. Um, and so zinc was exported then, and that is when this site rose to prominence. Uh, and then we have mineral mining, mining evidence, and this will excite the Udaipur circle, I imagine, dating back to prehistoric times, or maybe it's not that exciting if you've known that all along, but it's something that I think we could celebrate, right? So we have evidence of mining that goes back to the same time period as um, Ahar, um, historically. So these are two different views of Jawar. On the one hand over here, can you guys see my arrow? Yes, yes ma'am. Wonderful. Okay, so over here we have what to me is the most exciting um, and interesting archeological evidence, but what to you might look like a blurry gray photo. And over here we have what, you know, say the ASI, um, might like to put on their museum website, um, on their, um, you know, not museum website, but their public facing website as, you know, an important monument. This is the Jawar Mata temple uh, where there's still a very active multiple traditions taking place here um, uh, every Navratri uh, and also throughout the year. Uh, this is a site, Jawar Mata, the goddess um, who is worshipped in this temple, is uh, sisters with Jagadamba, um, Amba Mata, um, and with Isana Mata, and all of this uh, uh, sisterhood is sung in um, the kata, or the story, uh, which used to be available uh, at the local bus stand on cassette tape back in the day. I'm sure the story is still sung. Um, now you probably can get it on an MP3 or maybe even, you know, Amba Mata and Jawar Mata are on Spotify today. I'm not really sure. Let's look over here at this for a minute, though. This is a very beautiful temple to look at from the 15th century. But if we look over here, we see those zinc retorts. Now, I don't know if anyone else on this um, morning is a fellow ceramics artist or potter, a pottery person. I like to make pottery. Um, so for me, this is very interesting or an amateur chemist or perhaps a professor of chemistry, et cetera. Um, what we see here is a system of different retorts or basically ceramic bowls that um, allow us to heat up in large furnaces. And what we have archaeologically at this site are banks and banks and banks of furnaces where the zinc smelting took place. Now, I want to go out of this mode for a moment so that I can zoom here. So what we're talking about here is the law of proximity. Um, if we were in person, I could ask for a show of hands of people who have a sense of what that is. Usually we think about proximity as how close or far away um, people are from each other. So uh, geographically, we are not proximate at all. And yet um, in our hearts and minds as a part of this conference that Dr. Mishra has put together, um, we are at very close proximity, all of us on this um, Google Meet. So the law of proximity is something we think about in terms of political science. So uh, for example, um, in the, I'm trying to translate this into a, an Indian version. Um, in the US, it would be how many, how close is your office in the White House to the Oval Office where the president is? Or um, in the Lok Sabha, it might've been in the 1950s, um, how, uh, close you sit to Nargis, the film star, or it might be in the Lok Sabha, 
how close several women can sit together in order to bolster each other when they take um, the floor to speak. Um, so that has happened in parliamentary situations. Here, oh, I think somebody needs to mute their mic again. Okay, there we go. Here, let me zoom in a little bit on this. This is a page from my article, and we're going to be looking at this map in a little bit. But first, I want to look at these things. So here's another bank of uh, zinc retorts, and we have large areas of this. And what the map actually shows us, well, I'll show you just to start with, and then we'll go into the map a little bit more on the next slide. But what you see here is a fluvial map, which is a fancy word for a map with rivers and different sites. And those black things are the, um, are the, uh, the water bodies near there. Um, but what we'll see at the bottom is a map of the site. Before we get into that, here are the zinc retorts and here is an architectural plan from a 13th century text, which means that uh, this comes after this. And it is for an alchemical laboratory. And I know my sister and some of the others on this call will be interested to see the orientation of this west, north, south, and east. Uh, so there's a, an entrance. In the center of this, we have a Shiva Linga, which may or may not be what we typically think of having in the center of a chemistry lab today. Um, and then we have around different bays. So you have a drying bay, a washing bay, sharp instruments, stone instruments, furnace operations bay. This is um, heating things up raw me materials and product storage, um, and a Veda Karma or a transmutation bay. Here in the center, we have the Shiva Linga um, suggesting a divine element of what makes this possible. <coughs> Excuse me. And here at the east, we have a Bhairava statue, meaning the um, kind of most uh, ferocious form um, of the god Shiva. So this is an interesting combination of a chemistry lab and a um, studio that looks a lot like my clay studio. I spent the summer learning how to fire um, gas kilns to 2000 degrees <coughs> Fahrenheit. Um, and uh, so it's interesting that this looks a lot like this. This is how we would have glazes. This is where we would have a kiln. And it also looks like a temple, right? You go in, you have a main icon, you circumambulate. And on this back wall, you have a powerful kind of emanation manifestation coming out from this central area. If we go down here a little bit more, this is where things get interesting at the site. I'll let you read the article um, and I'll field questions for this later. But what's fascinating here is that you have the modern mines here, the hillside with zinc retorts here, and a series of Jain temples here, um, followed by, uh, here you can see them, uh, a Ramanata temple, um, which was sponsored by Rana Kumba who's a very famous um, Mewari king by his daughter, uh, Ramabai, who held all of Jawar as her jugir. So this whole site actually becomes a noble dowry of, short, of sorts. And then um, over here, you can see um, number seven is the Jawar Mata temple that I showed you earlier. And over here, number eight is a small Shiva temple on either side of a branch of the Tiri River. So what you're seeing here is that you're closest to the natural resource. And then you have a series of different um, constituents or groups um, who are um, sponsoring big stone temples. One of the um, one of the 
things that comes from, uh, and I'll just go to this next slide here. One of the byproducts of zinc mining um, and silver mining is vermilion. And any woman who has lived in Rajasthan in the 1990s, I'm told by my friends in India now, this is no longer in fashion. I'm sure the student, the women students on this call will know. <laughs> but in the 90s, we used to wear sindoor in our parts, the married ladies did, I'm not sure. I, I think that's not done as much anymore. But anyway, that vermilion and the vermilion that, you know, you might use to play holy or that um, Hindus might use in uh, puja, um, comes from mines. And that area, especially here, and I'm going to go back out of this mode so that I can pull this over and zoom in a little bit more. So here is Zawar, and here is Jugget, one of the two main sites where I did my research in India. Here up here is Aiklinji, and here's Udaipur, um, where the Udaipur circle is based. Um, and uh, we have in between them another site called Ot, um, which I write about in my book, and a site called Hitta, um, which uh, nobody had really written about uh, until I did, even though they date to the 10th century. Um, and this, I found the site of Hitta because of the addition of superhighways in Rajasthan that were linking Bambora to Chittorgar, um, which drove right past Hitta, um, a kind of unnoticed 10th century temple, which has um, sculpture exactly like what is found in Jagat. Getting back to Jawar, what do you notice about this map? You can see Jagat here, you can see Jahol here, and you can see these two important capitals, Udaipur, capital of Mewar, and Dungarpur right, which is capital of Vagada, which starts in the 13th century. In the center where Jawar is, there's kind of a blank hole in the middle of my map, right? There's this dense set of 10th century temples up and down here. There's a river over here with Jahol and other important places. Um, here is Amjara. Um, Akesh, I have that on there for you. Um, can take questions about that in the um, Q and A, and Mount Abu and other important spaces here. But here, we don't have a lot of stone buildings, and we don't have a lot of records. And that is exactly the space um, where we have a large Bhil population, B H I L, and the Bhil people um, are very active in worship in Jagat, in the temple of Amba Mata, which is a 10th century Brahmanical temple. Um, and a lot of the worship of that goddess takes place outside of that temple, even though we have a 10th century carved stone that tells us about the antiquity of that. So we have this kind of tribal triangle here and where is it is exactly where the mines are. So if we go back to this mode, you can see here the large, the largest temple, which I showed you first, which is this Jawar Mata temple. All of these temples are at the site of Jawar. You can see pictures from the Archaeological Survey of India, the ASI, of temples at this site um, before their recent restoration. And they have been restored again since 2009. Um, I was back more recently um, for the Living World Heritage Conference in Udaipur, um, we were able to do that. Here you're looking at the back view of this 15th century temple, which is on two registers. Um, and you can see um, here a picture of Jawar Mata herself. Oh no, this is actually, I think, hang on one sec. This is at Jagat. So this is actually a picture of, um, Ambika Mata, who is the sister of the uh, one in this temple. And we can tell that because um, there's this silver repainting that took place as part of the um, installation of this icon, uh, which is the subject of my first article in RES um, about uh, Jagat and Amba Mata, this sister. 
This is um, an image of Vishnu from the Ramabai temple and the tank, uh, which was located the public bath um, right next door, um, which was sponsored by her in a royal way um, when she was um, she had Jawar as part of her Jagir as Kumba's daughter. So if we look a little bit more closely, here's a, uh, a nice image of the uh, tank that she sponsored. Down here, we have two inscriptions. You can't see the one on this side, but you just have to trust it's there. And this is here um, in Jawar. Uh, so we have this really kind of unique building of um, temples on a site which is mainly historically being mined by bill people is still um, mined by bill people and where the local form of worship including um, Amba Mata who was talking about at Jagat um, and at all of these sites is mainly a worship of Beruji and Mataji um, by uh, Adivasi people. Okay, how am I on time? Another 20 minutes? Oh, I can't hear you. Okay, I will keep going. So I wanna move on now to talk about another example, which is Chattisgar. Um, so in Chattisgar, it's also mineral rich. I didn't live in Chattisgarh the way I lived in Rajasthan, um, but I did actually make it to visit Chattisgarh when it was still MP um, before I ever lived in Rajasthan. Um, it's a place where um, Bastar bronzes are made, um, which are often considered handicraft. It's hard as an art historian to think about the kind of different categories of things of ways that we talk about art production, um, which tend to privilege elite forms of production and, um, and uh, historical ones. But let's just look at Chattisgar for a minute here. Uh, these are some of the minerals that we find there, coal, iron ore, limestone, um, bauxite and dolomite, tin, manganese ore. Any of my fellow ceramics people know that's what makes clay black. It's a very toxic and cancerous um, mineral, which is also very beautiful um, when it's fired. Gold again and copper. Okay. Oh, somebody, um, can you mute or are you talking to me? Oh, Sunye, Shayad up Tora Tora mute Kar Sakte Hai. Shukriya. Okay, so now we're looking at an old map, as some of you know, which has this region here, which is now Chattisgar. And this part I would you broke from Madhya Pradesh. Um, because in part, uh, it was culturally and geographically and otherwise not necessarily a, um, was not necessarily uh, coherent with the rest. So um, up here you'll see Gwalior, um, which is a site that uh, where I have visited. I've been uh, around uh, Indore. This is where Mandu is. Over here is Jabalpur, which is a place um, that also has a lot of really interesting archaeological things going around it. But for now, we're just going to be on this kind of tail part, and you can see it's in the center of India. So this is by Raipur and Ranjim. We're going to be looking at the site of Tala. So these are some of my pictures um, from, let's see, 2002, um, where I wrote my uh, master's thesis at Berkeley about this site. Um, and this site was interesting mostly 
to me because of its threshold architecture. So this foliate face that you're looking at here is actually a Kirti Mukha um, or a face of glory. And what you can see here is that this face is made up all out of plants. I, I don't know if any of you have heard of the artist Archimboldo, who's a 15th century German painter, I think, European, I don't know. Europe is not my specialty. India is my specialty. Um, where it makes these faces all out of root. So this is of kind of vegetal form. You guys can see over the eyes here, see this part? It looks like a peepal tree, you know, the peepal leaves. Here you can see little lotus buds coming out of the nostrils. And over here and through here, all of this lion face you can see is all made up with leaves, right? So you can imagine this stone monument um, picking up on the way people were creating icons, were sculpting in local materials, right? We know that we can think about stone and think that it is encapturing a lot of the way wood was carved at the time, even though wood is not with us. And this site is much earlier than the other site we were looking at, right? So this is very late Gupta era site, um, though it is um, part of the Vakataka dynasty. Um, and I can field questions about that in the, um, in the Q and A after. So we're noticing on the one hand, this really unusual type of very deep carving uh, of foliate carving. And this foliate deep carving is something we see in the Gupta era in sites like Nachna and others. I'm thinking of um, the Gupta as a golden age book by Joanna Williams, my, um, my late advisor who um, just passed. Uh, and uh, you can look at a lot of those images, and I'll give you a link to this at the end, at the uh, American Institute for Indian Studies um, website. There's a photo archive open to the public for free at AIIS, um, which many of you know about, um, and you can look at uh, images from different sites there. So on the one hand, we have this really rich, wonderful carving and a very unusual way of making a Kirti Mukha. And I'll get into um, the story of that in a minute. And on the other hand, we have a very massive, heavy uh, architectural site, which suggests um, kind of early attempts of, of working in freestanding stone, right? This is around the same time period as Aihole, the Durga temple in the Deccan. Um, it's earlier than that, uh, but we don't know exactly what happened at this site. There's two temples, but they are largely in ruin. And we think there may have been an earthquake or something else, um, or even just that they fell under their own weight. So we don't have a kind of complete temple in the way that we do at a lot of other archeological sites in India. And so this site sometimes gets overlooked in say, an introduction to the Indian temple survey or an introduction to Indian art survey. And yet some of the things that are happening iconographically at this site um, can't really be ignored as an anomalies and they point to a really kind of interesting link with Adiva, um, potential link with Advasi um, practice in the area. So this also, this um, sculpture here is right at eye level. You can see the silhouette of there on either side as you go through the threshold. Here we see um, kind of genre scenes on the lintel, more really deep, thick carving and a wonderful dance circle um, carved into the ceiling. Here are some more images from the site. Here you have a worship base of a tree from the site. Here in the local uh, museum, you can see different um, flora from the site, different plants. 
native plants. Um, there you can see in the middle the leaf of the people tree that I was talking about, and people trees actually grow at this site. You could even just pick off a leaf and hold it up next to the sculpture here. You can see someone holding a different flower illustrating how um, the uh, lotuses are coming out of the nose. And if you look carefully, even the eyeballs are carved with um, beautifully incised um, plants. So I have a, a very controversial idea about this that maybe some of you will like and maybe some of you won't like. Um, and my advisor didn't like it, um, but I like it. Um, and that is, I think what we might have here is in some ways a portrait of a god, which begs the question for scholars um, of can you have a portrait of a god, which gets into philosophy in a way that art history doesn't always do. Art history has a tendency, and especially as a uh, in the way it's practiced today, Western discipline that started in Germany, although I would argue there are many art histories in India, in the Natya Shastra, in China, in the year 1000, in Vasari. So we don't have to root it all in that kind of late colonial moment. Um, but the tendency to think of art history in terms of sculpture that does not have an ontological presence, that is not alive, um, doesn't always totally work um, in India or for Indian art. Here we are looking at a, a sculpture from Tala made out of mud brick. And we see how you can kind of inlay a mirror or how pigments are used and how you can sculpt out of more plastic materials than stone. So you could imagine a Kirti Mukha made out of this material would allow you to take all of these plants and put them as part of this in a kind of local way that isn't necessarily what a big dynasty is paying to have carved into stone, but might be a kind of more local expression of um, what is um, important. Oh, okay. I want to stay on this for a moment, if I may. And I want to read to you briefly story time. I know it's nighttime here and morning time there, so you'll have to have your story time in the morning. But anyway, um, this is the story, uh, one of the stories of um, of Rahu. Just hang on one sec. Oh. Oh no, I think I have this bookmarked wrong. One sec here. Oh, now I have that bookmark wrong. I have a different story to read to you. I will tell you the story. I'm a pretty good storyteller. I will tell you briefly. So um, there are two versions of the Kirtimukha. Um, one is about Rahu, which tells the story of the lunar eclipse. And uh, this leonine figure with no jawline um, is uh, eating up the sun. The other version, just quick version of uh, the story of the Kirti Mukha um, is that uh, there was someone who was um, very kind of ravenous and greedy and was cursed by Shiva to eat all of themselves um, to satiate their hunger. And they started with their toes and they ate up their body until they got to their mouth. And if you try to eat your own mouth, once you chew your lower jaw, you no longer have anything to chew with. And all that's left is um, the top part of your head from here up. So that's um, one version of this kind of Kirti Mukha story. So the question is, 
these stories and myths and I was just working from Zimmer, um, but you know, you can, that's in translation, but you can read them in a number of different languages, um, are oral traditions. And so we can think about how these oral traditions um, might have existed in a tribal context, um, in an Adivasi context that is um, adjacent to a Brahmanical context, which is what is being paid for by dynasties in stone. And we can get into that a little further. Um, I just wanted to show you before I end, um, this uh, is also from Tala from the Deirani Temple. Some of you may be familiar with this very uh, unusual uh, example of Shiva as Lord of the Beast, Pashupati Shiva, um, where we can see an ithyphallic Shiva, where all of the different parts of the body are different animals. So in the same way that the Kirtimuka is made all out of flora or plants, this version of Shiva is made all out of um, different animals and human faces. You can see the lion knees, you can see um, human thighs, you can see the turtle penis and the mustached pectoral muscles and the mustached tummy. His shoulders are like epaulets. They are makara, um, which translates roughly as a crocodile, but it's not really a, that's not really a makara. Makara is a now going extinct form of really unusual dolphin that you can still find in Pakistan. You can see that his chin is a crab and his nose is a lizard, that his uh, dreaded locks there, his matted locks are um, serpents and his ears are peacocks. So the question is, in terms of this, if we think about all around the world and in India as well, um, the proximity to nature of Adivasi art and culture um, in terms of the fauna and the flora and how that comes in, are we looking at in this um, iconography and in this mythology of uh, Pashupata Shiva as Lord of the Beasts of something that is made more Brahmanical over time and then gets turned into stone um, by the Vakataka dynasty, much in the same way that, um, you know, the state and indigenous people kind of fight over resources and interpretations in Chhattisgarh today, for those of you that follow current events. So, what I'm proposing here for the students on the call and for my fellow scholars um, and my sister and friends is that we try to, when we think about art history and archeology span in India, instead of having a kind of colonial perspective of creating an archive where we collect and own and um, describe every single thing as a way of ruling, you know, I'm thinking back to the lecture we heard yesterday about museums and the power of a privately funded museum. Um, and, you know, in the US, I don't think of a privately funded thing as powerful. I think of it as corporate, which suggests that um, it is too powerful and that as scholars and scientists, we will not be able to speak freely. Whereas in India, if we think about something that is private, we think about something that can be sponsored by a set of people with a common um, goal that might be outside of a government goal. Or if we think about things that are governmental, again, they might be free from corporate goals. But if we think of each of those sets of powers, we could also think about you know, other constituents. Um, I am kind of the opposite of a museum person, though I've worked in many museums. I'm a field art historian. Um, which is pretty unusual these days. So I go into the field and when you go into the field, the way people curate, the way people think about, the way people use their own art in their own ways um, is really different from a lot of the ways that I think as scholars and just in publications in general, people think about it. I wanna close with a very unusual and famous um, image from Deogar, 
which was not something I said that I was going to be talking about as a site. But this is a Vishnu temple from the Gupta era. And this is um, really in the Gupta heartland. This is not in um, the Vakataka region. This is not in a place with especially rich minerals, et cetera, like that. But what's interesting is the iconography here, which is a very rare one. Um, called the deliverance of the elephant. And so I promised you a little story time. I will give you that story um, and a brief interpretation, and then I will take questions. A rather isolated myth, not connected with major cycles of the avatars of Vishnu, is that of the deliverance of the elephant. And this is from the Bhagavata Purana, um, number eight, 2.3. Um, I can help you find that if you're interested in reading in the original instead of in English. A sculptural representation of the event is shown here in the relief of the Dasha Avatar Temple in Deogar. A magnificent elephant in quest of its fare of lotus stalks and lotus roots has ventured too far into the watery element, and the serpents of the deep have seized it. See how the Elephant legs are seized down here by the serpents. Have seized it and fettered it. The great animal struggling in vain has at last implored the help of the high god Vishnu. And you can see Vishnu up here with his crater or his special crown riding on a magnificent Gupta era version of Garuda, um, his vehicle. Um, with a humanized face with beautiful Gupta hair. So uh, no, okay, so the great animal struggling in vain has implored the help of the high God. Vishnu has just appeared seated on Garuda. No deed of Vishnu is required. His mere presence is enough. The mighty serpent king pays obeyance. And here you can see the serpent king also in an anthropomorphized form, and his queen, who are underneath here with their hands in a kind of pranam namaste kind of um, prayer pose, paying obeyance. The serpents bow with folded hands before the Lord ruler of the universe and surrender to him their victim. So they're giving back the elephant, setting him free. The elephant's feet are, feet are still ensnared by the powerful coils. And in this moment of classic Gupta period, fourth to sixth centuries, the bird Garuda has something of the appearance of an angel. I don't really like that translation. I think they're talking about Gandharvas um, who are wonderful muses, um, mythical beings who live in the vapors of the clouds and inspire us all. You can see why Angel is kind of not living up to all that. Um, so let's call them Gandharvas. So you can see these wings um, like that. And you can see some of these celestial beings up in the sky. Vishnu is crowned with a diadem, otherwise known as a crater or that kind of chef's hat looking crown and has four arms. Now, it took me 15 or 20 years to figure out another alternative of what this is about. Clearly that is the myth. This myth is almost never represented on temple sculpture. And this temple has sculpture in narrative, one on each of the three sides. It doesn't have any of the medieval auxiliary figures that I write about in my book or that we're used to at a Glinji or that we see in the other site at Rajasthan. It really is one narrative per wall. So the mythology is really important, but the question becomes one of interpretation. What does it mean to have two Nagas defeated? If we look at this just, I don't know how many of you are practicing artists, but if we look at this as art historians, just as a work of art, look at that di diagonal, so dynamic. And on one side, we have the binary of Vishnu coming in to save this elephant fettered here, um, the Brahmanical God. And on the other side, we have the Nagas. And I know that many of you 
have been to uh, medieval temples or Gupta era temples in India, stone temples, and you've seen along the roads on the way there that around the corner down the way, there's a temple to Kagil. Um, and so my question is, does this tell us this is a Gupta temple sponsored by the Gupta ruler and we have I, uh, we have inscriptions that tell us that. Does this tell us something about the relationship of the state um, to Adivasi people at the time or to Brahmanical religion to Adivasi people? Is this redefining what the relationship is between Vishnu and Anaga king? And how does that get negotiated as a power structure in stone? These are the kinds of questions I think a lot of us are afraid to ask, but I think that the stone can do more for us than just give us um, a dynastic history. So with that, I want to go back into a normal mode. where I can see and hear all of you again, and I will take any questions. And also if you are clapping or booing, I cannot hear you. So hang on one second. <laughs> one minute here. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks, okay, Dr. Deora. Thanks to you, lots of thanks to you, and very nice and important presentation presented by you on before us. Despite the fact that the contemporary metallurgical grew at exponential rate during the industrial revolution, many current metallurgical principles have their roots in ancient traditions, especially in India. India has a very long history, as we know that the our dates of the metallurgy. Uh, back to the 7,000 years, some uh, metallurgical uh, uh, evidences is found in the Mehargad also and the other uh, Harappan sites and early Harappan sites. India made rich contribution in the field of the metallurgy. But uh, I would, uh, I want to say that the in the global account of the history of metallurgy, Indian treat Indians just like the unnoticed and the contribution is very summarily they have passed, especially the disproportional credit is given to the best Asiatic, Greek and the Roman achievements. But I am very happy with the in recent years, scholars like Dr. Debora and the other Indian scholars are taking efforts to, to introduce our hidden metallurgical expertise for the on the worldwide platforms it is very good thanks uh, i am thanks to the Divora, especially on behalf of the divisional student of the udaipur region mewar region and the jawar mines just you have uh, seen the lots of um, temples and the other metallurgical uh, aspects and the evidences of that area i want to add some things also and i want i want to uh, to say you especially Deborah and the other of our scholars that we are trying to protect the whole site with the in the capacity of geo heritage and the archaeological metallurgical sites with the group of temples we have identified and documented more than temples in that area belongs to Jain and the Hindu deities especially mm -hmm. Jain and Hindu both are present there and I would like to share the news that when I have joined here, I have found the whole area is very disturbed and the, uh, destroying recent, in the recent year, no, per, no uh, groups and the persons and the scholars explored the, that area uh, profoundly, just like Deborah uh, explored the, that area and the, that campus with the precise and the brief knowledge. And I would like to also um, say that uh, you have told about the Jabar Mata, 
Dr. Debora, I want to add your in, um, in your knowledge that the Javar Mata is the not actual temple of the Mata. I especially explored that temple two times. Basically, it was the Vishnu temple yes. in the earlier phase. And the iconography of the Javar Mata temple clearly says that the Javar Mata temple earlier was constructed in the name of the god of Vishnu. Mm -hmm. But after the invading of the Mughals and the other Gujarat rulers, the main idol of the Vishnu destroyed in that temple and in the time of gap, the local peoples and the local uh, rulers um, established the Jabar Mata idol in that temple. So that's now, it is very popular as the Jabar Mata temple. I think that's so interesting how temples change over time like that. I mean, if you think about Chittorgar, for example, yes. uh, yeah. the Kshemankari temple, which is so important and unusual there and no one ever stops to look at it nobody thinks about it everybody is over having padmini time um and yet that is um such an important part of the record of how the goddess was worshipped you know in the year 700 or in the year 1000 and as opposed to today so what you're talking about is really important and you know my talk today really thought about ethno history and ethno archaeology and ethno archaeology is a method where you look at what is going on at a site here and now today right like for example at this vishnu temple that it's being worshipped as uh, a mata temple right and then you go back and you look in time at the stone record and you see exactly what is similar or different. And so it helps us to kind of imagine what may have been on the side back in the day um, or what was state sanctioned and what people were doing back in the day um, in materials that are entirely gone, right? So, um, yeah, I mean, I don't think there's the same kind of dynastic presence at Jawar today, um, you know, uh, I gifted a copy of my article to the princess of Mewar, right? But she's not living there, right? <laughs> the way that Ramabai was living there. So uh, in the absence of that kind of dynastic um, situation, I think a lot of the um, kind of local Adivasi culture kind of takes over these Brahmanical sites in really interesting ways. So thank you for your okay. questions and comments. And it is very good to know that uh, and the, we have seen that the iconography and the metrology both are the very strong of the Dr. Devora. Very good presentation in the and you have recognized and identified the some evidences on the Gupta temple in the different area of the Madhya Pradesh and Chhattisgarh. So I would like now I would like to invite some questions have you any question of the scholar? You can directly ask to the judge. Okay. I'm inviting. Any question? Is my accent very hard to understand? I, I think that the, your, your paper is, is the very nice and very, very briefly you have told the about, yes, yes. I think that Dr. Zabir. I, I, I can congratulate her. Uh, she, she has spoken Hindi also. So, so nicely describing the subject and both the ethno, ethno history, ethno archaeology, and uh, metallurgy, everything. So, very nicely. So, uh, we appreciate very much your knowledge, your quest, your research on the subject. That is what we can say. Uh, best luck for the future. Yes, yeah, Dr. Alkes Javeri, I think that the, you have some question. Please ask. Sorry, sir, I am not doctor. I am just a student. <laughs> Please. <laughs> yes, Devura, man, you have worked a lot in Rajasthan. So what? So what I have seen is like there is a connectivity between between all most of the Indian communities and certain festives, and they occur. And they are also on the same lineage. 
Only thing is the way of celebration is different, but there is a connectivity in the culture which I which I can see. Since I yeah. as I came to US and I am observing the, the 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 post on the Facebook based on that I have ma made my my observation that many different people celebrate the same festival in a different way. Absolutely, but it's almost on the same day. So we need to like come up with a point that okay, this is one festival and we are trying to make make and we are trying to culturally connect so that is it also connected with this uh what you call as a folk or adivasi type of culture i'm not going to say adivasi is a folk yeah, culture yeah. Oh. which later on became brahmanical culture and then it's it w went on on as a, as a strategy or a systematic plan that what i can observe i'm not a i'm just a observer or a student i'm not not even a student at present I okay. work and I just this is my interest in in uh, archaeology and history, so I I connect, and I have already connected or regarding certain items to you with my emails, so you very very well know me about. Okay. Secondly, I, I have been collecting Gajalakshmi images from almost like from Gandha <laughs> level to all the way Pan Asia, which I would be presenting in 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 the in the in the, in the last two to second session. But that is what I could feel that all at different eras, the, the even iconography also changes, the way of making the sculpture changes. But that is related to what you said, like uh, metallurgy and the time space. I I'm, really I'm, I'm very much thankful that you you accepted my my call and Thank you. presented yourself. Thank you very much. Thank you. This is really special to be able to zoom into India like this and to be um, in a community with um, my fellow scholars of, of Indian art. It's a real treat for me to be here with all of you. Akash, I, I love what your I love your comment because I think that uh, honestly it it really resonates with me. I am not Hindu. I'm actually uh, Jewish myself. And I find that what you just mentioned is so true also of a people who have been in diaspora for 2000 years, right? Um, where we're all celebrating the same holidays or observing the same things or thinking about similar things, um, but in such different ways in different regions, right? Even within India, the way uh, Jews are practicing in Cochin and Mumbai and the way that we're practicing in Delhi and um, the way, uh, you know, and the different communities, there's three different communities, um, the way people are practicing in Pune, completely different, right, from Angola or somewhere else, and yet these same kind of traditions. So you are right to point out, too, that there's the Brahmanical, there's the folk, and there's Adivasi, and it's not all the same, right? So that's really important. So the last example I gave is an example of this kind of folk and Brahmanical and how those things come together historically. Whereas the other two examples are from regions with rich mineral deposits that have current day Adivasi populations um, who are the majority of the people using the site. So um, really kind of different perspective there. But again, I just want to thank all of you so much. It's really fun um, to uh, have this free trip to India to hang out with all of you. Thank you. Once again, it is also a pleasure because my lips are connected to the city. Uh, hello, I I'm Sushmita from MS University, Baroda. And your, uh, yours was a very informative. One of my students is working on the Kirti Mukhas of Western India. So that will, yes, she is working on the ethnographic uh, studies also. And also the uh, temple she's covering of Gujarat, Madhya Pradesh, Maharashtra and Rajasthan. And she is finding different, you know, uh, styles of Kirti Mukha, like uh, very different uh, ways they have, uh, uh, you know. Produce. So she's trying to understand why there were different styles and what they are depicting. So thank you for such an informative uh, this uh, uh, the paper. And I would definitely ask her to contact you so that you, you can, you since you have worked on it, and uh, it will be very helpful for her. Thank you, ma'am. 
Okay. I would love to talk to her. Her research sounds really interesting. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, I think that there is no question because the whole paper is the very uh, briefly presented and the very knowledgeable. And thanks to Deborah, uh, you have uh, introduced us lots of introduction and the lot uh, and, pre and present the lots of knowledge about the iconography of the Jabar and the Dasavta temple and Chhattisgarh temples with the metallurgical aspects and the metallurgical techniques of the Mewar and Rajasthan, especially in the Jabar area. And thanks to um, Riva uh, College, Holkar College Riva and the Mr. Misra to provide opportunity and present before and, uh, and provide opportunity to Dibura and the provide opportunity to listen to the, uh, the very good paper. Thanks to all of you. Thank you, Dr. Neeraj Kumar, sir, uh, for a given time and share the session and Dr. Deborah Stein uh, giving time and uh, present lecture even uh, India and uh, uh, San Francisco time different. Uh, so uh, all of you, thank you. Thank you, thank you. Uh, now next session, <coughs> our Eminent speaker, Dr. S.B. Ota, former Joint Director General, Archaeological Survey of India, Chairperson, Prof. N.S. Rangaraju, former Professor, Department of Ancient History and Archaeology, Mysore, Co-Chairperson, Dr. C.M. Mishra, Professor, History Department, Government TRS College, Riva. Welcome, all of you, sir. And uh, I am requesting to Dr. NS, uh, Professor N.S. Rangaraju, please proceed your session and uh, introduce our eminent speaker, Dr. S.B. Ota, sir. Okay, sir. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Ah, good morning to all. I think uh, time was given for us to start at 11 o'clock. Yes, sir. It is already 20 minutes late uh, mm -hmm. schedule. So, so I... I request the presenter also to take this time in his presentation. Sir, uh, I'm very happy that uh, to be a part of this uh, your, uh, program, the national uh, webinar series. I should first, I, I would like to thank uh, Skandakumar Mishra, and then uh, just I'll take only five minutes to introduce uh, the presenter at the eminent speaker of this program. Dr. Uh, S.B. Ota, just uh, a, a few of his uh, achievements and uh, uh, his biodata, I'm going to just uh, brief it now. He was a former Joint Director General of Archaeological Survey of India, and uh, he's uh, talking on the subject, Conservation Through Management, a case study at Bimbetka World Heritage Site. And uh, the co-chairperson with me is uh, Dr. C. M. Mishra, Professor C. M. Uh, uh, yeah, Professor, History Department, Government TRS College, Reva, Madhya Pradesh. Sir, uh, Dr. Uh, S. B. Vota, he was uh, awarded uh, a very good uh, lot of awards he has got in his uh, career. I read out only two or three here. Agur National Fellow Government of India to carry out his research and uh, prehistory of Ladakh. He was assigned with additional responsibility. This is a very important part. Responsibility as director of uh, Indira Gandhi Rashtri Manasangrahale. Probably there is a reason for this because he has got a, a degree of anthropology also. So anthropology and archaeology and they, that's why he was a, a IGRMS uh, Bhopal, he was a director additionally. He was the first director of, uh, uh, very important, another thing is, he was the first director of National Mission on Monuments and Antiquities, Antiquities launched by the Ministry of Culture, Government of India, under ASI. Of course, I was also a part of that. I was making some uh, project for this program also. He has got both uh, the archaeology and the anthropology. Uh, in uh, 1987, 
he got an award of a young scientist award from indian science congress association he was a short term visiting fellow by japan foundation in 2006 he was undertaken large number of archaeological investigations in parts of india some of them are a submergence area of narmada valley dam project in madhya pradesh prehistoric investigation in high altitude ladakh himalayas he was undertaken large number of monuments conservation other than this uh, his uh, field of interest is a uh, prehistory field archaeology uh, salvage archaeology etc and also is very important documentation conservation archaeological history archaeological heritage conservation etc presently he is uh, working on two major research projects one is geo archaeological investigations of ashwalian sites uh, in district of uh, rajasthan of madhya pradesh understanding of early human occupation in high altitude at ladakh himalayas how he is uh, going to now he is going to speak just a half still more uh, his biodatical uh, information but uh, i'm not i'm not taking much of your time he's going to speak on conservation through management a case study of bimbetka world heritage site just i'll put few words on this uh, bimbetka yep. bimbetka is one in the in the country of india which has got caves and rock shelters of more than 1000 in number which is uh, very important that's why it has been declared as a world heritage site by unesco in 2003 uh which is present in uh, of course uh, the he will speak all those thing i think they first excavated this site by vakankar vs yeah. vikram university and vn mishra deccan college pune in 1957 many others conducted excavations till 1974 75 the site have been yielded with the lower paleolithic middle paleolithic upper paleolithic paleolithic and mesolithic tools the very important one is the prehistoric paintings which is a challenging one for the conservation i think uh, uh, professor uh, sorry dr ota uh, will speak about these things and i am also very much interested in knowing about the conservation of this uh, uh, structure because i am specialized in conservation of heritage structures of uh, karnataka and i think it will put more uh, information to me and i welcome sir to speak about uh, 45 to 50 minutes and we will stick on to the time properly sir right and then we will allow people for the discussion about 10 minutes other other than this i welcome you to speak sir yeah uh, i am audible i hope so yeah yeah, yeah. sure sure you are fine audible yeah uh, i am thankful to the chairman uh, as well as to the organizer Uh, Professor Misra and his team for inviting me. Uh, the conservation which I am going to talk about is not the usual way of conserving any of the monuments that mm -hmm. we understand. So I consider any of the heritage buildings or monuments like a human body. Instead of taking medicines, you know, if you take mm -hmm. some preventive measures, then no need. I mean, we won't uh, become sick. that is what my plan is all about and here is a example without touching the uh, paintings proper how can we really preserve these is old paintings prehistoric paintings at bimbetka so that is why i have named it as conservation through management if we have got a proper management plan at place and we implement it at the right time probably touching the paintings the ancient remains for its conservation will not uh, um, uh, ever come to us hmm? and here what i am saying uh, the usual conservation it's a some sort of a intervention into the monuments we keep on modifying certain things we add and everything but the preventive conservation is that where 
we do not touch anything but we will manage it in certain such a manner like a preventive medicine so that is how we do certain things we will have to manage we'll see how we are managing in case of this world heritage site so that intervention right into the monument right into the heritage will not arise now before going to that one of the basic thing we need to understand in most of the cases particularly in indian context when you talk about the heritage i'm talking about the archaeological heritage we feel that okay this heritage belongs to the archaeological survey of india or this belongs to the state archaeology of madhya pradesh or state archaeology of karnataka no none of these heritage buildings belong to the government government employees are there just the caretakers of that heritage these buildings these heritage belongs to whom i'll just ask the few questions i have just uh, written over here you will get the answer if you really think uh, without any biasness you will get your reply whose heritage it is is it the government's or the local people who should be benefited the local people or the others outside those who are not directly connected with the heritage whose responsibility is to preserve our past heritage it is the local people if they are getting the benefit if if it is their heritage they should take some responsibility or initiative to uh, preserve our heritage whose cultural continuity it is some other place or the local people whose cultural continuity and who are the part of the natural and cultural ecosystem where the heritage sites are located if you really think about it you will get your result it is the the local inhabitants are to whom this heritage belongs now let's go to the bimbetka uh, most of you must be knowing it so um, as it was introduced it is one of the uh, world heritage sites and this is the only prehistoric site which has been protected um, uh, under the unesco as world heritage in in our country it's very close to bhopal about 45 kilometers and this uh, rock shelters are bimbetka painted rock shelters along with the cultural remains got declared as the world heritage in 2003 there are many sites we have in our country which have been declared the world heritage but there is one exception to this monument which you will never get in any of the world heritage monuments in our country the first thing is this is the only world heritage which has been nominated on the cultural landscape why it is cultural landscape there are two criteria that, that unesco has identified for it bimbetka reflects a long interaction between the people and the landscape as demonstrated in the quality and quantity uh, um, uh, quantity and qu quality of the rock art about the past heritage and the second one is very important bimbetka is closely associated with a hunting gathering economy as demonstrated in the rock art and in the relics of this tradition in the local adivasi villages the present day communities those are staying there they are the real the uh, carrying the continuity of this rock painting tradition with them so there is a continuity so this is the exceptional thing in our whole country that's why it has been declared uh, as a world heritage on the cultural landscape category this is uh, bimbetka i'll just introduce um, about its uh, uniqueness this comes under the uh, forest department of the government of madhya pradesh it's a rattapani sanctuary it's within the premises of a sanctuary called rattapani it has got an excellent biomass you can see beautiful animal life plant life and all that and the natural architecture and the uh, water bodies in the form of a seasonal um, uh, rivers or a spring and all that and we all know that uh, this is the largest rock paintings rock shelter with the paintings in our country as it was told to you that there are more than thousand uh, shelters are there out of which more than 500 shelters have got the paintings even it contains the cupules which is sometimes considered as a, uh, one of the earliest human created 
and it was excavated it was said uh, uh, professor vien nuwakankar professor vien misra they excavated it and we have got the uh, remains right from our earliest cultural remains which you call lower paleolithic middle paleolithic upper paleolithic up to the present day uh, communities when we excavate those sites at the top horizon within the rock shelters we get historical remains and all that uh, medieval remains sometimes so right um, uh, up to it goes down up to the prehistory so beautiful without any break cultural continuity right from asulan till present day and present day community i will be showing you a few slides how the continuity among the present day communities we have seen one thing we'll have to understand any monument here a monument in the sense the rock shelters and the paintings and the cultural remains down below which is buried these pigments that we see it was thought earlier that these pigments are only inorganic uh, pigments so nothing will happen but we have done some um, analysis um, with the collaboration of uh, uh, kalpakam and with the roman spectrometer we have come to know that many of the paintings have got the organic matter as the binder one such painting that has been published already in the now one of the leading journals of the world roman spectroscopy uh, some of the paintings contains the egg yolk as the binder then this bhimbetka as we have understand if you see the left side uh, uh, map the core area, um, area the particular the black area uh, is the core area which is protected and surrounding area is the um, uh, particularly the buffer zone which is the term used in the unesco means it's a regulated area and within this protected area there are five groups of hills or five hills which contains the rock shelter that has been protected now the interesting aspect of this vimbetka just consider what the universal value was recognized by the unesco and what are the challenges with the archaeologist or the conservation uh, archaeologist one one thing should uh, remember let it be whether it's a bimbetka or any monument any heritage in the world cannot be isolated from its surrounding uh, uh, surrounding natural heritage because sometimes we feel that's a mistake we are committing at many of the places we separate natural heritage from the built heritage never they are, they have got a beautiful symbiotic relationship that's one one has to think and one of the good example is the bimbetka archaeological heritage of course those are paintings and the archaeological remains and the third aspect is the living heritage living heritage that um, local inhabitants like uh, local communities i feel gons and other communities who are, they have got the both tangible and intangible as for the unesco will have to protect even the tangible and intangible dimensions of the living heritage so for us as the mandate says uh, in the unesco we will have to protect the natural heritage we will have to protect the archaeological heritage and the living heritage with two components tangible and intangible now when you identify the different risk what are the different uh, uh, problems that uh, the monument faces so i have identified that like, the forest fire we get that's a right into the sanctuary human vandalism wood cutting activities cattle grazing forest fire vehicular pollution these are the certain things we have identified left side you will find only collapsing of the rock shelters and forest fire is identified as natural but forest fires are also done by the man made i'll show you what happens there and rest of the things whether wood cutting cattle grazing anything happens forest fire there is a mela held i will be showing you they are all man made so let's see some of these problems risk how we can really tackle once we tackle all these problems automatically our um, heritage will be preserved now we'll go to the forest fire uh, at the back you will find these rock shelters which have got the paintings every year ram namani day ram namani day there is a forest fair held it's a tribal fair right um, uh, on the top of the forest and um, top of the hill 
and uh, very close to the rock shelters. And all sorts of shops used to be there. And this uh, Mela helps only for five to six hours. It starts around 1.32, gets ended by seven in the evening. And all the local people from the number of villages, the tribal people, they gather. Excuse me, excuse me, I'm terribly sorry to interrupt, but we cannot see your slides. We can only see your first slide. Okay. Not yet. Yes, sir. Your slides are not you moving. You need to highlight, um, like press forward as you go. Uh, yes. Oh, you can you see? So yes, I want oh. to see all your slides. Thank you uh, so, so much. When I did the um, full screen, that was the problem. Should I just uh, run it within a few seconds, my slides? Yeah, this is okay. very helpful. I'm sorry to interrupt. Community? Yeah, no, you. Not, no problem. Thank you. Uh, these are the community um, uh, participation, why we do that. And this is about the location of Bimbetka, which I showed. And this is the criteria and cultural landscape. This is a certificate from the um, uh, UNESCO. And uh, I told you about the Ratapani Sanctuary. It's very rich in vegetation, biomass, and uh, beautiful natural heritage and all that. And uh, it's very rich in uh, uh, rock paintings. I showed you, and it has got the uh, a lot of excavations have been carried out. We have got a cultural continuity right from Australian till present day. These have shown, and this is the testing which you do uh, with the laser spectrometer. And we found that many of the paintings contain the organic matter. Once there is an organic binder, it becomes very sensitive to the environment. Uh, so there we found some of the paintings have got the egg yolk as a binder. So I went very fast. And this is the map on the left side. Now it's moving. Yes, sir, it's moving. moving. Uh, so in the middle, the black uh, one is a um, uh, cultural uh, yeah, um, uh, core area of the um, uh, protected area. And rest of this is a buffer zone of the UNESCO. That's uh, where the control can be done. And I was just explaining about the we'll have to, as a conservationist, we'll have to preserve the natural heritage, archaeological heritage, and the living heritage within the buffer zone, tangible and intangible both. Then I spelt out the different uh, risk factors. So some of the risks we have identified. If we tr um, try to see, I mean, how we are uh, really um, controlling many of the risks that we find identified here, man-made and natural, and uh, how we control that. This I saw. Then I went to this slide. Okay? Sorry, I'm, I have uh, uh, run it very fast. Okay. Uh, now, I was talking about the forest fair, which is held every year, only for a day on the top of the hills, very close to the rock shelters, painted rock shelters. Now, this happens only for the tribal uh, people in the nearby areas, and uh, thousands of people, they gather together, and it happens for six hours in the afternoon, because one has to walk down to the forest from the different routes and takes time. Now, once this happens, we thought that what is the impact of this on the natural heritage and uh, uh, cultural heritage? This is the activities happens there. Lot of these shops, uh, you know, food shops and other things. Then we started looking at it. And on the very next day, I'm showing this data which was done for the first time in 2003. Now, when we found on the very next day, the whole, in, in, in the heart of the sanctuary, there are a lot of garbage. 2003, I'm talking about nearly 20 years back. Lot of garbage. What we did, we collected, we mapped on the day of the uh, fair, we mapped all the shops. We have got a full documentation. These are the rock shelters and garbage area and all that. Then we collected on the very next day all the garbages. Just nearly, say, 18 years back when we collected, this is the composition of the garbage. We analyzed it. How much plastic, plastic. You can see all those um, weight has given plastic. And there are a lot of which is non-biodegradable, which is getting in the forest. And before this, before 2004, 
every year this happens and within a couple of two three days there are one or two cases we find the wild animals are deer or somebody they die uh, eating those plastics with food stop and all that so in 2004 we collected all the garbage and analyzed and as you know in the government i was a government employee we got shifted then i came back after a big gap in 2009 and again in 2010 i wanted to study the same thing because we have got a, because this garbage analysis documenting affair because since my background was in anthropology we have got a completely different methodology to study it that i'm not showing i'm just showing a few results uh, so in 2010 Again, we documented the complete uh, that forest fair and all the garbage we analyzed. To my surprise, within a period of six months, it has grown several times. You know, some of the new things like uh, uh, plastic cups, which was not there six years back, that has come one kg. Polythene packets drinking water, which is nearly five kilos, which was not there, not even a single was seen in six years back. It has getting to that. So all this garbage was getting to the sanctuary. So this was really alarming. What was happening in this? Lot of wild animals are dying. So we did, so we took some initiatives on the very next year before 12th uh, April um, 2011, before the round number. And to our surprise, we found all the red things you'll find. We reduced the display. It should have increased several times, but we started reducing the uh, non-biodegradable garbage into the forest. What we did, that is what we call a proper management plan. Before the Ram Navami, that Mela fair, we started interacting with the villagers. Because it is their property. You'll have to, uh, because they are the participants in this um, fair. Because they are the people, those who come to buy the things, they are the people who put the shops and all that. We had a meeting with the communities. We told them, these plastics are mostly coming from drinking water bags. So don't worry, we are not going to allow it because you are paying 5-10 rupees for each of the packets. We are going to provide you free drinking water. But at the same time, we are not going to allow in that, inside the forest. The second thing we said, that all this plastic, because there is a temple over there, people take all those plastic bags of Nariel and all that for worshiping, and all those garbage are thrown. We said that we are going to distribute it a couple of hundreds plastic baskets. So you recycle it. And how it is um, uh, particularly um, um, uh, profitable, we explain. Because you are buying these plastic bags. These are no need to buy. This costs hardly 15, 20 rupees baskets. You would, um, give it to them. They will worship and return it uh, to you and they return the money. So all those many other initiatives are taken. So again in 12, we found things got reduced drastically. So how this is what a part of the management. You interact with the local people and you can manage the things at place. And what lessons we learned when he did it. One, the garbage was completely controlled, reduced. And if you, we have realized, if you educate all these uh, uh, tribal communities, local village communities about the heritage, importance of this heritage, they won't listen, you go to the villages. We have worked in this department for 30 years. But here is a time, this Mela time, fair, when they come with a very lizard mind, they will listen to you. So that was the time we started educated because they are completely free, um, uh, free on that day, eating, merrymaking and all that. You educate them on that day. So that was very, very effective that we learned. And sense of ownership, that needs to be infused upon the local people, which you are not doing as a professional archaeologist or the conservator. And local communities should feel that this heritage is a boon in disguise. Because everywhere they feel that, oh, this has become a problem for us. No, it is their property. They are the beneficiaries. The day they realize that fact, it will automatically preserve. We'll come to the next um, uh, um, problem. That's 
lot of thousands of people they are coming and we know that many of the uh, shelters have got the uh, deposits uh, down below so when you uh, start working the artifacts gets exposed okay, like this so what we did initially because even the conservation or learning process we spared the geotextile geotextile has got a very good property water percolates and all that but it separates the water of the mud or the sediment do that we pour on that that separates from the original set, sediment that is what we did and it became normal people started working but there is a problem created once we see within a year's time the problems were increased increased in what way the uh, the moment this uh, people started working on those sediments because the sediments never got attached with the original prehistoric sediments so this started floating on the geotextile and lot of dust was created and that was affecting the paintings so what we did now for last couple of years we have changed and gone back to the international standard so what we have done we have put the uh, uh, completely wooden planks within the uh, shelters wherever the good archaeological remains are there and people can work and whenever archaeologists they want to excavate you just remove these planks you can take up a trench and all that so there won't be any fiddling with the original sediments with the archaeological data at the same time people can do it and uh, let's go to the forest because forest has got a direct link for the preservation of these paintings and the shelters what are the problems in the forest there are a lot of cattle get into the forest why these cattle they go to the forest it's not by the local people local people ha have got the tribal people have got hardly one or two um, uh, cattle with them that never affects but this is we the outsiders those who do not belong to that um, area they give their cattle to these local people and tell them some money and tell them to take it to the forest so there is over exploitation grazing uh, exploit of the forest because of large scale grazing and wood cutting activity there are a lot of these um, uh, in the regulated area the brick factories they are cutting trees there they and once you go for um, uh, there are just up to 2003 there are a lot of forest fire fire and i being an anthropologist when i started studying why the forest fire is occurring i found that it's not at all a single case is there for which i can say the natural fire these are all because of man made and man made the main reason was the theft because the woods are stolen uh, from the forest and to wipe out the evidence those are all burnt so um, uh, this was happening this is the last photographs very rare photograph that we took 2003 after that not even a single case of forest fire in uh, uh, bhimbetka and this is what happening it was apathy with the paintings and uh, all the trees were getting burnt near the paintings and all that these are the old paintings and now those all those things have been stopped it's a big story uh, how we um, stopped it if it comes within the discussion i'll explain that okay. uh, then i'll tell you how we studied because sunlight particularly and the temperature that affect the paintings badly Uh, if it falls directly on the painting, so what we did these days, we have noticed that many of the paintings uh, on which direct sunlight falls, and these are fading away. If you compare with the photograph that was taken twenty five thirty years back, so what we did, we started an experiment. Uh, we wanted to study the um, uh, all these uh, intensity of the. Um, uh, sunlight on on the paintings how to the temperature and all that so what we did we have got a different type of experiment in for the whole one year we started taking photographs from morning 6 to evening till sunset every hour few shelters were selected where the paint uh, sunlight falls and we started taking the photographs how much area it's covering by the sunlight one second criteria is the ambient temperature third criteria is the surface temperature on the rock these three things we started uh, taking for 
12 hours in a day and 12 different uh, segments of photographs and all the recordings for one year. Then this is how we took. Photographs are taken and this is what you call the surface temperature. We have got the sensor. You can take what is the rock temperature in every hour, how it's increasing and decreasing near the paintings. And ambient temperature, of course, with the help of the hygrometer, one can take it. Then we started plotting it. This was the uh, past June of 2003 when I did the experiment. When I started plotting every hour, and that was the hottest day of the year, from morning 8 till evening 6, we started plotting. The blue, uh, green color, sorry, the green color is the ambient temperature. Uh, um, uh, near the uh, sorry, yellow is the ambient temperature and green is the uh, temperature right on the rock surface. In the hot summer, sometime around four o'clock, when the sun set starts, setting starts, we found that the ambient temperature decreases six onwards. But that was the time when even the surface temperature on the rock. It never dips down. It started increasing. So there is a big uh, deviation between the surface temperature and uh, ambient temperature. And this leads to the thermal fracture on the rocks. If that happens, because many of the paintings are there are thermally fractured uh, pieces are coming out. Why it happens if there is a deviation in the temperature between the surface and ambient temperature, the small pieces where there is a joints and all that that will slowly come out. So how to stop it? Because before its protection in 98, when there was a uh, Kacha road to this, now there's a Pakka road, and many of the forest cutting has been done, or I can tell you even 80% of the forest were cut in 80s, when there is a visit of the prime minister. So uh, forest growth, will be very slow because right of the hilltop where the sediment uh, uh, is very uh, thin and nutrition is also less there. So we started studying the growth pattern of the trees in uh, front of the shelters that acts as a screen. So I'm not going to the details of that. Finally, we concluded that the natural uh, plant, particularly um, uh, this species, bamboos, can be planted which is local, not the other ones. In the valley, there are a lot of these local species are there. That needs to be planted. And that is what has been done now. Now then we do go for the lot of outreach programs and educate the people do's and don'ts. Now I'll go to the next aspect. I'll go fast for another uh, just 10, 15 minutes. Uh, the tangible aspects, because I have told you the natural thing and all that, how it's connected with the uh, paintings and rock shelters. Once we preserve that, things will be preserved at place, the monuments. Intangible heritage, it belongs to whom? As I may identify, it belongs to them, the indigenous people. Who are the indigenous people? There are 21 villages within the buffer zone. There are 15 tribal villages and six are non-tribal villages. Most of the dominating tribal communities are the Gons, Bills, and there are other four communities are there. And if you'll see, it's a very interesting. We have done their um, ethnographic studies. These are the areas where you'll find the wild rice. In this forest, there are pockets of wild rice, the, which is not, um, which is called a perennial harvesting. And these are very, very fast disappearing from our country, even from that area, which I noticed 20 years back. And today, if I'm comparing, almost 80% of these are gone now. Now, it's a beautiful, and this, this, this knowledge belongs to them. How they harvest it and all that, we have fully documented it. And understanding the forest and different plants. And there are varieties of medicinal plants are there. More than 30 medicinal plants. And these medicinal plants and its use, who are the people? Well, they know it. The Every village has got the medicine man. They have got excellent knowledge of its availability, where it's available and all that and what's the use. 
that they know about it. It's there. And we call it a navigation and the landscape. It's a very interesting thing I'll tell you. If any one of us those are staying in the uh, city areas, if someone take us and leave us in the middle of the forest without any um, equipments like uh, compass or GPS and all that, it will be very difficult for us to come out. But these people can very well come out. Even they can locate. They can find out that because for us, the forest looks alike. It's a similar. But for them, every tree, every stone is a landmark for them. The way for us, our shops and buildings are landmarks in the city areas. So I'm showing all these rice collection methods, how they do it, and the medicine man. This knowledge about the traditional medicine are fast disappearing. I'll tell you why. And these buildings, excellent, very neat and clean tribal houses. And I'll tell you, government is providing money and they have constructed under certain programs, uh, beautiful concrete buildings. Do you know what's happening to the concrete buildings? They are not staying. These tribal communities, bills or bones, they take their cattle and put in those modern buildings. If you ask them, they say that it's very hot. We cannot stay there. Our buildings are much better, 100 times better than those. So we'll have to understand what they require. We cannot frost open. The, develop, the concept of development should not be defined by us. What they require for them, they should spell out and that should be adapted. And they have got their uh, DTs, bone DTs, because these are all they are nature believers and all that. They are very simple looking places. These are very fast disappearing. And that needs to be respected. And that must have got some link with the paintings. And uh, if you see folk art, it's extremely rich. I'll show you there are many similarities. For example, the left side paintings are from the rock paintings. And see the um, paintings that they do. There are a lot of similarities. Even left side is the paintings geometrical patterns on the rock shelters that belong to um, uh, Mesolithic or Chalcolithic phase. And similar paintings you can still find on the um, um, walls of the villages. And these paintings, left, right, and these continuities are there. And if you find the strato marks are very um, excellent evidence of the continuity. Now there are a couple of uh, scholars now studying about these in the different parts of the country. So this has got a this, the meaning behind all these tattoos are fast, people are forgetting. And this will tell about our cultural background. And this can also give some meaning to many of the symbols that has been um, presented in the rock shelters. And they have got the beautiful traditional craft. They are very fast disappearing. They need to be preserved. They can become, government should help them to encourage their crafts and save their own things. And within their environment, they should create. And that can be sold. And for their benefit, that can be returned back. The way they harvest, the, the way they collect. And it's excellent. And these, none of us, we are good in their knowledge with their purchases. And they are the best environmentalists of their local environment. They can survive, but we can't. And how to reduce the over-exploiters? That's a company. Because government all the say, says, there's the over exploitation of the forest. Hence, we should have the restriction on the, um, uh, uh, particularly um, uh, on those um, uh, forest areas. And that reduces the, when there is a restriction through different um, uh, laws of forest laws and all that things, the traditional knowledge substance disappears. How to reduce this? Because this is the area which is protected uh, by the government of India, but there are very the circular things. They are all deforested um, uh, hills are there within the reserve forest. One can really create a social forestry. The plants that they require, let them develop. The local beneficiaries, local people, should be given these areas to develop their own forest. I have seen the tribal people never destroy the forest. It is the outside people, those who destroy the forest through them because they are not the, because they know how to preserve the forest. And these are some of the acts that creates a problem, hindrance for that. Why? 
because through these acts, cattle cannot be taken. That's true. But the local people has got villages have got one or two. The government should see that the outside cattle, outside the buffer zone, that should not be allowed. That should be the restriction, which is not happening. Then there's a cutting of the grass and pasture cattle and uh, large scale, yeah, particularly wood cutting and all the things. If you go to the Himachal Pradesh, local people are permitted to take to cut the trees for construction of their own houses. That's not, forest is not deteriorating. How much uh, wood they want? But it should not go out of their areas. So the forest belongs to them. And likewise, picking, uprooting of the uh, specific plants like um, uh, um, uh, particularly uh, medicinal plants. Why? All the cities where we are having, we look, uh, um, 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 see on the path, uh, food path, there are many medicinal plants are sold. Those are all people are getting from the forest through this tribal area, uh, people. If you stop that, how much um, uh, medicinal plants they require for their own consumption? Hardly anything. So if we really stop the outside interference, can really be preserved and their traditional knowledge system can be uh, preserved. And best thing is to preserve the tangible and intangible heritage of these communities is to tangible heritage is understood in conjunction with the intangible. That is one lesson we get. Even if any of the monuments like Kutub Minar or any of these monuments we say that only Kutub Minar. No, surrounding environments which have been destroyed and we have created a beautiful lawn, which is not our tradition, which is uh, introduced from the Britishers. Our traditions of the day, creating a forest, creating a bagan. So those needs to be created and our own um, uh, natural environment that needs to be created, which is really a lesson. And the owners of this tangible, intangible heritage, these uh, um, uh, local communities should become a stakeholder in safeguarding your, our heritage. So that's what uh, I feel. And thank you all for your patience. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Thank you very much for your uh, enlightening uh, paper on this uh, management not the chemical conservation of the paintings yeah. it is a, a social struggle and the social management of the conservation of particularly the uh, bibetka paintings see there are two major things we can see here one is a, a social management another one is chemical management the paintings, as you can see, this Ajanta Elora, they are uh, really struggling to make uh, a chemical conservation of the paintings. This is a problem of even in uh, Bivetka also. But you have taken the social problem with a struggle with the forest and the deforestation and the forest making and the people, how uh, we are spoiling it. Particularly the what you said about the local festivals, fair time, how the people are spoiling the whole area. It is there everywhere in India. Right. The using, using of this plastic and putting their waste in the site or in the premises of the site and just forgetting what they are doing. So that is another big problem. As, a, as a, an archaeologist, I'm my requesting this Archaeological Survey of India right. to ban such things. You have all right uh, everything to stop that kind of activity. Yeah. So thank you very much for your paper, sir. Now I request uh, the August audience to interact with him. Any question, any clarification you need, please. My friend Suresh is looking here. Sir, anything? Anything from your side, Suresh, Keshav, Swamshekar, many of them from Karnataka, they are here, are outsiders. Please, anything, any clarification from the paper presenter, please, uh, you can discuss with him. Yeah. 
Uh, Suresh Sab, you are uh, you are muted. Um, Please on me. Yes, sir. Yeah. I visited this site, sir, when I was a School of Archaeology student. <laughs> After that, I did not uh, get any chance to go there. Right. After yes. the university, my way of life is a different from the ASI. Right. I know, I know. <laughs> Anyhow, it is a very good paper. Thank you very much. Sir, the excavations have been conducted here. Yielded the last of prehistoric antiquities. Yes. The yes. prehistoric caves with paintings is a very rare phenomenon. Rare. Yes. That's yes. why it has been preserved at the World Heritage Site and only the one World Heritage Site of prehistoric time in the country. Right. There are 30 or 32 World Heritage Sites in India, out of which only one that is, uh, yeah, declared in 2003. Three. But yes. the strict implementation of the law is not going there, I believe. If it is strictly Nice. implemented these kind of uh, the social activities the fair and the forest department has to cope up with the archaeological yes. survey of india to bring all these kind of uh, activities to manage properly that your world have been coined by you that is managed properly to restrict all these things to protect the the world heritage site i think nowhere in india we will find this kind of a uh, superimposing uh, paintings right. in one particular place, more than 1,000 rock shelters. That is very important. Yes, sir. Any other question, please? We have completed our paper within the stipulated time. Right, right. <laughs> but I feel bad that I have to go very fast because many of the uh, other experiments I have uh, not shown because it's very difficult to... Uh, uh, so everything, whatever I did in last uh, five, ten years in that... Uh, yes, sir. Right your, your slides are very uh, important and informative and it gives a lot of uh, input on how to manage the managing of an archaeological site, particularly the World Heritage Site. That is That has to be uh, given importance here. Yes, madam, any other question? Devesh, madam, your paper was so good. I'm so happy. But any question from your side? Your ASI man, Kesho, must be there. Now, there is, uh, sir, there is one question from uh, Devra. Uh, uh -huh. uh, um, uh, that's in the chat box, I'll tell you. Okay. Uh, what do the people from the Mela tell you about the paintings when you uh, talk with them? In fact, uh -huh. uh, they say that uh, these are all done by, uh, they call Putli. I mean, our predecessor, sometimes they call it a, a, like a, some sort of a gods and goddesses and all that. That's what. Because that direct uh, uh, link is not there. So far, the um, uh, legions or traditions are concerned. But that particular aspect, if it is investigated, the different folklores and all that of those communities, probably that may reveal some clue how they feel about this. Uh, they are going to unmute. Actually, there is a problem with her. She cannot unmute uh, uh, and all that. Because it is the big, Sir, only, the only answer for that, there should be belongingness. Yes, agreed, agreed. agreed. What, what you said, the tangible and intangible living cultural heritage. It should be protected properly everywhere in the country. Uh, particularly the prehistoric paintings like this should be taken care. I think uh, most of the foreign countries are also involved in the conservation of chemical conservation of these paintings. We have to take care of such things for Sir, uh, keep in them. Fact, uh, in fact, in many other countries, particularly rock paintings, uh -huh. uh, it is a ban because no one is applying any chemicals onto this. Okay. Because uh, we... many of the paintings, particularly rock paintings, if it contains some organic matter, that would alter it. Sir, because... sir, my 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 question is, the analysis of chemical content of the painting should be taken properly. As you mentioned, the painting is peeling off. 
the peeling of painting should be taken for analysis of chemical analysis. Yes, yes. Knowing the nature of that, then we can do the conservation of those paintings. That is my intention of telling this. Okay, sir. Any other question? No. Okay, sir. Thank you very much for uh, completing the paper within the stipulated time. Oh, sir, Kandu, uh, Professor Kandukumar Mishra ji, we have done our job properly. We have completed within the stipulated time and we are handing over mic to you, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you for giving this opportunity to conduct this uh, particularly very important management of conservation paper. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, Dev, Dev, sir. Yes, uh, Dr. C. M. Mishra, please be audible. Dr. C. M. Mishra, CRS Co College, India. Co convener. Dr. C. M. Mishra. Maybe he has a... Uh, okay, sir. Uh, yes, sir. He may not be listening to us. Oh, no. <coughs> or, uh, good afternoon, good afternoon, sir. Thank you, Dr. Rangaraju, sir. Uh, thank for you, sir. For the session and given time uh, for in this webinar. And uh, our uh, speaker, uh, Dr. Ota, sir, uh, former joint director, uh, Archaeological Survey of India, give a nice talk on uh, Bhim Betka. Uh, this uh, talk is uh, from uh, Madhya Pradesh, Shaikh. Uh, so, uh, all of you both, thank you, sir. Uh, okay, sir. Now... Sir, uh, I have one question, yeah. sir. Yeah, please, please, please. Uh, yeah. Good afternoon, sir. Very good presentation and the topic is very interesting also, sir. So please introduce uh, yourself, madam. Please. Uh, I'm Dr. Mary Josephine, Principal right. uh -huh. St. Joseph College, Tirupur. Actually, okay. I'm botanist doing physiology okay. and biochemistry part. But Very actually, good. we are searching for natural dye. Uh, uh -huh. While the renovating or uh, the repainting the original scripture, they're spoiling the originality while doing renovation. How to protect it without spoiling that uh, no. scripture and paint, sir? M Madam, yeah, you will you answer, sir. Uh -huh. uh, yeah, please. Madam, in fact, uh, we have got a tradition that uh, anything which you, which you have lost, we do not repaint it. Exactly. exactly. That's so what that I wanted to say. The basic principle hmm. of conservation. Conserving something, I cannot add. If I can add, I can have a much better painting. I can make it full, the paintings. But uh, the principles that we follow strictly, because I'll give a madam a small example. Any okay. of the monument, when it gets destroyed, I, if I keep on adding to it, they will come. If I add more than 50% onto that, 50, more than 60, 70% becomes new and 30, 40% is old. Should I call it a new building or an old building? Mm -hmm. So, probably I reply you, and yes. that's what happens. So, I agree madam, with you, sir. Uh -huh. yeah. Please, please. now, madam, I, I want to put some more uh, points here. Yeah. Okay, the sir. archaeobotany, a science okay. which is very, very popular in the archaeological survey of India. Archaeobotany, okay, archaeozoology, archaeogeology, all these are very, very competitive because the archaeobotany is helpful for. Pollen analysis, dendrochronology, <laughs> and many okay, other things. Sir. And we take, we will not put into the new thing there. We will try to conserve it by using the same material or same thing where we lost the part of the painting. Hmm. That, that fact, is the yes. uh, in principles fact, of conservation. In fact, sir, uh, I have doubt uh, you mentioned about both yeah. archaeobotany and archaeozoology. Yes. yes. Uh, so, as a botanist, we can suggest this topic. Will the uh, university agree that topic, sir? Madam, yeah, we are, see, in the University of Mysore, okay, I am teaching sir. this archaeobotany and archaeochemistry, archaeozoology, because basically okay, I am sir. a botany zoology graduate. Okay, so sir. I studied archaeology, botany and uh, zoology properly, and uh, I have introduced a paper, uh, archaeochemistry, okay, for sir. a 
certificate course in one of the in two colleges of the University of Mysore. Sir, and will you please uh, help us in uh, running that course, introduce the course in our university? Yeah, please, you can do it, madam. Here, uh, the one uh, uh, Teresian college people are doing that with the help of my syllabus and my teaching there. Uh, we are okay. conducting practical classes also for conservation okay, of antiquities. Analyzing okay, chemically and then doing the conservation. So I'm specializing because, in that also. Oh. You no, just contact okay, me. Sir. I'll take the okay, number sir. from uh, uh, his contact me. I will help you for uh, introducing okay, that. Sir. One more doubt. Yes. Because yeah. uh, botany, zoology, chemistry, nowadays, including Max also, only few mm -hmm. takers are there. If we uh, introduce such paper and uh, start mm -hmm. this kind of course, definitely that attract the students, I think, sir. Exactly, madam. See, the dating method, we are using this pollen analysis and the dendrochronology, it, it becomes very popular in the field of uh, study and analysis of archaeological objects, the, even from the prehistoric time also. So that kind of uh, teaching should, I am doing here for the MSc botany students also in Mysore University. Okay, sir. So you can use that. You can use and help them for knowing about this kind of special paper. Yes, yes, definitely, sir. Very thank interesting, you, sir. Very interesting yeah. topic. So thank Hello, you. Sir. Sir. Uh, now, uh, next Hello. session. Uh, Hello. Hello. Am I audible? Hello. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much, sir, for your uh, explanation. Hello. And Hello. I got a uh, new idea. Now, next session, please. Hello. Am I audible? Uh, our, our, speaker, our speaker, Professor Dr. Suresh Chandra, uh, Suresh Chandra Mathur. Our okay. eminent speaker, our next Thank session you. is Dr. Chandra Mathur, sir, and our chairperson, Dr. Satish Tripathi, formerly Deputy Director General, Geological Survey of India, uh, Lucknow. Uh, Dr. Satish Chandra uh, Mathur, sir, is the partner and head of Department Geology, JNV University, Jodhpur, Professor Emeritus, SGB University, Jaipur. Co-chairperson Dr. R. N. Tiwari, Professor of Geology, Government Science College, Riva. Welcome all of you, sir. And I am request to Dr. Satish Tripathi, sir, please preside the session and introduce our eminent speaker, Professor Dr. Suresh Chandra. Hello, Professor Rangar Aju. Hello. Yes, sir. Hello. Uh, I'm Good afternoon, sir. Is it possible to ask uh, Dr. Ota? Uh -huh. Hello. Yeah, please tell me, sir. I'm audible yes. for you. I want to ask uh, Dr. Opa, how uh -huh. do organic and inorganic, uh, you know, things are hmm. done by organic and inorganic, you know, material in the rock shelter. Is that possible to hmm. ask the question to Dr. Ota? Yeah, yeah. I know he's not. He is not seen. Sir, can I answer for this question? Yeah, I, I would be happy. I'll be happy if this question is uh, you know, conveyed to him. And if I please, have the please. answer, I want to know the person who is asking, uh, asking the question. I am Professor J S Kharakwal, archaeologist from Udaipur, Rajasthan. Okay, sir. Sir, we have to do the chemical analysis first. What are the content of the painting? Not not scrapping or not damaging the original paper painting. Because the field of painting or the, where the, we lost the painting from sunlight and other things, that damaged part will be studied properly. And then we do that to exactly the, what you said, the chemical analysis, and then we do the chemical conservation. Sir, as far as I understand, uh, 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 majority of people do survey and discover process. They are um, not, not, you know, uh, scientists. They are mostly archaeologists. How do they identify the paintings, inorganic and inorganic paintings? Sir, sir, in the Archaeological Survey of India, there is a chemical analysis branch is there. Yeah, yeah I am aware, aware, aware of it. I am uh, aware of they it. Are, they, they study those kind of paintings and then the analysis they do. And even the chemical laboratories are there in Chennai, in Mysore and everywhere. The, all this in Gopal also, there is a 
chemical analysis center is there they do the analysis and they give the result and we will carry out the work in the field very carefully very scientifically and with the help of only people who have that experience of doing that no is it possible to have doctor in this question हम आपको ओटा सर का नंबर उपलब्ध कराएंगे अभी ये सेशन जो है टाइम हो रहा है नेक्स्ट सेशन का इंतजार कर रहे हैं हम आपको ओटा सर का फोन उपलब्ध करा देंगे यस सर और माय माय नंबर आल्सो यू कैन गिव इट टू हिम सर वी विल आई विल टॉक टू हिम आल्सो ओके सर थैंक यू थैंक यू यस डॉक्टर त्रिपाठी प्लीज थैंक यू professor misra for uh, organizing such a wonderful uh, online conference uh, i am seeing a lot of uh, enthusiasm in discussion on various topics uh, the list of topic is also varied and uh, especially on behalf of the jsc community i am thankful to you that you have taken the uh, 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 subject of uh, geo heritage conservation uh, professor uh, mathur is very close friend of mine and we are associated in uh, many ways uh, in the geo heritage conservation in our country so this is a proud privilege that uh, Uh, i am chairing a session which is where professor uh, uh, sc mathur will be delivering a talk his topic of the talk is uh, geo heritage sites of jodhpur implication of geo park professor uh, i will just introduce uh, professor mathur dr suresh chandra mathur is former professor and head department of geology jnv university jodhpur he obtained his phd in geology from jodhpur university on phosphorite in 1987 he is having more than 33 years of experience of teaching and research he has visited several countries and has been member of igcp projects he also organized several uh, national and international conferences and field workshop he has published over 56 research papers in national and international journals and six chapters in international books he is also uh, received recently rece nominated as a guest editor of the special volume of international journal geo heritage by springer so uh, i will not take much time because it is a very interesting uh, topic and uh, Uh, many thing which he is going to explain will be new to our uh, participant so i will request professor mathur to please uh, start his presentation thank you very much yes professor mathur please start professor mathur we are seeing your presentation please start your lecture we are not audible professor mathur please unmute your mic please we are not able to hear you we can't hear you sir
Your slide visible, sir. Dr. Mathur, please start the session. So I have contacted uh, uh, Dr. Mathur on phone. There is some some issue he is trying to resolve. Meanwhile, uh, I will take this time to appraise uh, all uh, uh, participants that since last uh, few years we are vigorously uh, pursuing uh, geoheritage conservation uh, in India. Uh, you know uh, we uh, don't have any legislation so far in India to protect our uh, geological heritage. Where, whereas we have uh, uh, um, uh, legislation for biodiversity, we have legislation for cultural heritage, but unfortunately we don't have any uh, legislation to conserve our geological heritage. So since last few years, we are pursuing with the government and uh, we have formulated a draft legislation also submitted to central government and requested them to please take up the uh, important issue because of uh, because due to large urbanization and developmental activities lot of uh, geo imp very important global uh, geo heritage sites of india being destroyed because because it is not known to common people what are actually the geological heritage and you know uh, 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 unesco is recognizing uh, UNESCO Global Geopark like uh, uh, World uh, Cultural Heritage Night. So I think I think yes. Professor Mathur is now ready. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yeah, yeah. Sir, uh, please make your presentation. Okay. Now it is audible. My voice is audible. Yes, we can hear you. Okay. Please start your presentation. Okay. Okay. Okay, first of all, I am very thankful to the organizers, especially uh, Dr. Misra and others who have contacted me and invited me for this uh, talk to present in this uh, webinar. I'm very thankful to Dr. Satish Tripathi, our colleague, and rather our guide on the national level is leading this uh, concept of geoheritage in India. So I'm very happy to see him as a chairman today. So thank you very much to all the participants who joined my lecture today. So my talk is today, as uh, Dr. Vistra has uh, told me, to highlight the geoheritage aspects uh, of India. Uh, and I'm taking this opportunity to, to uh, with the help of case study from Jodhpur, uh, I want to explain some uh, concepts which are going on internationally, uh, which are very successful rather at international level, but due to some uh, uh, problems of methodology and guidelines in India, we are not properly handling these concepts in India and uh, also not implementing in the right direction in India. So, with your permission, sir, I start my talk on Geoheritage of Jodhpur Implication for Geopark. Uh, concept of Geopark and Geotourism at international level, I would like to add that the concept of Geopark conceived in first UNESCO International Conference on Geopark at Beijing, China in 2004. It was uh, later on subsequently defined as Geopark is a single unified geographical and geological areas where geosites and landscape of <laughs> geological significance are managed with holistic concept of protection. The most important is the internationally significant landscape of the geological features uh, UNESCO is uh, uh, recognizing and promote for the protection and conservation of the landscape for education and sustainable socio-economic development of region through geotourism. So 
in Indian context, uh, essential criteria to set up new geopark is the aspiring UNESCO Global Geopark must have natural landscape of unique geological and cultural heritage, which are of international significance. This is the prime objective of the UNESCO Geopark, should be supported by scientific publications of merit. And the landscape should have clear ownership to foster multicultural link between heritage conservation and the maintenance of geological, historical, and cultural diversity of that particular area. The main object to create geopark should ultimately for social economic development, mainly through geotourism. And you can say the geological heritage, including the water heritage in a landscape, should be conserved for tourism, education, and science for the sustainable development of the societies. So this is all about the geopark. And similarly, the geo Tourism is a natural tourism that sustains or even enhances the geological character of a place, such as its geocide, geodiversity, geoheritage, culture, and environment to promote tourism and for the well being of its residents for sustainable development of tourism. So, uh, geotourism at the international level nowadays is promoting and helping as an additional tool to promote the tourism and at international level. Uh, it is very successful uh, concept. So at international level, Geopark is considered as pioneer in the promotion of tourism through geotourism. And about 37% of tourists visited UNESCO Geopark and National Nature Park clearly indicate that this concept enormously contributed to international travel as a, uh, arrivals in the countries having Geopark. So this is most important. That's why due to increasing trend of geotourism internationally, till date 169 geo, UNESCO Geopark has been developed in 49 countries. I am fortunate enough to visit four or five geopark. And one example I have put here, the yellow geopark, which we have visited with family. You can see the erosional structures, which are fascinating and attract a lot of travel travelers and visitors there. And enormous tourism has been increases based only on the, some erosional uh, landscape. And Jodhpur is endowed with so many type of uh, geodiversity. I will show you in my uh, proceeding uh, slides that Jodhpur is a unique place geologically that I will explain you and why the Jodhpur is very important for to increase the geotourism and geopark activity. And we have brought a paper recently uh, published in Journal of Geoheritage, and uh, in which we have given uh, all these details of our geosite, which I am going to present today. So though India is endowed with rich and unique geo resources, geo resources are simply minerals, rocks, and fossils within a landscape of its six physiographic divisions. You know that the the geodiversity of India is very rich. Many of them are of international significance. They fulfill the first criteria of Geopark. Scientifically, geo resources of India are least understood and not adequately explored for their geo heritage and geotourism values. Being first effort in this regard in India, 32 national geological monuments declared by GSI, of which Rajasthan has 10 sites of which two are in Jodhpur. So Jodhpur itself, in terms of National Geological Monument, is an important site. Recently, 100 geotourism hotspots of India are identified and declared by GSI, of which three are from Jodhpur. So again, it also proves the significance of landscape of the Jodhpur. So efforts pertaining to concept of geo-heritage potential of India are also reflected in form of several research papers and reports. So many workers have meticulously worked, including our Dr. Tripathi. They have done meticulous work and initiated the concept of geo sites and geo heritage and geo park in India. And now we will going to hope that we will succeed in the near future. But the main problem is in absence of any guideline and methodology to select and assess geo site. India does not able to develop even a single geopark till date. So in our paper, 2021, we have published a paper in which we try to propose a 
criteria for selection and assessment of the geocide and also the criteria for assessment of hydrogeocide for the hydrogeothermal value of a landscape. So the main criteria is the scope in which first one is the name of hydro. We have to name the hydrogeocide. Should be easy identification, should utilize geological, geographical, historical, cultural, and religious references that should have GPS. It should be accessible, easy to visit. Visibility of the character should be clear and safety measures should be there. Similarly, most important is the scientific value that is the hydrogeological and geological and geomorphological framework and it should be, all should be characterized geologically. Then the util, for the utilization, we have to have some indications, <laughs> use of hydrogeological and geological and geomorphological details at the geosite in form of some sign boards and interpretation panels and use of other values and especially the land status or the ownership of the land of a particular ge geosite should be very clear along with the other coordination and organizational uh, criteria like cleanness of the hydrogen uh, geosite, toilet, food, uh, facilities there in the nearby area and also the accommodation. Similarly for the hydrogen uh, Actually, this I have taken from yesterday's lecture, this classification, which I have delivered yesterday uh, in Tech Puna, I have organized, uh, in which I have uh, presented the hydrogeocytes of Rajasthan. So I have taken this uh, in hurry. This, that's, that's, please consider it for the geocite also. So for geotourism, these are the availability, usage, and logistic, and perceptiveness. So, Hydrogeotourism can be promoted through our method, uh, methodology and can be select uh, all the various geosites based on these. So before, as I have been said that the various disciplined persons are joined today. So I just want to give some brief about the terminologies which are uh, uh, generally used in this field. And these in the Indian context, I wouldn't just want to enumerate them. Geosite is geographical site or area of significant features represent geological processes of earth history. So particular area or landscape should tell us about the special features and also define the geological process of the earth history along with associated scientific, educational, historical and cultural and or aesthetic values of that particular area. Second term is the geodiversity, is the variety of rocks, mineral fossils, landforms, sediments, and soil with their significant geological characters displaying natural processes which formed and altered them. Geoheritage encompasses the global, national, statewide, and local features of the geology, geology at all scales associated with historical and cultural values, offering information or insight into the evolution of the earth or into the history of science. So that can be used for research, teaching, reference, and tourism. And most important is the geoconservation, is the practice of recognizing, protecting, and managing geocytes with the values of their geology, geomorphology, and hydrogen. So basic aim is to protect our geocyte or conserved our geocide for the future generation. And also for the increasing for the geotourism activities. Is it, geotourism is a knowledge of nature-based tourism and interdisciplinary integration of the tourism industry with conservation and interpretation of abiotic nature attributes with related culture issue within the geocide for general public to observe, understand, and enjoy. The basic aim is to uh, enjoy, understand, and observe is the tourism, and geotourism can be an additional tool to promote our tourism in the, in the country through the geopark. And geopark is a single unified geographical area where geosite of international geological significance are managed with a holistic concept of protection, education, and sustainable socio-economic development through geotourism and geo business. So, as I said to you that uh, 
Uh, Geopark and Geotourism are very successful tools internationally to promote tourism. So why not in India we can uh, apply all these concepts to recognize our internationally significant uh, geo heritage, uh, of which uh, I am today concentrated on the geo heritage of the Jodhpur. Jodhpur is a city situated in the western Rajasthan in the Thar Desert. It's also known as the Sun City and famous tourist place already because of its uh, uh, palaces, foods, and uh, step well. But geologically, it is also a very significant place. I will show you some uh, international significant feature through the geology. So Jodhpur is endowed with four north north east south south from the significant natural landscape of the Jodhpur. You can see here four north north east south south west uh, regions are there, and in linear valley the Jodhpur city is developing. Geologically, uh, these georesources are of two types: volcanic rocks of Malani igneous tooth and the sedimentary rocks of Ediacara age of Jodhpur group of Marwar super group. So this landscape of Jodhpur is representing actually two significant period of the earth history. That is Cryogenian by Malani Ignesu of rocks and Ediacara age, Ediacara period by Jodhpur group of rocks. Additionally, Malani Ignis Sud is considered as the one of the largest felsic and orogenic and terrestrial volcanic prominence of the world. Actually, it is uh, covering about 51,000 square kilometers and it spreads up to Madagascar, Special, Eastern Africa, and Western part of India. It's a large prominence. And that displays the pan African orogeny. Related to splitting of Rodinia supercontinent. So the earliest on supercontinent can split and that outcome of the MIS lava at that time. So it preserved the unique and rare volcanic features at Mahanga Ridge. This, this ridge is full of uh, deposition of pyroclastics and lava rocks of the Malali Gestu which is related to splitting of the Rohingya. It signifies its international values and also as you described as the National Geological Monument of India. First on the pyroclastic rocks. And second one is the, its contact with the rare contact of uh, Malani Ignis Suit and Jodhpur Group of Rock. Both have been declared a National Geological Monument by GSI. Similarly, the rocks of Jodhpur Group of Marwar supergroup are endowed with treasure of sedimentary structure. The, the Jodhpur sandstone is known for the treasure of sedimentary. You can see here copy book style uh, preservation of various types, almost <coughs> all the sedimentary structures which have been preserved in the classic sedimentary rock. You can see and observe and study here. Along with the Along with the significant fossils of Ediacara fossils, these are the oldest complex Ediacara fossil. Uh, both these landscapes form the internationally significant landscape of India. So after testing all criteria of methodology of Mathur 2021 and Mathur et al. 2000, Mathur 2000, 21 is uh, a student who has uh, completed his PhD. I think uh, one of the first uh, or maybe uh, uh, PhD on the geoheritage of Western Rajasthan in India. And this paper we have published in Geoheritage. Along with the consideration of the local geology, we have selected 12 geosites showcasing remarkable and outstanding geodiversity of four types. These are geological type, geomorphological type, archaeological type, and hydrogeosites, according to Roman classification. So, according to 12 geosites in unified area on the MGR, 
which is covering about 23.74 square kilometer area with an elevation. This is the dam of the Jodhpur city showing the elevation also. You can see here, these rocks are about uh, 287 to 404 meter elevation. And a spectacular nat natural landscape is proposed for the potential site for the geopark in Jodhpur. And you can see here the Google image of this part of the Marangat Ridge where we have selected 12 uh, geosite. This is the rocks of Malani Suit, and these are the query areas of Jodhpur Sandstone, Jodhpur Group of Rocks. So taking our first geotype, which we have selected near or at the foothill of the Mehrangarh Pool. Uh, this uh, spectacular food is famous throughout the world for its uh, palaces, museum, and hive. So, but here geologically, uh, the excellent preservation of pyroclastic rocks from the Malani Igneous suit is preserved here. So we call them as the this type of georitage. Here, a 50 meter thick and about 175 meter wide representative section of pyroclastic rocks of Malani Igneous suit, which is also declared as the National Geological Mon Monument, is located at the foothill of Marangat Pool, showing two distinct zones. Yeah. You see here. Up the connection no? Upper partially bended zone and lower one is the densely bended zone. So these two zones preserve significant geological features in them. Uh, important are the ash laminations, igniporite deposit, welded proof deposits, and various type of features and structures. I will uh, show you in the next slide. And along with this, Mehrangat Fort, its palaces and museum provide the additional values, cultural and historical values to this geosite because it is very near to the Mehrangat Fort. In these two drones, significantly they display primary and secondary welding of pyroclastic material with devectrification features that include apparent flows unit, dense compaction, of the welded tooth, welding of pyroclastics and eutectic features along with flow units, bands and same deformational room. It uh, flow bands, secondary features such as horizontal cooling and our evidence uh, uh, cooling and vertical columnar joints, vesicular, spheroidal, orbicular and paralytic structure I will show you in next slides and have genetic implication. Most important these features are, have a very significant genetic implication to, uh, to study the MIS rocks and how they have been evolved. Our evidence is of different uh, physical and chemical conditions of the lava at that time. Thus, because of all these volcanic characters, it is declared as National Geological Monument of India. That's why it is a very significant site of Jodhpur. Second is the geosite at Mehran Fort. Uh, at the foothill of the Mahangur Pool, all along the, there is a contact between rocks of Malani in the suit and Jodhpur group of rocks. And one of the best sections is available near the uh, lift inside the fort. Uh, this rare section of MI steering shows depositional gap marked by pronounced unconformity between welded tuff and of MIS and sandstone of Jodhpur group. It represents an interface between two major periods, that is cryogenian and ediacaran, of remarkable serenity in the geological history of the Earth, thus declared as a National Geological Monument by GSI. Third spectacular geosite is near just one palace section where we can observe the core stones. These are the core stones you can see formed due to the chemical weathering of the welded tooth at the top surface of the uh, columnar joint. A statue of Rao Joda is placed here. Uh, he is the founder of Jodhpur city. Uh, he started uh, developing J Jodhpur city in 1459. And uh, uh, there is a story, the time is less, so I'm not going into the details of uh, development of Jodhpur, but 
I just want to inform that we have brought a paper, uh, Journey of Jodhpur City Through Impounding Structure, with my student, Siu Singh Rathor. He recently retired as a chairman of Rajasthan Public Service Commission, and he uh, submitted his DSC thesis last month on the significant uh, step wells of Rajasthan. And based on that uh, work, uh, yesterday I have delivered a lecture of Intech Pune. So, uh, along with this core stone, uh, uh, Devkund, very near to this geocide, and a spectacular Jaswan Palace constructed by the HSR uh, Heritage Stone Resources. Nowadays, UNESCO also, or inter at international level, the local stones, which are decorative and building stone, famous and constructed, very famous buildings are considered as HSR. Similarly, the Jodhpur Sandstone is also, uh, Dr. Kaur of Punjab University, they have published this paper, and they have uh, established the HSR qualities of Jodhpur Sandstone and Makarana Marble. marble. So this Jaswan Palace is uh, uh, constructed by using the Makarana Marble Spectacular Palace, which impart both Devkund hydrogeosite and its banks and all these things have been constructed by Jodhpur Sandstone. That's why they provide the additional archaeological values to this geosite. The fourth geosite is the Raujada Desert Rock Park. Uh, I'm very happy to inform you that at Mehrangad Ridge, with our association, Mehrangad Museum Trust, uh, by the blessing of our HS, the Simji, uh, we have we could uh, able to develop a pilot project here. Uh, is mini geopark you can say that, and it preserve all sort of geodiversity which are present in the Jodhpur. That's why we have select uh, this land of uh, 72 hectares at Mehrangad Ridge, and it has many additional values. I will show you in my uh, next slides. So Raujada Desert Rock Park, we named it Raujada Desert Rock Park. Raujada is the founder of Jodhpur, that's why we have named this uh, park on his name. It is situated in a 1600, uh, 1600 AD uh, building, spectacular building, which is constructed by HSR of Jodhpur near the Singoria Gate, which is famous gate in the Jodhpur to enter out of seven, seven gates to enter into the fourth wall, one, one of the gate is Singoja Gate, and it is the oldest gate. So this symbolic place we have utilized for the uh, interpretation center and uh, museum, and we have developed, I will show you. So this remarkable geodiversity and objective of development of uh, Raujada Park by MMT with our association was to conserve the significant geodiversity and biodiversity. Earlier, you, you see the greenery all over in this geopark area, which we have proposed, are barren land earlier. But we have irrigated all the bubbles from here and put the uh, geocytes uh, taken from the Western Rajasthan, and out of them, 17 have been on the uh, verge of the extinction and we put all these species here along with other uh, plants and we call them lithophytes, the plants which can be survive in the rocks. And we have published a paper with uh, Mr. Pradeep Ji on the lithophytes. So geocyte five and six are as three main segments. First one is the visitor centers housed with an interpretation gallery about the Great Thar Desert. We have all information regarding Great Thar Desert here, along with small library and a geological museum for the visitors. And this photo I have taken uh, with the event that organized uh, Dr. Satish Tripathi ji uh, on the Geodiversity uh, Geoheritage Day we have celebrated in Jodhpur. Along with the second is the most important part a nursery is there, uh, we call it a sandy plot, uh, where we grow the various plants and put them into the field of the MGR. And third one is the walking tree, that is the rock cut elephant canal. 
this through this canal water is drained from the catchment area of kailana and sursagar and drain it to the ranishar and padamsar i will show you these uh, what significant spectacular water bodies nowadays due to the catch uh, encroachment in the catchment area it is uh, devoid of any water that's why we have utilized both the faces uh, to study the geological various geologic features in the uh, malanis so among which is most important is the agglomerate Agglomerate is a compact and hard rock. Its class supported, poorly sorted, coarse accumulation of angular to sub-rounded large volcanic blocks, bombs, and lapilli set in the fine vitreous to facies matrix. So these proximal deposit tells you that they are derived from a nearby source. This, please, please keep it this in mind, along with the other uh, features. Geosite six is the section of rhyolite. Fine grade voluminous rhyolite covers almost northern and western part of uh, Mahanagar Range. Thick section of monotonous fine grained rhyolite outcrop display numerous small rounded and elliptical vesicle that is called geologists. The geologists call them the vesicular structure, and some of them show the amygdala structure also when they are being filled with the secondary minerals like quartz and calcite. On the surface, along with onion shell weathering near lower parking, I have not put that photograph. So this is very significant uh, geosite to see the characteristics of the rhyolite here. Geosite seven is the section of the volcanic breccia. You can see here the at the walk, walk, walking trail is consisting of the unsorted angular fragments, ranging in size from about one centimeter to maximum six centimeter, embedded in ground mass of extremely fine grain uh, to facies matrix of the rhyolite. So this is another uh, rock type which can be observed and study of geosite seven. So geosite eight is the section of the rhyolite porphyry. As I have told you that some of the uh, vesicles of the rhyolite have been filled with the secondary mineral, but this is different. This is a Hepabysal rock that is rhyolite porphyry at this section display euhedral to subhedral phenocryst of the quartz, alkali feldspar, and biotite, which are set in the deep trified quartz of helsphetic ground mass, showing two stages of cooling history of magma. This is the initially this rock has been emplaced, followed by this rhyolite having fast uh, crystallization. And this is younger, and this is older. Geosite nine is a very spectacular and magnificent, and very significant outcrop of the Malani Igneous Suit in form of a hill section. is actually one of the Precambrian acidic eruption point, and potential geologic site of volcanic landscape of Malani Igneous Suit, displaying variety of partially eroded volcanic lithology. And possibly a submit crater filled sedimentary landform here, over which a temple of Durga uh, Mata uh, has been placed here. And crater filled sedimentary landform you can observe here along with the rocks of Malani, pyroclastic and lava rocks. So, rhyolite flow covering its most of the southern and eastern slopes and rest of by coarse pyroclastics, which I have shown in the volcano. Uh, Walking trail of the Rajada Desert Rock Park. Such disposition of volcanic rock, its conical morphology and submit crater filled sediments at the top indicate possibly it is one of the ancient volcanic vent pool of the Malani Igneous Suit. We know that the Malani Igneous Suit is a fissure type eruption, but geologists have discovered three to four uh, vents. One is uh, uh, at Kalyanpur, another is at uh, near Pali, and Professor uh, Dr. Bhusan, uh, Director General of GSI, uh, he is retired Director General of GSI, he has discovered, but uh, we have recently discovered and uh, explained in our paper that it is possibly one of the vent of the Marangad Ridge. So along with the spectacular and magnificent 
geo heritage of malanig ne suit of rocks some uh, panoramic view you can see here potential geo tourism sites in the malani terrain near all the geo sites one is the kailang lake surrounded by rocks of amais this is the big uh, lake natural lake of jodhpur and igmp water is coming in this lake now it is very popular picnic spot and another is in the nearby area there is a machia safari park at the bank of machia lake it is a biological park zoo but now we are working on the geodiversity of this park also and nearby umed sagar lake displaying the various those the features of the malani land make it very magnificent uh, geo sites near to the our selected geo sites they actually increase the additional values of our selected geo sites in the nearby areas a second type of uh, geo heritage in jodhpur is the sedimentary type geo heritage uh, geologically jodhpur is comprised malanig ne suit of rock which form the basement and earlier recently in 2019 uh, we have uh, published a paper uh, in spain and in which we have redefined the geology of jodhpur and according because all these three formation which we have signed separate are displaying a different uh, sedimentology different environment different sedimentary structures and also the fossils that's why we have divided jodhpur group into three umed bone formation sursagar formation and motisar hill formation all three formation uh, are endowed with significant geo heritage i will show you first one is a uh, 48 meter thick goda ghati section of umed bhavan formation uh, display sequence of rocks of umed bhavan formation of jd with basement of rhyolite typical fluvial deltic traditional posting of parcelis clastic sequences for the geological students it is ideal section to see the fluvial deltic sequences showing the gradational porcelaining upward silic clastic sequences more than five cycles we have observed here in umed bone formation at this classic section one can be distinctly divided it into two zones soft zone and hard zone recently we are, our paper is published on the landslide recently in 2020 there was a landslide because of this geological disposition and we have published that paper and because of that most of the geo heritage of umed bhavan formation are under three red three so we have to conserve this uh, landscape also because it uh, have a profuse development of trough cross wedding along with beds lamination and so many other sediment structures second formation is the sursagar formation it has also a significant geo heritage and it is a 30 meter thick section in the fidosar quarry area uh, showcase the presence of treasure of sediment structures in fine to medium grain jodhpur sandstone which is also considered as hsr of jodhpur hsr of india also uh, and it preserved textbook style preservation of laminations beds wavy and current ripple marks cross beddings Dated bedding due to sin sedimentary structures, chromatographic structures, raindrop, score marks uh, that display beach to near coastal environment. Skin is visible. Skin is visible, sir. Suddenly has gone off. Oh, sir. Just a minute, sir. I said network lost. Network has been lost. Is it over there?
Yes, now we are able to see. Please continue. Continue, Professor Mathur. We are seeing. Would you hear me, sir? Please continue. Please continue. Okay. 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 So, Sursagar formation also endowed with significant sedimentary geoheritage. Along with that, rich, complex, and diverse assemblage of India kind of fossils are excellently preserved in Jodhpur sand stone. And these are the workers. They have uh, discovered so many types of India kind of fossils from the Jodhpur. It gives the uh, paleontological significance to this geosite, and it can be a very good paleontological site along with the sedimentary type geoheritage. Now, the third formation, Motisar Hill formation. Uh, preserve the spectacular uh, erosional structure similar to the yellow geopar and also the paleontological significance like uh, we visited Jara geopar in uh, uh, Spain. Uh, both are very similar landscape here. We can uh, explain here as a erosional landscape and shape structure similar to yellow geopark of Taiwan shown great geotourism value. These geostructures resemble the work of craftsmen, person making unique artistic shape sculpture, making this site of unique geological entity of India. You can see here a tiger rock, he named it human head, the turtle rock, uh, the gun point, gun rock, the spiral rock, and the snake rock, crocodile rock, cave rock, mushroom rock, red rock, like that. We have named them. And this is uh, the part of the thesis of Saurabh. Uh, we have discovered all these things. Similarly, uh, Muthisar Hill Formation endowed with a very significant horizon uh, in which you can observe the boring Etiagara trace fossil in sandstone. We have not still uh, preserved them. So, Skalithos, similar to Geo, uh, Jara Geopark, along with the Aran Colite, we have. Uh, not publish this, that's why I'm not uh, sharing the much detail. But I would like to share that this is this type of horizon is only at Mongolia, uh, where anacolite is a vertical burrows and the scolithos are the horizontal burrow. So due to the stress on the pre-Cambrian Cambrian boundary, the habitat and the behavior of the animal at that time have been under stress. And that's why it is, has a very international significance. So Motisar Hill Formation is known for the erosional structures and the uh, paleontological significance. Third one is the archaeological geoheritage. As I said, that uh, Jodhpur sandstone, locally known as the Chittar Kapathar, and ferruginous sandstone, locally known as the Gatu Kapathar. It is a ferruginous sandstone. It is a uh, quartz in nature. Are the best quality building and decorative stones extensively quarried in Balsman, Sursagar areas, along with many other areas nowadays. But on the MGR, there are two areas. Old quarrying history of Balsman dates back to the geocide. We can call them the hydrogeocide. Also give the additional values to our geocide because they are uh, situated near to our geocides, which have been selected. So significance of hydrogeocide as potential monument of national interest. Yesterday, I have uh, delivered a lecture in which I showed the sig various significance. So today, I just want to share one significance of our geo hydrogeocide. Uh, out of 3,678 monuments have been declared and are protected by archaeological survey in India. Only three step wells, Chan Bauri of Jaipur, Rani Jigi Bauri of Bundi, Nimrana Bauri of Alwar near Jaipur, has been declared in 2018 as the monument of national interest by ESI till date. But we know that after our study, we have uh, invented about 345 step wells from the Rajasthan. 
and 44 out of which have been qualified as a hydrogeocide. Uh, the uh, Sonic 2000 uh, hydrogeocide, all the water and water related water body is the hydrogeocide. So, implying there's metrology, we have uh, established our hydrogeocide. But I would like to say that similar to these uh, water bodies, Rani Sir Padam Sir. Hydrogeocyte, Rathmahil Chhandra, and Turjika Chhandra. They all displayed significant hydrogeological uh, characters along with they are the ancient water harvesting and conservation system of the old time. That's why we propose them to be declared as a national interest of archaeological survey. Similarly, to Jogi viewers, you have the geology of the geology. You have to say that the geology of the geology वैज्ञानिक विरासत है जिसको मैंने आपको विरासत बताया है शैक्षणिक मनोरंजन और पर्यटन स्थल के रूप में एक संभावित जियोपार्क साइट हो सकती है और जैसे कि मैंने बताया जियो हेरिटेज साइट है हेरिटेज वाटर बॉडीज है पैलेसेज है एजुकेशन सेंटर है नेचर टूरिज्म है एडवेंचर स्पोर्ट्स भी है यहाँ पे और नेशनल जियोलॉजिकल म्यूजियम मोन्यूमेंट है दो फॉसिल साइट्स है एंड वी आर ऑर्गेनाइजिंग इन अवर जियो इन राव there's a drop, but this is the cultural night. Uh, in from 2 October 2022, we are uh, also organizing a real festival, international uh, musical, folk musical festival at the Barangad Fort and in Raujata Desert Rock Park. So, it, this is the fusion of the folk music, local folk music with the European and American uh, artists. And it's a very popular program festival on the, this geopark site. So all these fulfill the criteria to become MGR land, landscape as a geopark site. So in conclusion, the present study is document of synthesis of current information, knowledge, and status of significant geosites, geodiversity, geoheritage. and geotourism aspects and associated historical and cultural selection targeting assessment of Indian geosite taking case from Jodhpur. Study initiates the possibility of new advancement and applications pertaining to concept of geotourism in India, Indian context, along with the benefits similar to at international living. Could you hear me, sir? Yes, yes, yes. Please conclude. Okay. Now again, some problem with the voice. Just a minute. Is the screen is visible, sir? No, no, screen. Is there any presentation? No. We are concluding. Dr. Tripathi? Yes, we just uh, uh, I'm concluding. Give me uh, a few minutes, please. Ma Mathur, sir, please conclude. Yes, okay. yes, yes, I just conclude. Okay. So, application of these aspects and tools will help in social economic development of the region with enormous benefit, that is, conservation of geosites. This is the most primary thing we need. In present scenario, promotion of tourism, also essential thing, and the uh, uh, associated geo businesses, employment generation, and so many things as happened in the at the international level. This is the bibliography I utilize. And yesterday I have uh, delivered a lecture on important step well of Rajasthan for the geotourism implication. This is on the YouTube. Please. So go through this also. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Professor Mathur, for a very nice presentation. I think uh, for most of the participants, these informations are uh, very new, and uh, we are working 
to establish geo park in india which is still not there so this presentation must have been uh, uh, enlightening for many of the participants if there is any questions please any questions from the participants please any question type and chat good afternoon everybody yes ma'am uh, i am dr mary joseph principal from st joseph college i have a uh, few doubts regarding this topic uh, i can mention about the geo tourism geo heritage and uh, uh, geo sites uh, sedimenting rock and many things and uh, this uh, archaeo studies archaeobotany or archaeozoology Uh, mm -hmm. It's an interdisciplinary subject, or anyone can take a project in this. Any funding agency specifically uh, available for this particular type of topics? Uh, you are very correct that these are uh, subjects of multi disciplines, and uh, okay. interdisciplinary studies are very much required. Archaeology, uh, botany, zoology, geology, and uh, when we are taking up for Uh, tourism purpose uh, it is of more of the popular interest so so far as the funding issues are there uh, mm -hmm. dst ministry of earth sciences or state governments may be approached for uh, you can submit any proposal if you have in mind and you can okay. involve other geologists and other uh, specialists in your project and you can um, uh, submit a proposal Uh, to ministry of our science ministry of mines also sometimes uh, provide money or uh, department of science and technology now a lot of state governments are also taking interest in conserving our uh, geo sites so okay, uh, you you can contact also tourism or uh, department of your uh, state they all okay, uh, they sir. are all uh, now active because there is lot of tourism scope new tourism scope we have already have lot of cultural tourism in our country but this is a new field where we can develop uh, uh, more knowledge uh, tourism uh, can bring uh, international uh, visitors to our area so it is very good okay. proposal when multidisciplinary okay, people come together and uh, take up this important okay, sir. Sir, any certificate course or diploma course you are running, sir? Based no, so, no, no, ma'am. So far, no. there is no such course. Uh, If we start, uh, we can recommend our all of our students to can join. Can I speak? Movement. Ah, yeah, 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 Mathur sir. Uh, madam, just I want to inform. Uh, uh, recently, uh, in 2020, we have introduced a, a, a subject here in. Uh, university jnv university geology okay sir uh, in which we have put a geo uh, subject uh, in one of the paper one and, unit uh, being uh, chairman of uh, rpsc rajasthan public service actually who has uh, Completed his PhD in the new He has completed the part of your sites all in the RS syllabus, Rajasthan Administrative Services syllabus, and now it is you can see in, on the online. So this is our effort to introduce this subject or the various concept of uh, geo heritage to for the students also, and this is the way by which we can spread the uh, popular or we can popular these subject on the India level. And many uh, of uh, artists, yes. Which university, sir? He have been approached, Dr. Sir Singh, uh, to. It is Jodhpur University, ma'am. Jodhpur University. Okay, mm -hmm. sir. Uh, sir, uh, it is open to all. And Dr. Tripathi. 
you can start doing the short courses at different centers uh, wherever the geo heritage is being projected i think you uh, many of your viewers may not be knowing that dr tripathi is doing a lot about promoting the geo heritage side i think uh, madam suggestion is very good yes you, you can initiate actually a short courses at different centers with the help of local universities right right yes sir yes sir yeah right so we can begin uh, ma'am please contact us uh, definitely you sir can, uh, you can get an email from professor misra uh, we okay, can interact sir. and uh, you may start a new beginning in this field yes sir yes sir and uh, because uh, many of these uh, conventional courses and all uh, now this no takers i think mm -hmm. these are the new area that attract uh, and this will right. be useful to the society also you right. have mentioned about the lithophytes we are uh, doing lot of uh, research on that lithophytes mainly yes, the yes, lichens yes. that uh, stick grow only on the walls and rock crevices so right. we are yes. familiar in that but the geology yes. we are very poor basic knowledge <laughs> so if we combine both definitely it will be useful for yes. everyone and this yes. application oriented uh, also sir society oriented and application oriented and current trends are uh, multidisciplinary we can yeah, yeah. Uh, get a lot of projects and uh, uh, more, some many more uh, the conferences like this specifically on that because this time he selected last time full different types of garden all titles are very useful sir he opened uh, connected uh, biology people and other people Uh, and this uh, area i'm very much interested in culture and heritage and geology we can combine with this uh, max physics chemistry biology zoology zoology and uh, environmental studies people we can do wonders i think sir yes yes we'll cooperate ma'am uh, please write Dr. to Dr. us Dr. and uh, take up yes please uh, please conclude uh, now yeah, yeah. Uh, any, any comment person. any comment by uh professor tiwari is co-chairing this session uh tiwari not available sir okay 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 so on behalf of the organizers i thank the learned uh, speaker uh, professor sc mathur for delivering a very nice uh, presentation and giving insight into the geo heritage of the jodhpur i thank uh, on my own behalf and on behalf of the organizers i thank uh, all participants Uh, for giving their valuable time and uh, thank to professor misra for organizing such a uh, interesting uh, session thank you very much thank you sir thank you thank you, thank you dr tripathi sir namaste sir. rajiv nigam ji sc mathur sir for uh, giving time and prepared the session and uh, uh, delivering a, a, a good talk uh, on uh, geo heritage site so thank thank you both sir uh, now next session chair for <coughs> next session speaker dr s y somsekar professor department of ancient history and archaeology kannada university hampi vijayanagar karnataka 
चेयरपर्सन डॉक्टर के एम सुरेश सर रिटायर्ड प्रोफेसर एंड डायरेक्टर म्यूजियम कन्नड़ा यूनिवर्सिटी हम्पी को चेयरपर्सन मैडम अनीता खोरदे इंडोलॉजिस्ट मुंबई वेलकम ऑल ऑफ यू सर एंड आई एम रिक्वेस्टिंग टू डॉक्टर के एम सुरेश सर प्लीज प्रेसाइड द सेशन एंड इंट्रोड्यूस अवर इमिनेंट स्पीकर डॉक्टर यश वाई सोम सर Dr. K. M. Suresh, sir. Yes, thank you. I am Dr. Suresh. Hello. Are you hearing? Yes, sir. I am Dr. Suresh from Hampi. I worked as a professor and director in the Kannada University Hampi. Dr. Song Sekar is one of my favorite student, research student also. He has uh, done his uh, MPhil and PhD uh, on Vijayanagar itself. He is talking on Hampi and Bajar uh, itself and temples of uh, Hampi also. Welcome to uh, Ms. Anita also and uh, Dr. Song Sekar. You can talk. हेलो सर अडेबल सर सर आर यू सीन स्लाइड सर यस ओके सेकंड सर ओके ओके सर Yes. Yes, sir. Yes. Okay, sir. Thanks, sir. I am uh, Dr. Swam Shekhar. Uh, good afternoon to everyone, sir. I welcome to national webinar series organized by Government MS Golwarkar College, Rewa. Respected chairman of this session and my guide, Dr. K. M. Suresh, sir. Eminent speakers, scholars, respected dignitaries. I thanks to Professor Skanda Mishra giving this opportunity. In this webinar series, my topic is Hampi Vijayanagar. Can I start, sir? Yes, you can. Okay. Sir. Hampi, a famous World Heritage Site in India. Hampi was a capital city, the great kingdom of Vijayanagar Empire of India in 14th to 16th century CE. Hampi also referred to as the group of monuments at Hampi. Sorry, Dr. Somashekhar, your voice is fading yeah. out. Can you do something about that, please? One second, ma'am. You speak loudly also. Okay, okay. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, also, click Can on I... that hide button oh. in the display. Yes, yes, sir. Uh, right, sir. So that you know that uh, message goes out. Audible, sir? Ah, yes. Okay, sir. Hampi also referred to as the group of monuments at Hampi uh, is a uh, UNESCO Heritage World Heritage Site in 1986 to 87. The sophistication of urban, royal, and sacred centers are evident. More than 1800 remains that include forts, royal, and sacred complexes, temples, shrines, pillared halls, mandabas, suburban townships like puras, bazaars, memorial structures, gateways, stables, water channels ponds, wells, tanks, etc. In architecturally, Dravidian architecture flourished under the Vijayanagar Empire. The Virupaksha, Vithala, Balakrishna, Ajararama is the most ornate structures represent the Vijayanagara temple architecture. The another feature of in front of uh, temples at Hampi Vijayanagar, the white chariot streets flanked by the rows of pillared mandapas. Those chariot streets are also served the purpose of bazaars or markets. There was a regular markets. In Vijayanagara city, there was seven markets, namely Virupaksha Bajar, Vitala Bajar, Pansupari Bajar, Balakrishna Bajar, Achuta Pete, Malevanta Bajar, and Vardarajamana Patana Bajar. Most of the structures at Hampi are constructed from local granite, burnt bricks, and lime mortar. Vijayanagara architecture is also known for its adoption to of elements of Indo-Islamic yes. architecture in secular yes. buildings like the Queen's Bath, 
elephant stables, lotus mahal, and interesting buildings. Dravidian architecture survives in the rest of southern India, spread through the patronage of the Vijayanagar rulers. The Raya Gopura introduced first in the temples attributed to Vijayanagara Rayas is a landmark in South India. UNESCO says three criterions of Hampi. The remarkable integration between the planned and defended city of Hampi with its temple architecture and spectacular natural settings represent a unique artistic creation. Second one is the city bears exceptional testimony to the vanished civilization of the kingdom of Vijayanagara. The third one, the capital offers an outstanding example of a type of structure which illustrates a significant historical situation, that of the destruction of the Vijayanagara kingdom at the Battle of Rakkasagi Tangadigi, 1565 C, which left behind an ensemble uh, of living temples, magnificent archaeological remains in the form of elaborate sacred, royal, civil, and military structures, as well as traces of its rich lifestyle, all, all integrated within its natural settings. The authenticity of the site has been maintained in terms of location and settings as the original settings comprises of river Tungabhadra and boulders is fully retained. In terms of form and function, the integration of the geographic settings with landmade features in the design and functional layout of the entire capital can still be uh, discerned and the form of the original city planning with suburban pattern is evident. The largely untouched archeological elements provide ample evidences of authentic materials and construction and interventions have mentioned maintained qualities when undertaken. Today, there is a continuity of several religious rituals, associations, traditional skills and occupations within the society that have been maintained. Protection and Management Hampi World Heritage Area Management Authority Havama, has been framed to look after the protection of and management of the 4187.24 uh, 4, hectares of the World Heritage Area. The ruins of the Hampi are spread in, the, spread in an area of 40 square kilometers. The constitution of a single heritage authority, Hampi World Heritage Area Management Authority, Havama, ensure the effectiveness of the management system and uh, coordinations of works from different agencies while allowing local self-government authorities to continue to exercise the powers as enlisted in the respective acts. The government of India, the archaeological Service of India, and the government of Karnataka also are uh, responsible for the protection and management of protected monuments and the rest of the area covered by 41, 40 square kilometers. Hampi. Hampi is a famous for ancient and historical evidences. It is situated right bank of Tungabhadra River in Osapete Taluk, Vijayanagara district of central Karnataka. Hampi was prehistoric site also. It has many Neolithic and Megalithic sites. Example, Masalaya Hill, Wali Pandar, Anegundi, Irabanakal, Vikrampura, etc. Ashmoks, paintings, potteries, and megalithic tombs are also found in this region. Hampi has many names like Pampa, Pampa Tirtha, Hampa Tirtha, Pampa Kshetra, Pampa Pura, Virupaksha Tirtha, Virupaksha Osapatana, Hampe. In 7th to 13th centuries, in Vijayanagara period, it names Bhaskara Kshetra, Vijayanagara, Vijayanagara. Hampi is called by the names Pampa in 7th century. Pampa was the ancient name of the river Tungabhadra. Pampa meant equal portion. Divide, separate, divisions. Geographically, Tungabhadra River divides and unite often near Hampi. Pampa, Pampaka, Pampapayal, Hanchu are used in Telugu, Tamil, and Kannada. Hampi has a legendary history. Epic of Ramayana occurred at a place called Kishkinda, was close to Hampi. Hampi Vijayanagara as capital city of South India's largest and powerful kingdom, hence its name Vijayanagara. It means city of victory. Ampi is not only famous for its historical and magnificent 
ruins it has remarkable landscapes religious associations and outstanding distinction of international significance this is the hampi and its environs tungabhadra river is there this is the map of hampi the monuments are there in that map this slide the area of geography of hampi and it environs the hills are there borders are there the neolithic site on, on the top of the hill masalayana gudda near vitala temple opposite of the vitala temple this is the ancient uh, site of hampi in near to hampi uh, the megalithic site megalithic burials are there in irabenakallu very famous uh, megalithic site in south india hampi an historical perspective hampi has its own history in shatavanas a brahmi inscriptions have been found at hampi it says tarasa putasa danam and buddhist sculptures have also been found around it these are mirrors of the religion and antiquity existed 1 and 2 ad in hampi in badami chalukya period vinayaditya copper plate mentions pampa the ancient name of tungabhadra uh, in 7th century ad uh, in Kale, kalyana chalukyas uh, i Uh, by the 10th to 12th century ampi it had become a center of religious and educational activities during the rule of kalyana chalukyas apart from several inscriptions temples and the antiquities are there in ampi in vaisala period an inscription of vaisala someshwara the first has been found at ampi and it mentions many grants for the worship of virupaksha and ampi became the second royal residence of vaisala period This is the pre-Vijayanagara temples near uh, Virupaksha Hampi, the Durga temple, and others also uh, in pre-Vijayanagara styles. This is the Pompambika uh, temple, Ampa Devi, and other names also there. Kalyana Chalukya architecture is there. Uh, it is uh, uh, the Pompambika. In Vaisala architecture is also there in Hampi. Uh, that is uh, in a uh, uh, bhuvaneshwari uh, temple bhuvaneshwari is the uh, goddess of karnataka in many pre vijayanagara structures are there in hampi in uh, hemakota uh, area uh, this is the pamsana or kadamba nagara style temples of vijayanagara pre vijayanagara uh, hampi in vijayanagara empire 1336 to 1565 see the vijayanagara empire built its capital around hampi calling it vijayanagara or city of victory vijayanagara empire was founded about 1336 c immediately on the disappearance of the vaisalas arihara first the founder of the vijayanagara empire he belongs to sangama dynasty which was first to rule vijayanagara among the four dynasties the other three dynasties are saluva tuluva and haravidu bukkaraya devaraya the second Krishna Devaraya, Achyutraya, and Ramaraya were the famous kings of these dynasties. There are detailed descriptions in the inscriptions about the encouragement given by these things, these kings, to political, social, socio-economic, and cultural activities. This is the aerial aerial view of Ampi, uh, right bank of the Tungabhadra River, Tungabhadra. Uh, uh, you see in the uh, Virupaksha Temple and Hemakota uh, monuments also. Uh, Uh, many hills are there on matanga hill and hemakota ratnakota and rushyamuka also there in uh, this uh, uh, slides this is the close view closer view of uh, virupaksha temple uh, ponds are there and uh, three gopuras are there and uh, uh, in this side uh, hemakota uh, in uh, pre vijayanagara style temples are there this is the uh, main temple in hampi Uh, virupaksha temple this is rangamantappa of virupaksha temple built by krishna devaraya in uh, dravidian styles in paintings are also in the in this temple uh, virupaksha temple uh, many uh, paintings are there in the ceiling uh, of virupaksha this is also one of the main inscriptions of krishna devaraya uh, in uh, virupaksha temple 
Virupaksha temple has three gopuras. The inner eastern small entrance and uh, the Ranga Mantapa were built by Krishna Devaraya 15 Kenny. The big gopura were built by Devaraya second reign. This is the uh, broad uh, area of uh, this temple. This is the left uh, statue uh, idol is the original, not original. Uh, right is the uh, original. Panchamukha, Panchamukha Linga is the uh, main, the old and ancient sculpture of this uh, temple. But uh, in uh, today, uh, left uh, uh, idols is there. This is uh, one of the uh, crown of Virupaksha. Virupaksha temple is the main center of pilgrimage at Hampi and has been considered the most sacred place over the centuries. The temple is dedicated to Lord Shiva, known here as Rupaksha, as the concert of the local goddess Pampa, who is associated with the Tungabhadra river. This is the sword and bore, the emblem of the Vijayanagara dynasty. And many sculptures are there in that uh, uh, pillars in like uh, uh, temples. Uh, King and commander sculptures on a, on a, on a, one of the pillar is there. The discourse and uh, danda, uh, danda mayaka in, uh, is in uh, and uh, danda and uh, oceans of uh, uh, king is there. In Virupaksha Bajar, this is the major uh, temple of Virupaksha. Uh, in front of this uh, temple, Virupaksha Bajar is there. Virupa Vijayanagara Empire's capital, Hampi, was South Indian city and commercial center. The king kings of Vijayanagara encouraged to economic activities very well. The seven car streets in front of important temples of Hampi were main commercial and market centers. Rupaksha Bajar, Balakrishna Bajar, Vitala Bajar, Pansukari Bajar, Achyuta Pete, Malavanta Bajar, and last one, Vardaraja Manapattana. These Bajars had the hold on the economic, social, and cultural activities of Vijayanagara. One is Rupaksha Bajar. Virupaksha temple is the only temple that continued to be a gathering place after the destruction of Ampi 1565 C. In front of this temple, Virupaksha Bajar has been called by the name Virupakshapura, Pampa, Ratavidi, Teruvidi, Ampi Bazars, etc. This Bajar is as old as Virupaksha temple, but initially this has been used as only car street uh, in Kannada, Teruvidi. Expanded the street by removing all stones, thorny bushes. It is known from the, the from this that uh, during the festivals, many chariot fairs were celebrated. Here, people were using uh, three chariots with Ganesha, with Ganesha, Pompombika, and uh, Virupaksha during the festival. A merchant, a merchant of Venice, Niccolo di Conti, gives a clue that in Vijayanagara, uh, the name of Vijayanagara, to during the festivals, one, once in a year, people keep the idols of gods between the two chariots and carry them. Even Payas also pointed out the same. Even today, this chariot fair is conducted in Ampi. The day is known in the region as Ampi Hunime, Ampi Unmunte. Kunti has, Nikola Kunti has quoted that during holy festival, people were keeping holy on both sides of street and sprinkling on each other, including the kings and queens also. All these points clearly indicate that Virupaksha Bajar was constructed for religious and commercial activities in Vijayanagara period. This is the Balakrishna temple built by Krishna Devaraya in 1513 AD. Balakrishna temple was one of the important temple of Ampi. It has the historical importance. In 1513 AD, uh, King Krishna Devaraya invaded Orissa and defeated Gajapati. In the remembrance of the victory, he brought Balakrishna idol from Udayagiri and he built a huge temple of Balakrishna in Ampi to install the idol. This is the idol of Krishna. Uh, this is, today uh, is in Egmore Museum, Chennai. Uh, the Mahagopura of Balakrishna temple. And this is the uh, battle scene of Udayagiri campaign in Gopura, uh, Balakrishna temple. This is the Balakrishna temple with Bajar Street, Ampi. Uh, Krishna Bajar. The Krishna Bajar was 
constructed of according to an inscription krishna bazar was called as krishna pura pete krishna pura the davas langadi pete grains bazar krishna krishna bazar and the surrounding places were called as krishna pura since in an inscription it is mentioned that the word pete malige this is no doubt that krishna bazar was a market Achyutraya period inscription mentioned that Krishnapura market was full of provisional stores. The profit of these provisional stores was given to the Krishna temple. Krishna Bajar was one of the important market and so the profit from this Bajar was huge during Vijayanagara Empire. Domingo Payas visited Krishnapura and he has mentioned that the profit from Krishna Bajar was 100 gold coins and the profit was given to the Krishna temple, even Achutraya was giving the profit to the Krishna temple. According to the inscription of the Sadashwaraya 1545, it is mentioned that tax was being collected. They collected one kasu, a kind, for one bullock cart and one kasu per stall on the Monday's fair. The tax was being collected on Monday's indicates that the weekly fair was taking place on Monday. Therefore, the taxes were collected on Monday. Similarly, in Achyuta Bajar, a tax was being collected on Tuesday. Domingo Pes tells the fair was conducted on all days of the week, but at different places. Krishna Bajar, one of the important Bajar of Vijayanagara Empire, this was built by Krishna Devaraya and other emperors took care of the, care of the Bajar. It was center for cultural, religious, and economic activity Krishnapura was the important marketplace for selling food grains and cereal salt. This is the Lakshmi Narasimha. Lakshmi Narasimha 6.7 meter monolithic sculpture on the massive boulder by Arya Krishnabhata during the reign of Krishna Devaraya uh, in 1529. The right sculpture is a demo, old sculpture. This is the photograph of 1856 John. Alexander Greenlaw photographs. In Saswe Kala Ganesha is also monolithic sculpture by Chandragiri Marchand during the reign of Narasimha 1506 AD. This is the Kodantrama temple dedicated to Rama, Sita, Lakshmana and Hanuman Chakravarti. Many Rama temples are there in Hampi. This is one of the major temple and the living temple in Hampi uh, in uh, surrounding of Chakratirtha. Uh, the Tungabhadra river. This is the uh, sculptures Rama, Lakshmana and Sita in a huge boulder of Kodanda Rama. Kodanda Rama is the name of this temple. In, uh, the, uh, in flood time, uh, the temple also was seen this. In middle of the uh, river, Koti Tirtha, a sculpture, Koti Tirtha is there in Chakrat Tirtha. This is also one of the uh, major uh, sculptures boulder uh, in Hampi in Chakratirtha area. This is uh, 24 forms of Vishnu sculptures with the, with the names on the massive boulder in Chakratirtha at Hampi. This is the uh, Thiruvendranatha temple complex. Uh, today uh, we say Achutraya temple. Uh, this is the uh, very uh, good temple, uh, broad temple in uh, Bajar include Bajar also. Tiruvengana Temple and Hachuta Bajar. Tiruvengana Temple commonly known as Achutaraya Temple. The street from the temple towards Tungabhadra is known as Achuta Bajar. In the inscription, it has different names like Achuta Pete, Tiruvengana Therubidi. This was constructed during Achutaraya's design and so only called as Achuta Pete. In the inscription, Ampeya Katya Thirumalesha, Nalku Bhagila Trimulesha are mentioned. According to the inscription 1545, Achyutra Bajar or Achyutra Pete was a market, so weekly once fair was taking place. Here many things from different parts of the country were sold and the fair was taking place on Tuesday. This is further confirmed by the sentence on Tuesdays, one kasu per stall was collected as tax. Like other markets of MP, he also all types of the things were available. Culturally, this Bajar has greater importance. Similar to other temples, even here festivals, charred festivals, and other fairs 
were taking place. According to the inscription, the street is called as Tirvengalanatha Ter Vidi. Tirvengalanatha Kar Street. This shows that chariot fair was taking place in this street. This is the other uh, slide of Tirvengalanatha Temple complex of Ampi in the uh, uh, top of uh, the Matanga Hill. Uh, the, this is the major temple of Vitala Temple in Hampi. Uh, ground plan of Vitala Temple. Uh, this view, uh, this view of Vitala Temple's pillar hall. This temple is considered the finest in Vijayanagara. The colonnades, uh, when lightly tapped by the wooden stick, produce a musical tones also. Vitala is the most artistic and glorious unique temple at Hampi. Not only art, architecture, sculpture, but also music, dance, and other aspects also. Uh, the stone chariot, a world famous structure that has attracted the attention of the world. It is known as the icon of Vijayanagar. Uh, and so the elaborate temple with delicate carvings, as well as the temple with the different and distinctive styles of pillars, such as Samyukta or Sangeeta pillars. A huge boulder is converted into a pillar and there are, there are dozen of small pillars hollow part in the middle. Uh, these small pillars are the part of the whole pillar. Uh, these smaller small pillars are in shape, circular, quadrant, pentagonal, octagonal and are also different in height. As a result, each pillar emits a different sound. This is the uh, closer view of that uh, Mantapa. Uh, the stone chariot of Vitala temple. This is the uh, world famous uh, stone chariot. This is the icon of Vijayanagara also. The stone chariot is a Garuda shrine which faces west towards the Vishnu temple. Uh, Garuda is a mount of Vishnu and uh, an usual the mount faces the god. The building, the building north of the shrine is a pillared hall used for religious ceremonies southwest of the Garuda shrine. The stone chariot in the 1856 photograph of Alexander Greenla, the shrine had a pyramidical big tower, brick tower, which was uh, today, which was removed. Uh, many Jaina Temples are there in Hampi. Uh, one of the major temples is uh, Ganagiti Janalaya in uh, 1336 AD. Irugappa Dandanayaka uh, uh, built by this uh, temple. This is also one of the uh, major uh, Jaina temple. Uh, Pashunata Janalaya constructed by uh, Devaraya II Pansupari in you know, Pansupari Bajar at Hampi. This is the Ajar Rama temple. Uh, this temple referred to as the Ramachandra temple in inscriptions. Uh, it, it has a ceremonial temple for the royal family. The outer wall of this uh, temple uh, portray the spring holy festival procession, uh, dancers and musicians, marching soldiers, horses and elephants also. This is the another uh, slide of Ajarama temple, Prakara wall. In this in this wall, showing the uh, horse by Persian merchant. This is the elephant stable Hampi. Elephant stables, which consist of eleven square chambers just outside the Janana enclosure. This is the Pansupari Bajar in front of the uh, Hajarama uh, Temple Hampi. The northeast of the Hajarama Temple, there is a artistic main door. Uh, which leads to a street known as Pan Supari Bajar. This has been constructed in a large area. This Bajar has a distinct value because it was a, in the palace premises. Ampi's main residential area surrounded the Pan Supari Bajar. It was one of the important marketplace among the Ampi Bajars. The Pan Supari Bajar present in Ampi is mentioned is in an inscription of 1426 uh, Hedi, present in Pashanata Jaina, Jaina temple. It gives the meaning that Kramuka Parnapana or Parnapugi Palapana. According to this inscription, Kramuka Parnapana means Kramuka Supari. Uh, Parna is uh, 
बीटल लिव्स आपणा मीन्स शॉप और पर्णा पूगी पलापणा मीन्स पर्णा इज बीटल बीटल लिव्स पूगी इज आर्क रेकनेट इन दि फस्ट पार्ट ऑफ द वॉल्यूम ऑफ साउथ इंडियन इंस्क्रिप्शन एटीन नाइंटी हेडी ट्रांसलेटेड वर्षन ऑफ द इंस्क्रिप्शन इज प्रिंटेड एंड द वर्ल्ड पान सुपर बजार इज टूडे वी यूज As the time passed, the name Kramka Purana Purana was not used much. Coming to Sadashiva's reign, that mentions Timma Raja constructed 25 columns mantapa for the god Madhava at Vidya Vidya Rennes Pedang Vidya Nagaras Pedangadi Vidhi Pedangadi Vidhi. is a big shop or street according to ganagiti jaina jain temples inscription of 1556 57 ad uh, another inscription mentions rajabidi here rajabidi is recognized as pan supari bazar domingo press explains the about the uh, front portions of palace as when we enter the court the main door is present after entering the main door the, there are streets and beautiful houses of captains rich people and business persons at the end of the street end of main street uh, the front door of palace is present here he mentions about the rajabidi the kramuka parnapana street mentions in a 14 ad is also called as rajabidi in the inscription 1445 ad as the mp developed in leaps and bounds after 1500 ad the uh, trade also developed a lot Uh, therefore the pedangadi vidhi grew into big shop street since this street was in front of the palace the king was passing through this street so there is a uh, real meaning in calling this street as rajabidi pansupari bazar is distinct from other bazars in virupaksha bazar temples and mat and of uh, shaiva region was present here in addition to shaivas and vaishnavas jains muslims and other religion people were also present the muslim mosque and octagonal well, well and tomb was first built in 1439 by ahmad khan fatige ahmad khan a muslim commander in the army of king krishna devaraya the second these monuments are the part of the urban core pansupari bazar was famous commercial center the technique used by the workers and businessmen to sell their products has been mentioned in contemporary literatures mohana tarangini uh, sanat kumar acharya and in many other foreign chronicles also in pansupari bazar in addition to pansupari they were selling flowers fruits vegetables gold silver copper iron and other metals uh, diamonds and other precious stones horse elephant chicken sheep etc here in addition to local goods foreign goods were also available vijayanagara had trade links with arab persia ormas sri lanka pegu burma and china etc domingo pes explain explains about the trading in the in front of palace as the broad and beautiful street is having rich people's houses here tradesmen are residing diamonds precious stones pearls etc and the different clothes are available in the street all in this say entire street contain all the materials present on the own earth evening uh, there will be a market uh, when oranges grapes pomegranates lemons etc fruits are also the horses of the sort pes domingo pes states that every friday there will be fair in the fair people sell pig chicken dry fish which were brought from sea and many other goods similarly there will be fair on every day at different parts of the city in once upon a major fair was conducted on every friday the street was the central place of capital city and was near to palace so in addition to uh, friday's fair daily evening fairs was con- conducted Pansupari Bazar had most importance than any other bazaars since it was represent in the important place of the capital. This is the Lotus Temple. Lotus Temple uh, in Hampi, the most finest structure in Janana, 
Jama enclosure is Lotus Mahal, which is the best example of indoor sarsenic architecture at Hampi. It is a two-storied two pavilion in the Royal Center. It is staircase to the upper story has been built. The Lotus Mahal combines a symmetrically square Hindu mandala uh, design with lobes, arches, walls, and domes of the Indo-Islamic style. Its basement and pyramidical towers are based on temple architecture. This was the summer palace and also known as uh, the locals Chitrangini Mahal. This is the aerial view of the palace area. The Harihara, Veera Hariharaya uh, palace is there in that in this area and Krishna Devarai's uh, palace is there. Ajarama temples also seen that uh, this uh, slide. This is the closer view of palace area. This uh, end of the uh, this is the uh, Veera Hariraya Palace. This is also in another uh, royal enclosure area, uh, palaces area also there. This is the Veera Hariharaya Palace, Hampi. Uh, only we see in that basement. In Vijayanagara, toilets and bathrooms are there. Uh, many toilets are there in the uh, Hampi. Uh, this is the one of the uh, toilet and bathroom of royal enclosure of Vijayanagar. The another one is also there uh, in the Vira Harihararaya Palace. This is the toilet of Vira Harihararaya. You know, Vijayanagar dynasty water supply system is very uh, nice to that. Uh, this is the uh, stone uh, canals are there. Water supply system with ceramic pipes. The stepped pond uh, called Pushkarani in Canada. The pond were used for royal ceremonies. This is a very good uh, pond. This is uh, water turf of horses uh, and uh, elephants. This is the general bath of Hampi, a large uh, bath of Hampi. This is the Queen's Bath. The square water pavilion, also called the Queen's Bath, it has a pavilion, a water basin, and a method of moving fresh water uh, to it and taking away wash water and overflows. The building's interior arches with beautiful decoration shows influence of the indo sarsamic style. This is the Queen's Bath. Uh, Turta Canal. Uh, named in India in Kanda, Iriya Kalove. This is from the Turta Anekat across the Tungabhadra River, about three kilometers west of Ampi. Today we use that uh, water. This is the Kampabopa stone bridge across the Tungabhadra River. One of the rare uh, hero stone is there in uh, Hanegundi, hero stone of ferrymen. And this is the Kamalapura tank. This is the main water source of Vijayanagara city. Uh, in military scenes of uh, Vijay uh, Mahanami platform, uh, the platform is made of granite. It has reliefs, possibly a catalog of royal activities and lines of marching animals, including elephants, horses, and camels. The great platform is an audience hall, which also probably had a a uh, wooden pavilion uh, evidenced by stone steps. Uh, the, this one, these sculptures uh, are Arabian ambassadors visit to the king of Vijayanagar. Many sculptures are there in the uh, walls. This is the one of the living temple of uh, Hampi, Malayavanta Raghunatha temple. Uh, this is a uh, living temple next to Virupaksha temple of Ampi. The deities of Malayavanta Raghunatha temple in Garbhagraha. In another uh, largest temple is in uh, Kamalapur Pattabhirama temple. And uh, in front of the Pattabhirama temple, the Loka Pavana pond is there. Very uh, largest pond in uh, Ampi. Many gates are there uh, in the uh, 
ಇಂಟು ದ ಫೋರ್ಟ್ಸ್ ಫ್ಲವರ್ ಗೇಟ್ ಹೂವಿನ ಬಾಗಿ ಇನ್ ಕಾರ್ಡು ಹೂವಿನ ಬಾಗಿಲು ಹಾಟ್ ಹಂಪಿ ಹರೇಶಂಕರ ಗೇಟ್ ಇನ್ನ ಅನಂತಸೇನ ಗುಡಿ ಅನಂತಸೇನ ಟೆಂಪಲ್ ಬಿಲ್ಟ್ ಬೈ ಕೃಷ್ಣದೇವರಾಯ ಇನ್ ಅನಂತಸೇನ ಗುಡಿ ಇನ್ ಕನ್ಫ್ಯೂಷನ್ ವಿಜಯನಗರ ಎಂಪೈರ್ ವಾಸ್ ರೂಲ್ಡ್ ಬೈ ಫೋರ್ ಡೈನಾಸ್ಟಿಸ್ ಫ್ರಮ್ ತರ್ಟೀನ್ ತರ್ಟಿ ಸಿಕ್ಸ್ ಟು ಫಿಫ್ಟೀನ್ ಸಿಕ್ಸ್ಟಿ ಫೈವ್ ವಿತ್ ದ ಸಿಟಿ ಆಫ್ ವಿಜಯನಗರ ಆಸ್ ಇಟ್ಸ್ ಕ್ಯಾಪಿಟಲ್ ವಿಜಯನಗರ ರೂರಲ್ಸ್ ಸಕ್ಸೀಡೆಡ್ ಇನ್ ಆಲ್ ಫೀಲ್ಡ್ಸ್ ಲೈಕ್ ಕನ್ಸ್ಟ್ರಕ್ಷನ್ ಆಫ್ ಮ್ಯಾಸಿವ್ ಟೆಂಪಲ್ಸ್ ಕಾಂಪ್ಲೆಕ್ಸಸ್ ಸೆಕ್ಯುಲರ್ ಬಿಲ್ಡಿಂಗ್ಸ್ ಅರ್ಬನ್ ಸೆಂಟರ್ಸ್ ಮಾರ್ಕೆಟ್ ಸ್ಟ್ರೀಟ್ ಲೈಕ್ ಬಜಾರ್ಸ್ ಡ್ಯಾಮ್ಸ್ ಟ್ಯಾಂಕ್ಸ್ ಅಂಡ್ ಡೆವಲಪ್ಮೆಂಟ್ ಆಫ್ ಟ್ರೇಡ್ ಅಂಡ್ ಕಾಮರ್ಸ್ ಆಲ್ಸೋ ವಿಜಯನಗರ ಸಿಟಿ ಕನ್ಸರ್ನ್ಡ್ ಜಿಯೋಗ್ರಫಿಕಲಿ ಅಡ್ಮಿನಿಸ್ಟ್ರೇಟಿವ್ ಮಿನಿಟ್ ಮಿಲಿಟರಿ ಎಕನಾಮಿಕ್ ಎಜುಕೇಶನಲ್ ಎಮ ಎಕನಾಮಿಕ್ ಅಂಡ್ ಕಮರ್ಷಿಯಲ್ ಫ್ಯಾಕ್ಟರ್ಸ್ ಕಾಂಟ್ರಿಬ್ಯೂಟ್ ಫಾರ್ ದ ಡೆವಲಪ್ಮೆಂಟ್ ಆಫ್ ದ ಪ್ಲೇಸ್ ಇನ್ ಟು ಎ ಮೆಟ್ರೋಪಾಲಿಸ್ ಟೆಂಪಲ್ಸ್ ವರ್ ದ ಸೆಂಟರ್ ಆಫ್ ಸಿವಿಕ್ ಆಕ್ಟಿವಿಟೀಸ್ ದಿ ವಿಜಯನಗರ ಸಿಟಿ ಗಿವ್ಸ್ ಎ ವಿವಿತ್ ಅಕೌಂಟ್ ಆಫ್ ದ ಎಕನಾಮಿಕ್ ಸೋಷಿಯಲ್ ರಿಲಿಜಿಯಸ್ ಅಂಡ್ ಕಲ್ಚರ್ ಲೈಫ್ ಆಫ್ ದ ಪೀಪಲ್ ಲಿವಿಂಗ್ ಇನ್ ದ ಮ್ಯಾಗ್ನಿಫಿಸೆಂಟ್ ಸಿಟಿ ವಿಜಯನಗರ ಸಿಟಿ ವಾಸ್ ದ ಇಂಪಾರ್ಟೆಂಟ್ ಬಿಸ್ನೆಸ್ ಸೆಂಟರ್ ಅಂಡ್ ಇಟ್ ಕಾಂಟ್ರಿಬ್ಯೂಟೆಡ್ ಸಿಗ್ನಿಫಿಕೆಂಟ್ಲಿ ಟು ದ ಗ್ರೋತ್ ಆಫ್ ಎಕಾನಮಿ ಆಫ್ ದ ಎಂಪೈರ್ ದಿ ಆಪೋನೆಂಟ್ಸ್ ಕಿಂಗ್ಸ್ ಥಾಟ್ ದಟ್ ಇಫ್ ದೇ ಕುಡ್ ಕ್ಯಾಪ್ಚರ್ ದಿ ಸೆಂಟರ್ ಇಟ್ ವಿಲ್ ಬಿ ಈಕ್ವಲ್ ಟು ಕ್ಯಾಪ್ಚರಿಂಗ್ ಆಫ್ ದ ಎಂಟೈರ್ ವಿಜಯನಗರ ಎಂಪೈರ್ ಇನ್ ಫಿಫ್ಟೀನ್ ಸಿಕ್ಸ್ಟಿ ಫೈವ್ ಸಿ ಡೂರಿಂಗ್ ರಕ್ಕಸಗಿ ತಂಗಡಿಗೆ ವಾರ್ ದಿ ವಿಜಯನಗರ ಎಂಪೈರ್ ವಾಸ್ ಕ್ಯಾಪ್ಚರ್ಡ್ ಬೈ ದ ಸುಲ್ತಾನ್ಸ್ ಆಫ್ ಶಾಹಿಸ್ ಓಕೆ ಥ್ಯಾಂಕ್ ಯು ಸರ್ ಹಲೋ ಹಲೋ ಸರ್ ಆಡಿಬಲ್ ಸರ್ ಹಲೋ ಎಸ್ ವಿ ಕೆನ್ ಇಯರ್ ಯು ಡಾಕ್ಟರ್ ಥ್ಯಾಂಕ್ ಯು ಫಾರ್ ದಿಸ್ ಆಪರ್ಚುನಿಟಿ ಸರ್ ಯಾ ಆಸ್ ಅ ಕೋ ಚೇರ್ ಐ ವುಡ್ ಲೈಕ್ ಟು ಥ್ಯಾಂಕ್ ಯು ಡಾಕ್ಟರ್ ಸೋಮಶೇಖರ್ ಫಾರ್ ಸಚ್ ಅ ವಂಡರ್ಫುಲ್ ಸೆಷನ್ ಥ್ಯಾಂಕ್ ಯು ಹಂಪಿ ಇಸ್ ಯುನೆಸ್ಕೊ ವರ್ಲ್ಡ್ ಹೆರಿಟೇಜ್ ಸೈಟ್ ಇಸ್ ವೆರಿ ವೆಲ್ ನೋನ್ ಅಂಡ್ through your talks i have not been able to visit the site so far but your talk has motivated me to come and visit the site as soon as possible and meet you and learn more about it you have Thank covered you. everything you talked about the prehistoric site that it's a neolithic site it's a megalithic site with a uh, big burial uh, very close to uh, hampi you talk about ramayana kishkinda event happening very close to uh, hampi so this particular site is a very antique site it's a very ancient site and it is the land of one of the largest and powerful kingdoms of krishna dev raya you took us through all the uh, temples of hampi uh, right from the virupaksha temple its bazaar balakrishna temple and the interesting uh, fact that the balakrishna idol was brought from udaygiri odisha that's an interesting yeah. thing you talk about krishna temple the bazaars and the fairs and uh, you know just like the toll tax that we are paying right now they used to take one uh, kasu coin to let the bullock cart pass and also to you know get a stall for themselves very interesting then you uh, showed us the slide about lakshmi nara and monolithic uh, sculpture which is so very beautiful you talked about the chakratit with 24 vishnu avatars uh, depicted on the boulder you spoke about the famous vithana temple which everybody knows about the glorious musical pillars you spoke about hazara ramachandra temple and the pan supari bazaar which showed that at uh, that particular point of time ancient uh, india and the uh, vijayanagara empire was trading with arabs persia and sri lanka and not only shivite and vaishnavites but we also find the presence of jains and muslims in that particular time you spoke about lotus mahal which is a beautiful example of indo sarsanic architecture you spoke about the water and the sanitation system that existed in the uh, vijayanagara empire all in all you covered right from the art architecture economy social religion and cultural life of people in that magnificent city thank you so my doctor for enlightening us about this very beautiful and very important site 
and uh, definitely for me it was quite an inspiration and intrigue i would love to visit thank it as soon as possible and meet you in person thank you so much thank you, thank you dr suresh can you please conclude so you are mute so you are mute sir you are mute dr suresh sir ट्वेंटी Uh, MP students yes, also. He is a very good scholar on Hampi and surrounding area. Thank you very much. Sir, he has also written, edi- uh, written, co-authored, and edited more than fifteen books. He has written large number of research articles, which are published in various yes. Uh, yes, publications. Yes, published more than one hundred fifty articles. Yes, and yes. And he has published also. And I have published on nearly twenty-five books on Vijayanagar itself. Oh my God, that's an achievement, sir. Because I am from that area, Hastat area. Yes, sir. So I did uh, more works on Vijayanagar only. Thank that you very much for having me. So it was wonderful to have you both, and I like to uh, thank uh, the organizer. uh the national for this web, uh, national webinar ms gurwalkar mm. college reva mp and uh, my special thanks go to uh, professor kan mishra ji it is because of his tireless efforts yes. that this particular seminar since yesterday is going on so smoothly thank you so much mishra ji gratitude to you and thank you for welcoming thank you everyone thank you so thank much thank you madam uh, thank you uh, स्पीकर Dr. Y. S. Rawat, former director of Gujarat State Archaeology and Museum, Gandhi Nagar, Gujarat. Welcome, sir. Our uh, chairperson of this session is uh, Dr. Lalit Pandey, former director, professor, Sahit Sansthan Vidya Peet, Deemed University, Udaipur. Welcome, uh, Dr. Lalit Pandey, sir. Please proceed. Thank you, sir. introduce our eminent speaker uh, dr rawast thank you misra ji uh, i think uh, dr rawast he uh, does not need any uh, introduction to all the scholars who are working for the culture history and archaeology of india but uh, uh, besides of this this is a formality then i will ta- i will speak something some words about him he uh, worked for uh, state government uh, of gujarat uh, department of archaeology and museum and uh, then uh, he was a very active uh, person who um, uh, national uh, the monument authority ke andar he inhone ye uh, he, he directed the thing or presently he is a, uh, a trustee uh, of the um, amdavad um, uh, world heritage राजस्थान बिहार एंड अदर स्टेट एंड प्रेजेंटली एंड मेजर कंट्रीब्यूशन ऑफ हिज इज दिन ऑफ दट नगर इन वेयर ही हैज Uh, unearthed the history of the uh, Badnagar, uh, uninterrupted history of the Badnagar since the times of the sixth century BC. Now uh, I welcome uh, Dr. Rawat sir, 
Lisa. आप म्यूट हैं रावत साहब म्यूट हैं सॉरी नमस्कार थैंक यू डॉक्टर पांडे फॉर इंट्रोड्यूसिंग मी एंड आई वुड लाइक टू थैंक द ऑर्गेनाइजर पर्टिकुलर डॉक्टर स्कंद कुमार मिश्रा फॉर इज अनटायरिंग जील टू bring so many people here so many scholars so many researcher and I, he gave me this opportunity also i once again thank you i welcome my dear person sri dr lohit pande and without going in detail of the introduction i will start my presentation some problem oh there is some screen sharing mein kuch ha ah. hello is the presentation available hello hello problem oh there is a problem in screen sharing i think hello hello yes yes sir. yes sir ha raha ji problem this problem ho raha kuch isme sharing karne mein i don't know uh, uh, dr uh, s y somshekar ha uh, unka screen chalu hai kya uh, nahi nahi unka screen nahi chalu hai kuch wo tips denge aapko डॉक्टर hmm. शिवांगी हेलो यस प्लीज थोड़ा सा रावत जी को बताएं शेयर करने का शेयर तो जा रहा है मेरा स्क्रीन आ रहा है पर वो नहीं आ रहा है प्रेजेंटेशन इट इज प्रॉब्लम नेटवर्क नेटवर्क नहीं नहीं है है सर सर कुछ आपकी साइड की प्रॉब्लम प्रॉब्लम थोड़ा शेयरिंग का बताइए तो चल रहा है। आप बताइए बताइए प्रोसेस सर ये सर ये जो फोर्थ वाला आइकन है इसमें शेयर करने का आ रहा है ना आ, ये है ना ये जो एरो है प्रेजेंट नाउ पे करके फिर आपकी स्क्रीन दिखेगी उसमें आप ये शेयर हो रहा है ये देखिए शेयर ओपन कर लीजिए स्टेप बाय शिवांगी स्टेप बाय स्टेप बताएं हां देखिए आ रहा है ये आ रहा है पर ये पूरा हां सर ये सब आपका ही स्क्रीन आ रहा सब इट इज रिपीटिंग ऑल स्क्रीन आपका स्क्रीन नाउ यू ओपन योर प्रेजेंटेशन ये वाली विंडो क्लोज करके आप प्रेजेंटेशन वाला ओपन कर दीजिए डेस्कटॉप 
डेस्कटॉप पे ओपन नहीं है ये सर पीपीटी ओपन किया आपने पावर पॉइंट अपना प्रेजेंटेशन बनाया प्रेजेंटेशन है एक विंडो भी नहीं हो रहा है मतलब विंडो कर रहा हूं तो ये आ तो हां ये आया ओके नाउ इट इज ओके या तो आप सेंड कर दीजिए तो हम लोग में से कोई शेयर कर लेगा तो इट हैज ओके सर ओके ठीक है ओके सर थैंक यू यस सर इट इज वेरी गुड once again namaskar i am actually talking about barnagar which is one of the most ancient towns of gujarat in north gujarat recently we have excavated the site and the the exploration excavation and research on barnagar is actually going since last century and uh, the dr s S R Rao was the archaeologist who first identified the R P W at the site, and then M S University of Baroda excavated it. And later on, actually, the site has been associated with the Anandpur, Anandpur, and so many name of the Padnagar, uh, which are available in literature. And this is the actually one of the city of Anand. Anand is a country in the western India. and it has got lot of references in ancient scripture itihas and chronicles uh, mahabharat uh, the adi parv van parv shalya parv bhishma parv and purana bhagavat matsya skand and harivar they have lot of the stories tell and the recording records of the barnagar and its area its the whole area uh, but the name of the the anarth has been mentioned in one of the inscription of rudra daman which is dated to 150 c it is it is inscribed on the the asokan rock uh, at junagar and it mentioned uh, the anarth with the shovir and the shorasta and anarthpur in matraka inscription there are lot of references and so many inscriptions are there copper plate grant which actually record the land grant given to the brahmins of barnagar uh, from the 5th century onward to 8th century and then there is another the reference in the one of the prasasti of the mihirboj available in the gwalior uh, known as the gwalior prasasti that is the 9th century record which mentioned giri durg of anarth that anarth giri durg we have recently found and this was the region of anarth the as per the vain sang record it was 2000 li in circumference if you go by that so it covers the whole area from mount abu to almost the amdavad uh, from north to south and from the little town of kachin west to the dungarpur in the east so that's why the whole area falls in uh, anarth and these are the actually sites contemporary sites of the barnagar we have got the stana talaja the Uh, and all these things, and then uh, how this the site was selection, the location, what was the importance of the area, the landscape before the settlement came up at the Badnagar, and this so actually we have got one EV module. Uh, then it shows that geographically Badnagar is situated on the right bank of a wide parallel. Paleo Channel, possibly the ancient valley of River Savarmati, which flows about 15 kilometers east today from Barnagar. Rupen is another river which flows the in the west, that is around four kilometers from the Barnagar town. This is a Paleo Channel. This wide depression, just actually passing uh, to near the town, the present town. It shows elevation in the part of it also. and this depression is the now the shavarmati and in the background there is a taranga hill which is the last uh, 
spur of the Aravali. So that's why the whole Anarth is actually called a, a, a land of the south west region. Naritya, a, a country in the Naritya angle. That is the Naritya angle. So this is the actually the, the location, this the drainage pattern and the this paleo, paleo channel, which is the more important and this actually seems to be the main cause of the establishment of the settlement Barnagar because this is a wide uh, depression which retains moisture throughout the year and it appears to us that this was the only reason this uh, the site survived uh, from its foundation day to today even it today is continuing there is no gap no digestion and no abandonment. Uh, uh, that is the important, the important significance of the site. At other site, we find actually there are the abandonment, digestion, and so many that there is actually a break in the all the site. And these are the main uh, the trade route at present. This is the Barnagar. This is the route going to Jaipur and Delhi. Then it is going towards the east area. And this is going Ahmedabad and then there are several small routes also and why they actually selected the site this seems this, this was a meandering river there near Varnagar like this this is actually from the another town just west of Varnagar that is Siddhapur town here but that is actually also just established on the uh, bank of a or a, a, a dried oxbow lake, this one, this one. So this is the same situation was in the Barnagar, but in the reverse way. In actually Siddhapur, it is the north side, and here it is the south side. And this, the same lake, that was actually turned into a, this uh, oxbow lake was turned into a lake, uh, at least around 12th, 13th century uh, C. And this is the connected with the small river known as Kapila River, which actually originate in the Taranga Hills, which is around 25, 30 kilometer from this uh, north of this uh, town. And they regulated the water from this river uh, with the, the siltation chamber here known as Nagdharo. And then they allowed water, filtered water into the tank and then the overflow is going towards waste from this region to this one and when the town was laid initially it is a very small settlement uh, just along the bank of that uh, oxbow lake and which, gra which gradually uh, expanded and then at present we have got this is about one square kilometer area uh, less than that and it actually has different phases the originally it was not so big what it is today and now it is actually expanding in all direction this is again and the town we are seeing here the for the fortified area this is a fortified town and the population at present is around 30 35000 including the in the outskirt but inside it was never more than 20,000 or so uh, because the capacity of the town is not so large and it has got uh, six gates. One is the Nadiol, then the Arjun Bari, Bari's gate and the eastern is the Amarthol. The, the, in south there are two. Uh, one is Pithori and then was it Dhaskol and then there is Amarthol here in the west. And around that there was a, a moat which was visible just 20 years back, but now it's all filled with the litters. But in the excavation, we have found the record that it was there since uh, at least from the 2000 C. And then these are the, what we see, this is not a, a high, the, the standard mound actually, all the height, equal height. It has got so many contours actually. And you can see the different uh, the color representing the different contour contour of the town. And this is the highest area, which is around 25 
meter from the surrounding area. This is the actually historical and archaeological background is that Skandapurana has actually reference about the Chamatkarpur, Anarpur, Anandpur, Nagar, which are believed to be attributes of the Varnagar during different phase of its history. The Nagarkhand of the Skandapurana is mainly focused on the Hartkeshwar Chetra and the Nagar community. Actually, the Hartkeshwar Chetra is the Varnagar area and there is a old temple of, ancient temple of Hartkeshwar. Uh, means the you know, Shiv, Shiva, Mahadev, and it is actually the was the main deity of the the Nagar community, which are who are the Brahmins and well known for their the uh, administrative skill and their scholarship and so many other uh, qualities. And the Jain tradition is there so that in the, in the fifth century. There was the first recital of Kalpa Sutra was taken place at the Barnagar when actually Dhruv Sen lost his son and he was so much grieved that then uh, the, the Muni or the, the Sharma, they actually decided to recite the Kalpa Sutra so that he come out from the Shoro. This is the fifth century document and then Vain Sang is the record of Vain Sang actually who came in Barnagar in 7th century C he record that this country is about 2000 Li in circuit the capital about 2 Li 20 Li the population is dense the establishment rich there is no chief ruler but it is an appendage of the Malwa the produce climate and literature and law are the same as those of Malwa there are some 10 Sangaram these are the Buddhist uh, Sangara with less than 1000 priests. They study the little vehicle of the Sammatiya school. There are several tens of Deo temples and sectaries of the different kinds frequent them. Means it is a, actually the, a cosmopolitan town of that day, in those days there were the Buddhist, the Jain and the Hindus were actually living together. And they had the several temple and the monastery in the town. And there are the lot of the copper plate, and they mentioned the Brahmans of Anandpur and Anarpura. And there is another actually 12th century inscription uh, on one of the gate of the Barnagar, known as Arjunbari Gate. It records that the Kumarpal Solanki. Restore, restore the old gate, old fort wall of the Nag Nagar. Then it was known as Nagar, as well as Anandpur. During the Solinki rule, Varnagar enjoyed a special relationship with most of the rulers and many individuals belonging to Varnagar had held high and important position in the court of Solinki. Actually, it is reflected by the literature, description, and so many other evidences. And the SR Rao of ASI, he was the first archaeologist who uh, reported Red Polish in Barnagar in 1952. And in the subsequent year, in 1953, Department of that's why they got the, the evidence of the limited period from 1000 C, that is 1000 year record they found, archaeological record. And in 19 92, there was a chance finding a Bodhisattva image, and which actually again proved that Wen Sang visited the site, and there were certainly some monasteries. On the availability of this all record, the our government, and particularly actually the our CM those the time, Sri Aurobindo Modi, who who is the native of Barnagar, then he asked the department to do something for the site and research and then we started in 2006 actual excavation and which continued up to 2012 and this excavation brought out so many uh, results and these are the, our, oops, the settlement we put trenches on the periphery of the southern wall because this is all very crowded area and there were the patches the vacant spaces we put actually the first trench 
across the wall, the fortification wall. The second, at there was the open plot which was not occupied since long. That uh, maybe some taboo or all these things. Luckily, this was the government plot, and there we excavated and found this monastery. And these trenches they, they gave us the complete cultural sequence of the town. This is, these are the evidence. The, this is the, our first excavation. We wanted to know the actually complete history of the town, uh, particularly the fortification. And here, interestingly, the, in the lower area, we found a rampart, the mud rampart, earthen rampart, which was actually overlay by the these brick walls of the successive period. Here, it is actually the damage, but in other area, it is quite high. And then also, this is the section, uh, section showing the, the rampart, and there is a, a huge wide moat going around it, and then this is the brick wall, and this was the actually last, uh, the wall, the, the top of the wall available, but now it has gone also, it is lost now, and there are these battle but it belongs to the, the Sultanate period, actually they say gone. So that was the actually how actually we should not conserve the or take decision. This was the actually one site where we found the about 20 meter deposit uh, from bottom to top. And here we found uh, the, the a sequence of the, the five periods that actually the, this provided the uninterrupted continuity of the town, which is not seen in most of the sites. I think there are very rare sites, actually, but now that way it is very rare site. And this outstanding, this continuity, maybe it's outstanding universal value because I have gone through so many sites, but not found that the one one settlement is surviving at the same place within those walls, even today, without any break. It is not the case in even the Banaras, the Banaras also, because there the town is growing along the bank of the river Ganga, and the settlement of different phases are located at the different uh, in the it has actually along the river and uh, that is not the case here uh, because here it is actually some flood is taking place and then you have to shift but in Bernagar people never shifted from this settlement uh, that is one of the importance and we can call it the OUV of the Bernagar uh, and we found actually the remains from the 4th, 3rd century BC onward uh, and uh, it is still continuing. I have actually uh, not followed the actually the chronology or based on the dynasty rule. I just followed the chronology based on the major event of the town. Uh, the initial settlement of Maurya and pre Maurya period that was a very small settlement. Without we have not actually found any wall or any plan of the side because the excavation was very limited in the lower level. But the first 40, 45 town, uh, the first fortification was, a, was an earthen rampart. It came up around second century BC and continued to first century, uh, the first century BC. And this was almost contemporary to the Indo-Greek, Shatvahana or the Sunga in North and maybe other actually. And the fort, then there the this was replaced by the uh, the brick wall in the first century C, and that was actually continued till date, and it was actually there are several phases of uh, uh, repair, uh, alteration, and addition, uh, which belongs to the Chhatrapa, Maitraka, Solanki, and the Sultanate period, and then. Fifth, we call it the period of Gujarat Sultanate. That was the last major dynasty which was ruling in Gujarat. And then 
we have got Barnagar the of the Mughal, Maratha, and British time. Though it was not the capital city, but this the town has played a crucial role in the social social uh, up the development or the political and social development of the whole Gujarat because the Brahmins of Barnagar they were actually in great demand in throughout the centuries by the local ruler and uh, we get the term Nagar we say it is only after a 10th century CE I think before that there are the Brahm Brahmins of the Barnagar no Nagar but because they came from the Nagar, Nagar they became Nagar that is actually my uh, thinking okay, that uh, from the Nagar they became Nagar and this is our trench here we have got the okay, one structure of the Mauryan period this is the structure and the bricks are very large brick uh, about uh, 50 centimeter long and 28 centimeter wide and 8 to 9 centimeter thick that is the actually the usual size of the Mauryan bricks and then it was actually a partially a brick structure and partially a wood structure. You have got the these uh, post holes here, this one. So that means actually this was a uh, the base of the wall was the with brick and then the upper portion was made of the the wooden. So this was the first actually the which it established actually this goes to the modern period. And because we have got the description of the Ashoka in Jun Junagadh and where actually Rudra Daman inscription mentioned that Chandragupta Maurya actually established Rudra Daman in this uh, Sudarshan Lake in the uh, 4th century BC, in the late 4th century BC. That indicate actually Barnagar seems to be a contemporary town and here this is the actually section showing the different period and you can see this is the layer which actually give you a date of the uh, 75 BC, 35 BC to the first century CE, and then there is down below there is a around five cent meter deposit. That actually is deposit go certainly back to the fourth century, and the material is also available there. And then there is a continuity up to there. You can see, and there is some disturbance around this phase. This is the Actually, we have got more yeah, than the second century BC. Then from here, actually, we have got the this uh, Chhatrap, Matrak, and Solanki. And then around this, actually, the 13th, 14th century, during the attack of the Muslim ruler from Delhi, the, the there was a lot of the actually migration taking place, a lot of the things happening. And there in Varna, actually, there are certain pockets which were abandoned. Because, because the new cities were being established, new townships were coming up. So those most of the people who went to the city uh, for the to get the employment or to to swell their actually handicraft and their craftsmanship, whatever was there. So they are actually the later period. We have got the 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 this kind of the uh, development uh, some. In some pocket, it is not the whole town, but some pocket actually there are abandonment, and then again people are coming, establishing the houses, and then going again. Again, on the top there is a five meter deposit, but not this site was abandoned around the uh, Mughal period, and which but it continued at other side of the town. And here also you can see the inside the town we have got this uh, the settlement. This is the rampart, Ardhan rampart, and below it there is a deposit which belongs to the the Maurya and the early period. And then you can see from here actually we get the the brick structure coming up, and there are several uh, repair phase addition and all these things. And the town planning from this period and up to this top there was a, a period of 11, 1200 years that the town grew without any change in settlement planning. And this is one of the wall, which is about 10, 11 meter high. But this is not a single wall. 
people actually were sur surprised whether it belongs to a big house, big building. But there are several phases within this. If you can see this, the, the uh, construction. And because of this, it, it indicate actually the town planning remained same. And the, the people who are living in Barnagar, they were same. Uh, who actually laid the foundation of the town because the the successor was actually following the orientation of his father house his ancestor house and because they if there is some some deviation they will actually not get a solid ground that's why they continued the wall on the top of the previous wall and that's why we are getting a continuity from throughout the year the, the, the late period what i am saying up to there there is a continuous uh, uh, succession and they belong to different phases. At the bottom, they belong to Chhatrava, then Maitraka, then Solanki, then Sultanate on the top. So that way, actually, it gives a complete uh, a complete book. It is a complete book or for the Barnagar, actually, to understand Barnagar. And these are the another actually the photographs of the different phases. You can see the same wall which is going down. 11 meter this one and these are the contemporary at the top of the same wall you can see this is the fortification wall and this is the phase of the actually the solanki and uh, sultanate period you can see the plastering of this thing and this seems to be the solanki period below it because Sogolinki used the maximum stone in the construction and this was used in the wall also and they built the gate also do the gate of the bandagar that's why actually there are the different phases, their uh, structures, and a continuity also. Without any break, it is continued. Then this is the last, actually the Maratha period. You can see the the brick on edge. This is the, the then here is the planning is changed. The orientation of the certain roads. Doctor Rawaji, yes. uh, slide slide बढ़ रही है क्या आपकी slide? स्लाइड तो बढ़ेगा नहीं कम टाइम है नहीं नहीं हम ये नहीं कह रहे हैं सही है नहीं नहीं अभी ठीक है ठीक है सर हाँ आई विल गो सर इट इस स्टक इन स्लाइड नंबर नाइन सर इट इस स्टक इन स्लाइड नंबर नाइन ओ आई हैव गोट फोर्टी एट आई विल गो ओके ओके नाउ आई एम गो गोइंग फास्ट एक्चुअली दी जा रही है एक्चुअली spray on this pot and then these are the certain actually seals from the early level and uh, one of the seal is there is a very good the this chaitya the temple with the right ko aage badhaye slide ko ha right or slides slide nahi dikh raha ha sir slides change nahi hui hai oh सर आपकी स्लाइड से ही बढ़ रही है स्लाइड इस तक हो गई नाइन स्लाइड के आगे नहीं बढ़ पाया ये ओ माय गॉड देयर इज अ प्रॉब्लम व्हाट टू डू नाउ सर एक बार प्रेजेंटेशन ऑफ करके दोबारा स्टार्ट करें देखें और उसके बाद फिर दोबारा से प्रेजेंटेशन एक बार शेयर करेंगे तो शायद ये हो जाएगा ओह सॉरी आई वाज नॉट डूइंग दिस हम एक बार शेयरिंग स्टॉप करके दोबारा से शेयर करने देखे प्रेजेंट हाँ नाउ नाउ इट इज़ हाँ हाँ अब अब हो रहा है अब हो रहा है आगे बढ़ाइए हाँ सेवन फीस हाँ ये तो ये मैं आपको बताया इसमें जो कितने फीसेज हैं देन दिस इन दिस सेक्शन ऑफ़ दी दी डीप ट्रेंच थोड़ा थोड़ा बता दें जो जो नहीं देखी गई � the Maratha period, the wall and the the street. This street is not available now. But once there was a street, that is the planning actually also changing. This is the street actually going this way. But later it is blocked here. Now it is not that street is not there. There is a well also. But some planning is taking changing during the period. So these are the pottery of the different level in the early level pottery. And then we have got these seals. Of the early period, and they are they give actually the chaitya, then there is a flag, and according to B. S. Agarwal, this appears to be Indradhvaj. 
the what he has given the, the definition that seems to be in the and then there is a tree worshiper here also this is a tree within the vedika and then there is a the turbaned person who is worshiping the tree this is negative this is positive this is another seal and then these are the coins of the early world with so many uh, symbols and all these things now this is the barnagar town at present this is the top of the town and this is the, the lowest contour of the town it is uh, increasing you go to this north side and this is near a gate we found the monastery this is the uh, the luckily this was a open plot of the government and we got the monastery here and uh, that indicate there was a taboo actually nobody actually uh, touched this this site i think after the abandonment by the buddhist and uh, this is these are the the i think the 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 remains of the monastery this was very small monastery uh, of uh, 14 meter by 14 meter uh, with nine cells and in this center there was a open courtyard and the cells were actually arranged on the around this co open courtyard and there was a porch in the north and there were two flight of steps from one side this uh, from west and from east and in front there were the these stupas there the these has got actually three phases the first phase was the circle one and the later was actually it became square and then finally there was actually the temple like molding at the base and this is was grown and this is influenced by the most of the gandhara feature the in particular in the architecture and the monastery was built in a high plate form that is another interesting uh, aspect of the monastery and then this is the the section the plan and the, the same thing i told you the showing the same the central courtyard and then the cells and this is the from the north there is the entry these are the the and then uh, from the monastery we got this uh, these remains particularly the one this the stupa there is a hole inside for the chhatravali and it has got faceted actually drum the medhi of the stupa that is very unique i think maybe influenced from the swat valley or i don't know and then this is the the elevation the after the circular one this is the the diminishing spires and then the original was the small one and it is the during actually 6 7 century they put the molding around the 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 drum available that time and raised the height of the the and the dome with for the chhatravali that, that is clearly indication that the during this time the temple architecture was also emerging in the gujarat we have got the gop temple with the so many a huge plinth and so many molding but that seems to be contemporary actually it started around 6th century and continued actually to me it continued till the end of the 8th century c uh, then we have got actually recently a exhibition by the directorate of archaeology gujarat state in uh, gandhinagar we actually just reconstructed a model of the monastery which seem to be the model of the monastery and this belongs to the actually chhatrava period uh, i have dated it around the end of the first century c because the rpw at the site appear with the construction of this this monastery this is very small monastery but later on it was extended towards east and towards uh, south also because there are the houses still people are living there to, you can't check it but walls of the another monastery the later monastery are actually uh, going in underneath the, those houses and this is inter very interesting uh, image of bodhisattva found in the 1992 and here uh, this was discovered by the professor meta in 1992 and then he said it is a samitin bhikkhuno yo devo bodhisattva tayo chete kutai acharyan mahasayakena pariya it is belongs to the actually bodhisattva this brought by the acharya mahasayak uh, the god of samiti for the chetya but actually the problem was there the two first letter of this inscription first two letter they are same 
actually whenever i visited this uh, bodhisattva i saw there is some problem actually in the identification of this then i sent it actually to peter skilling and uh, along with peter skilling in 2016 and this uh, professor oscar von humber they both actually uh, read this inscription and they actually uh, they decipher is as sasthatiya bhikkuniya dan bodhisattva shragaya chaitya kutiye acharena mahashag in pariya means this is the gift of a bodhisattva by the nun from swasthamata for her own chaitya kuti for the acquisition of the mahashangik teacher so this was the reading and this solve actually particularly this reading actually this solve our problem actually why the monastery is within the settlement the generally monastery is outside the settlement in the uh, very distance from the settlement but it was within the town so because this is a nunnery this was actually a nunnery actually as per the inscription and the this image was found south of the of this monastery so that we think actually this was a small nunnery and the nuns were allowed to actually make their monastery inside the settlement because of the security and other region so that seems to be the this was the nunnery where this bodhisattva could have been actually uh, enshrined from the monastery we have got this kind of the pottery which is not nbp actually we confuse it with in nbp but this seems to be a later in uh, imitation of nbp and giving the name of dhamma divakarasya then shakrasya buddhilaya like that and that establish this is the buddhist monastery and then we got so several these uh, votive ceilings from the site and that further still this actually this is a buddhist monastery inside the settlement and there are lot of actually these these this votive ceilings and we have identified some 18 name of the eight ceiling these are the bodhilaya chand chand divakarasya dhamma ishwar ishwar gunasya meshana vastu uh, nav dasya son there are the name of the donors or the the devotee who actually offered those ceilings and then there are actually from the monastery we got this uh, these object which shows some foreign origin or some influence actually this has got the gandhara link this has got actually the greek or roman influence this one this also a roman sort of thing and these conjoined link patuli kushana and all these thing and this is the the torpedo jar uh, the shards of torpedo with the bitumen inside and the the buff color outside and this is also a glazed ware from the mediterranean region particular mesopotamia region so that so actually barnagar was a very cosmopolitan nature of society and a lot of the people had business with those country or the people were visiting the monastery area with this and similarly there were some devasthan during the maitraka period we found these actually this is a known as a baba temple it seems to be hermit hermitage and we have got these images and particularly the depiction of the shul which is similar to the pishwa metraka period koi that indicates this is outside the town in a lonely area uh, that's why it is called a bavana tibbo means a place of the uh, a hermit a hermitage and then these are the pottery types from the 1st century to 6th century ce they showing the lot of the rpw the sprinkler the painted pottery the Uh, rang mahal where sort of thing and then this is the, all the continuity of that period even the we are getting the kaolin ware the glazed ware actually so sanian glazed ware glazed ware is there and these pot lids and uh, these uh, lamps and there are so on and this is one actually tradition this is actually i have put here because we don't know much about the past what happened in the past i we, i we, i never believed like there were this kind of the leather leather storage jar just 100 year back 
this pot has got so many layers of leather it is there is nothing uh, of mud this uh, clay it is totally made of the leather and having so many layers and this kind of pot actually when i asked them to people so they said this was actually for the the storage of the ghee and then to transport it to the far away in the big town so this seems to be the actually successor of the that uh, Uh, chocolate slip jar of the Harappan time with the pointed uh, base, and that lot of the, those jar has been found in the Oman area. So similar, actually, there might have been so many things which were made of the this kind of the material which is not available. So that's why our how much, I mean, how much information we get from past that is also a certain uh, questionable thing actually. But whatever is there, we have to put properly. Uh, these are the coins of Chhatrapati period. Then we have got the one Kusana coin. This is very actually important because it, there are very few Kusana coin in Gujarat. Almost uh, seems to be one or two, but this one has come from the Burnagar. Then uh, these are the other coins. This is a phase actually after Chhatrapa around four century C to fifth century C. this seems to be a local to me actually this seems to be a local ruler who actually had some sovereignty and then because he actually issued these coins of garuda this is garuda this is not the actually skand gupta or kumar gupta garuda coin there is nothing no inscription other side you have got three arch hill and the trishul and all these things and this is the, uh, the these are the matraka you have got this and then the garuda in the gold also So this sixty percent of coin actually from we found from Bharatnagar are all of this this ruler. Who was this? This is a big question. And then there are certain thing the tablets they are all all uh, reported from the Ganga Valley in Pradesh even in East India and the very Hinduian thing. And uh, there are so many explanation for. some say it is a ritualistic some say some measurement some say some weight it is very not a actually solution at that final solution we have not found about this this uh, tablet and then this is a very interesting thing of barnagar we have got several such actually amulets these are amulets and there are holes so you just imagine actually around 4 Fifth century or third century onward, actually the people of Bharatnagar were actually hanging such a, the the amulets as if they are giving them identity of their sect. So that is very interesting. Actually, this is one aspect which should be researched actually thoroughly. So why actually uh, this is whether they they are actually from the sub sect of some Pasubat, Buddhist, Jaina? We don't know. definitely there are the several this amulet and there is this hole that's why people were actually uh, fond of it and this is one impression of a roman coin found in a, a one ceiling this is a uh, terracotta ceiling and this is a roman coin which can be dated to 364 to 360 ce this was issued in period during the period of this uh, palentinum constable and this actually we have identified this this the date of the coin is the 364 to 367 but interestingly other side we have got the brahmi brahmi legend which has got actually sri su srusya putrasya that uh, it belongs to the actually fifth fifth century i think mostly and this is the actually somebody actually have this coin during the 5th century in his pocket or in his family and then he is getting the impression of the coin on one side and the legend in brahmi on the other side so maybe some trade link on I, i don't know uh, and then there is the, this school of uh, this belongs to actually the samrajya school of uh, art this is a particular 6th 7th century ad school of art with this kind of uh, the representation a very the heavy drapery and this sort of thing this is a devi maybe the parvati 
generally these are built in cyst but here it is a sandstone and then we have got this kind of ascetics out of the ascetics from Burnagar which is followed by the terracotta uh, objects uh, these are the this particularly this is a necklace which belongs to the second century BC this has been found in the Maharashtra also and there they have actually got it from the second century BC E label so this is very interesting and then what why Burnagar was so actually developing town these seems to be some actually the region because it is a thriving industry during the time we have found in lower level these uh, crucibles and then the copper slag this iron slag and this iron object because Arawal is very close to Burnagar maybe actually this one of the industry of Burnagar during the uh, early phase and then another is the bead industry lapidary products from Burnagar and we have got some actually the chips also some unfinished bead also that's indicate actually they were actually there were actually works so for it also and some items were being imported from the other area because Khambat is, is still a famous place for such, uh, beads and earlier Ratanpur in the Birch Taluka is known from the Hadapan time that's why there are so many type of uh, material available and because the Arauli is very close by Arauli is also very rich in mineral and other these stones so these are this seem to be another industry of burger and the third is the cell cell is also a very prominent industry of the Gujarat from the Adapan time and uh, it was actually procured from the Gulf of Kutch and also deep sea area and there are many Hadapan sites along the Gulf of Kutch uh, like Sikarpur, Kuntasi, Nageshwar and so many and then this remained actually the uh, main industry of this western in India we are getting in the in the early Hadapan, the early historical time there are sites yielding so many uh, triangles then these are the actually the the plaything uh, dies and the, there is a growth of the these bangles from the simple type to more complicated and there are the uh, Mithun Yugal also on one of the bangle but they all belong to the later uh, 10th 11th century and the, the earlier bangles are very simple we have got lot of uh, the glass bangles different type of glass even the coral and finally this is the tax collector seals this is the there is a negative uh, engraving of Sri Bali Sarasya Bali means the, the tax he seems to be a tax collector of the Burnagar who was authorized to collect this and this seal actually is very interesting maybe fifth century and then the certain things we found actually this temple remains of the Vishnu temple in the excavation and uh, there are a lot of actually such sculpture is created in Burnagar and people say there was there could have been a large temple of uh, Vishnu, Vishnu in the Burnagar and this is you can see the the Gajendra Moksha Trivikram and there are another actually uh, image of the Vishnu and these are the even you can surviving surviving elements of the 10th 11th century these are the Saptamatrika anal then the Turan is the famous Turan of the Burnagar and this was the last actually the battlement parapet which is now gone it is not available thank you hello Hello, thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you. Bye, bye. It's over. Mr. Lalit Pandey, sir. Haan, ji. Yeah. Haan, sir. Please. Uh, there is no question. Uh, in a, no, no will ask the question uh, to Dr. Rawat. <laughs> uh, I should <laughs> conclude. 
uh, it was a very interesting lecture and uh, as uh, dr rawat in his lecture he told that badnagar is a complete book of the his, um, city you know so matlab it gives a full uh, complete profile of the city and the surrounding areas and it appears that uh, since its uh, inception of the settlement uh, it was a cosmopolitan um, uh, type of uh, um, settlement and the buddhists and jains and uh, brahmins were living there and the brahmanas of that uh, of vadnagar the nagars uh, the nagars of the gujarat are very popular and they have um, contributed a lot to the history of uh, rajasthan and especially of mewar history south rajasthan history and besides uh, he very um, elaborately described the topography physiography of the surroundings the why and how Uh, the vadnagar became such a uh, important uh, important center and he compared the vadnagar with all, also with the kashi and he told that uh, its continuity makes it very important uh, because in india in, in we have very few sites uh, those have continuity from the right from the proto historic times to the present time to the medieval time hmm. because in, in nearby areas where in rajasthan we see so there are many gaps are there you know but in vadnagar we are seeing a very uh, harmonious continuity is there so this is a this is a very end he uh, earlier he told about how the site discovered how the sr rao um, discovered it in ratan met uh, ms university of baroda meta sir he excavated and there uh, um, Dr. Rawat he did a historic job here, and uh, uh, I, I think uh, he has told everything, and nothing is uh, uh, on my side that I should speak anything. Uh, uh, he told about the Gandhara architectural influence of also in the architecture of it, and the stupa and the all other things. So. Uh, um, ultimate matlab it gives a lesson vadnagar excavation it gives a lesson in the present time so that uh, since the uh, earliest times the indian society is a, is go is the heterogeneous but we were living very in a homogeneity it uh, i think it is the result of that vadnagar excavation if dr rawat agrees to me. thank you thank you sir thank you Thank you, Dr. Bias Rawat sir, for giving a nice talk in this webinar, and uh, Dr. Lalit Pandey sir, Professor Lalit Pandey sir, for uh, uh, chair the session. Thank you, uh, Alakpur sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Rawat sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, both of you. Thank you. Next session, uh, speaker. Shiv, uh, Dr. Shivangi Mishra. Actually, this session is Dr. Bhaskar Chaudhary, like uh, some uh, in Assam, uh, up to 4 p.m. Next, hello. So, next uh, speaker, Dr. Shivangi Mishra. Yes, sir. Dr. Shivangi Mishra, please welcome and. Uh, Dear person, Doctor Manoj Borka Sir, Borka Sir, yes sir, welcome. And co-chair person, Doctor Sumesh Singh, Assistant Professor, from Scientist School of Wildlife, Forensics and Head, NDBSU Jawalpur, Vet Government Veterinary College uh, or and University Jawalpur. Sir, uh, Sumesh Singh ji. Uh, सोमेश सिंह जी आप डॉक्टर शिवान जी मिश्रा का बायोडाटा प्रेजेंट करेंगे और डॉक्टर बोरकर साहब प्लीज शेयर हाँ जी सर थैंक यू सो मच फॉर एलिवेटिंग मी एट अ वेरी शॉर्ट नोटिस टू दिस प्रेस्टिजियस टास्क वेलकम डॉक्टर कुपाली सर वेलकम इट्स अ प्लेजर टू सी बोथ डॉक्टर बोरकर so i i think it's it's very encouraging you know that uh, dr supali yeah. is uh, watching the proceedings uh, yeah. very warm welcome to the speaker dr shivangi mishra ji 
ंट्री <laughs> and uh, uh, before i request uh, my co-chair to introduce the speaker i quickly went through her profile uh, which is available in the public domain and uh, she comes across as somebody who is uh, really dr shivangi mishra comes across as somebody who is very active in research uh, with uh, i stand to be correct but she's got about 60 publications already to her credit and uh, her interest is multifarious from uh, competitive interaction of avian scavengers to uh, nanofibers and solid waste management and ecotourism and i suppose she also has a paper on butterflies uh, with that kind of um, diverse interests in uh, various facets of research in zoology and wildlife it's indeed a ple pleasure to welcome you ma'am and i'm sure you'll keep uh, all of us enthralled and also add to our understanding of uh, the conservation concerns of egyptian vulture so uh, co-chair sub if you could kindly do the honors by introducing the speaker ma'am a little more formally please thank you so much borka sir you already introduced uh, uh, with the zest of her uh, profile but just uh, for sake of formality i am reading the, from the bio data Am I audible, sir? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Dr. Shivangi Mishra. Uh, currently, she is uh, working as assistant professor in the Department of Zoology, School of Sciences, J E uh, C R C University, Jaipur, and uh, she is uh, most of the time, I think, uh, for she pursued her PhD. Uh, under the guidance of again a well known uh, raptor specialist dr amita kanojia i was fortunate to work with dr amita ma'am uh, while she was uh, associated with the vulture census project in the state of madhya pradesh professor uh, uh, k k jha he was the pi of this project so i was one of the master trainer dr amita kanojia was one uh, and i remember uh, rohan singarpure from bnhs he was one so we were uh, visiting several places in madhya pradesh and uh, training the uh, forest frontline staff and many uh, uh, officers of the state forest services and indian forest services as well so Uh, when i saw the profile i read the name of dr kanoji as well so, uh, her her topic of uh, phd research uh, as a egyptian vultures okay. yeah yeah it Egyptian was vultures. it was again in the, in the vultures that i wanted to emphasize and uh, she has published more than 25 uh, research papers in a very reputed journals she has several awards to her credit already she visited several countries uh, she won this james kaplin award in colorado usa then william c anderson award in south africa best uh, oral presentation awards wings to fly award uh, by the raptor research uh, foundation usa professor MI Patel awards nari shakti award for best women researchers so uh, these are some of the awards of her credit <laughs> and i cannot read all those because it is very huge profile so uh, okay. she has worked as a jrf in uh, research project and also worked uh, 
as a, a senior research fellow. Uh, now I request uh, uh, Dr. Shivangi Mishra to kindly start her presentation on the Egyptian vulture, Neuphoran Parknok Terrace. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. First of all, uh, very good afternoon to uh, respected organizers and uh, the dignitaries present over here, the chairperson, sir, and the co-chairperson, sir. And thank you for the very generous uh, introduction. Though I'm still learning and I'm still working in the field of conservation, and I wish to make a change in wildlife conservation and biodiversity conservation. And so I'm uh, going to share my presentation. Is this visible, the presentation? No, it's a blank screen. Hello, sir. Black screen, blank. Earlier it was visible.
you may just close all the documents and open it again in the desktop and try to upload then it is much easier डॉक्टर शिवांगी यस इट वाज वर्किंग बाय द टाइम आई वाज यू ओपन द ओपन योर पावर ओपन योर पावर पॉइंट एंड देन मिनिमाइज इट यस ओके देन Okay, open sir. your google yes, meet it is open yes, yeah sir. and go go in present now so i have done that only i and i clicked on present share now screen. and then share ma'am agar nahi ho pa raha hai to aap mail kariyega skan mishra ji ko and then maybe sir, dekh lenge ha aap kisi ko bhi mail kar sakti hain even aap mujhe bhi mail yes. kar sakti hain Yes. First, you close all the documents on the desktop. I find many documents open on your desktop. Open this only, and as so many things said, minimize it. Then use this up arrow, and then upload it. It's very simple. I suggest the presentation may be sent to chair or co-chair. and then uh, or to mishra ji so that we can yeah it's coming good yes it is it yes, it, yes it has come yes it has come good ji ma'am please dr shivangi dr shivangi your presentation is on yeah Moving. Slides are moving. 
Okay, sir. Is this visible now? Yes, it's visible. Shuru kariye. It's it's perfect. Please start. Okay. Oh, okay. Thank you, sir. Sorry for the technical glitches. We are extremely sorry. So, no, 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 uh, okay. I have uh, worked on globally endangered species in Uttar Pradesh, India, and. Again, uh, so uh, introduction. The Egyptian vulture is a medium sized raptor and opportunist scavenger feeding on a large variety of dead animals. Ma'am, ma'am, I'm sorry to interrupt. I'm sorry small to and medium interrupt. Shivangi, I'm sorry to interrupt. Yes, what sir. you should be doing is kindly click on slide number two in your left hand yes, side sir. column. Here I have uh, made it at the PPT view. On the whole screen, it is coming here from no, that. Yeah, but the slide is not moving. We are still stuck up on the first slide. Madam, let's go to slide show. Let's go to slide show. Okay, sir. Slide show. Let's go to 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 So yeah, I'm the full screen. I have date date to uh, we. I think it is hang or somewhat like that. That is fine. Just click on the slide number two on the left side. Ah. I, I, I'm trying to share it again. It's stuck. Ma'am, do you have any technical support at your end? If not, please email it. Dr. Yes. Shivangi, kindly yes. email it. Yes, sir. I, I, I'm emailing. Good evening, Dr. Ansari. <laughs> good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. So how are you? Fine, fine. How are you? I am. I am facing all that problem. I am sending the PPT to you. Yeah, health problem. They are sending to. Uh, the organizer, they, they, they are not sending the PPT. She has just sent, so it will take another uh, few minutes, so we will be on. Yeah. Uh, In advance, uh, it is... Hello? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. The email has been sent. You can put the first slide on the first slide and lecture, because the mail is also doing something wrong here. 
तो आप अपना फर्स्ट स्लाइड लगा के ही लेक्चर दीजिए यदि नहीं पढ़ रहा है डॉक्टर शिवानी आप उसी मेल उसी मेल को मेरी आईडी में फॉरवर्ड कर दीजिए डॉक्टर सोमेश हां या कि सोमेश सिंह के आईडी में सोमेश सिंह की आईडी जो है उनको शेयर कर दें डॉक्टर सोमेश सिंह 2007@gmail.com d r s o m e s h s i n g h 2007@gmail.com सो यू टाइप इट इन द चैट बॉक्स आई थिंक शी इज प्रेजेंटिंग अगेन यस Yeah, I think it will come this time. Yes, it is moving. Go ahead. Bus, bus. Nicha, ni come to number two, ma'am. Okay. Is this fine? Yes, introduction can be seen. Okay. Okay, sir. Thank you. Sir. So, uh, the Egyptian vulture is a medium-sized raptor and opportunist scavenger, feeding on a large variety of dead animals, including large carcasses, small and medium-sized vertebrates, sometimes taking live prey, insects, and human waste on rubbish dumps. That's why uh, they are uh, more in number than other vulture species because uh, they uh, they forage on a wide variety of food materials, and they are not very specific to the uh, Kind of food, uh, it can feed upon anything. So that's why they are more in number than other vulture species, and it's very much smaller and lighter in comparison to other vultures. And it is the only living member of the genus Neoprion. There are uh, three subspecies of Neoprion panopterus in the world: Neoprion panopterus dindinianus, which is found in India and Nepal; Neoprion panopterus majorensis on the Canary Islands, endemic to the Canary Islands. while the new front panopterus panopterus which is uh, present in the rest of the species distribution and both of these subspecies panopterus panopterus and panopterus dindinianus are present in india and uh, in uttar pradesh also these two share the same niche and the uh, they share the food also and uh, the egyptian vulture is sometimes called pharaoh's due to the fact that it is so often sculptured on ancient monuments of egypt they are having a great mythological significance in egyptian culture that's why they are named as egyptian vultures though they have a, a, a cultural importance in other uh, cultures of the world also like in greeks and in in, uh, in our indian culture also uh, there is a temple in uh, in south tirupalu kundram where uh, a pair of egyptian vultures visit the, the that particular temple and the saints there they offer food uh, to egyptian uh, as uh, the prasad of the temple to uh, uh, them and they keep on coming there from generations so they are having great mythological significance in different cultures of the world and uh, because of consistent and steep declines they have been uh, uplifted to Uh, they uh, uh, steep declines throughout its range the species was uplisted from least concern to endangered in the iucn red list in 2007 according to the bird life international 2008 and these are the previously published red list assessments of egyptian vulture and we can see that in 2007 it became endangered from the least concern uh now the in general in the, the occurrence of vulture species there are uh, 23 species in the world of which seven are new world vultures which are the which are in american region and the 16 old, uh, species of old world vultures are there of which nine old world vulture species are there in india and of those nine eight are there in up and egyptian vultures are one of the eight species of vultures present in uttar pradesh the one which is not there in up is uh, the bearded vulture uh, which is found in uttarakhand region because it is adapted to colder environment conditions uh, these uh, are the residential and uh, migratory species of vultures uh, gyps indicus which is the long billed vulture gyps bengalensis white backed vulture gyps tenuirostris slender billed vulture and sarco gyps calvus king vulture new front panopterus that this is the egyptian vulture and the migratory species are agps monarchus which is the cinereus vulture gyps fulvus griffon vulture aliensis 
that is himalayan griffon vulture uh, morphology of egyptian vulture so uh, uh, in this picture we can see the flying adult the adult and the closer view of the head region of the adult and we can see that the beak of egyptian vulture is hooked and it is modified to feed upon the narrow ledges of the calcas and to go deeper into the uh, calcas to feed accordingly and uh, the egyptian vultures uh, feed after the calcas is being open is being opened by the other larger vulture species or any other uh, scavenger nearby so uh, because uh, they are smaller and uh, uh, they, uh, there is a certain dietary or in, uh, preferences uh, in different species of vultures and Egyptian vultures are uh, more uh, fond of the bone region and the de deeper regions of the carcass. So it feeds afterwards. And this is a photo of uh, adult, juvenile and subadult. In the first picture, we can see the adult, which is white in color with the juvenile, which is black and because of this uh, difference in the appearance of adult and the juvenile, they are uh, the juveniles are uh, very much similar to the black kites juveniles and black kites. So, at most of the places uh, during our study, we have observed that people uh, have an identification crisis by these Egyptian vultures as kites. They are most of the uh, people in UP, they, when we go to them and ask about that, if they have seen this vulture species or not, then they say that this is a kite. First of all, they say that this is a kite, this is not a vulture. So this kind of lack of awareness was very much common while we were doing our survey because uh, they are not aware that this is a vulture species and it needs to be uh, protected. And special care should be given to these species as they are uh, continuously declining. And the second picture is uh, the adult with the juvenile and the uh, third picture is the sub adult with certain white and certain black plumage. Uh, there are some specific foraging advantages of Egyptian vultures also that they have the bare skin, the face is devoid of hairs, so the bare skin prevents the blood and food sticking to it, the long and thin beak using its long beak it easily tears off small pieces of meat left by larger scavengers, as I said earlier. And the thin beak can reach up to the areas deep inside to narrow spaces between the bones. And they are very much fond of bones. So they have been often observed uh, feeding uh, near the bone mill factories and the sugar mill factories. And they are very non-selective in their diet. They can feed upon a variety of food that is available for them, which increases their survival rate also as compared to other vulture species that look for large and fresh carcass as, for example, red-headed vultures. Red-headed vultures are very, very choosy and they are very specific to their diet and they only prefer to eat the fresh carcass according to their studies. So these Egyptian vultures are not so much selective in their diet and this may be one of the reasons why they are more in upper than other vulture species. Active hunting, in addition to the food available for them, they also look and hunt for food and sometimes observe preying upon the rats, mice, lizards, tortoises, fish, insects, and other pests also. And they have also seen uh, feeding upon the feces also. And uh, in, if we go through the population between divisions of Uttar Pradesh, population of Egyptian vultures, so the largest population we have recorded in Lucknow division and the smallest was in Merit division. And the administrative divisions show significant differences in adult population level. This may be due to the fact that uh, in Lucknow division, we are having a large number of agro-based factories and uh, uh, their uh, the rubbish dump of the slaughterhouses serve as the slaughterhouses and agro-based factories serve as the good uh, foraging uh, uh, sites for these Egyptian cultures. And if we go through the season wise differences and we have observed that maximum number of Egyptian vultures were in winter season followed by summer and monsoon maybe due to the fact that winter season and the, the there is more number of livestock uh, death and that's why they get ample of food available to them and this is a glimpse of the study sites in UP you can see the Egyptian vultures roosting with black kites at Aligarh 
we have observed them. And then roasting at the brick kiln and electricity piling at Lakhimpur Khiri. Hundreds of Egyptian vultures been there. And the slaughterhouse which we visited was Durara slaughterhouse. Now it, it has been closed because it was illegal. So it, uh, uh, this might also cause a problem for Egyptian vultures because they, they, they were very much, very large in number along the slaughterhouse. And this is uh, the figure showing Egyptian vultures on the roof of sugar mill in Lakhimpur. And the adults and sub adults at now. You can see that uh, ample of food availability is there. Uh, 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 behind the uh, slaughterhouse, there is a dump ground, and the Egyptian vultures come and forage there. If we go through the habitat preference, we have observed that they have chosen the semi-urban habitats more than other habitats like forest, urban, and agricultural. Uh, but semi-urban because, uh, which I'll explain in the later slides, because they utilize the anthropogenic materials for their nest building. The Egyptian vultures in agricultural field, here we can see them um, roosting and dust bathing in the uh, dust then raised from the slaughterhouse at Rai Bareli. We have seen them, seen them uh, uh, feeding along with other species like dogs and black types also. And uh, there is a relationship between, between the Egyptian vultures and rubbish dump. And the maximum population of Egyptian vultures were observed near the rubbish dumps of the slaughterhouses. And it depicts that uh, slaughterhouses and rubbish dumps are the driving force for the presence of Egyptian vultures in UP. And this is a graph showing the population and rubbish dump relationship. And we have seen a large number of population individuals of Egyptian vultures near to the rubbish dumps. And uh, feeding time preference. We have also done this study and we have observed that the maximum time for uh, foraging was utilized during the afternoon followed by morning and evening hours because they are not uh, active in early morning hours, but in the afternoon hours. So um, the foraging behaviors we have observed the tool using behavior. It is uh, one. Uh, it is the only tool using bird uh, because we are the uh, uh, in other cases. If you uh, in Egyptian vulture case, if they uh, try to feed upon uh, an egg, then they try. Uh, then they throw a stone onto the egg and then they feed upon the egg. But in other vulture, uh, other bird species, the generally what they do is that they pick upon pick the egg and then it, they throw the uh, the egg on the stone and then break them and then feed. But Egyptian vultures are different and they use tools. And at uh, several uh, some of our study sites, we have seen that they have used the sticks to open the carcass also. Because uh, if there is no larger vulture species nearby and no other scavenger to open the carcass, and they have also uh, seen uh, observed using the sticks uh, to uh, uh, feed upon the carcass in the deeper region. In the coprophagy, sunning and roosting, cleaning, aloe cleaning, uh, walking, social interaction with other species, dust bathing, circling and soaring, pollen engine display was observed during the threat, the parental care. We have observed that both the individuals, male and female, give equal amount to the parental care, and they take care of the uh, juvenile. They take care of the egg first, and then the fledgling, and then they until they, they reach a certain age that the juvenile is able to feed upon itself. They take care of their uh, juveniles. Uh, social foraging. And we have observed that they have studies, they have uh, been seen feeding along with black kites, house crows, cattle egrets, and dog. And the significance of these association is also discussed. And we have observed the maximum population was feeding along with the cattle egret, followed by uh, black kites, and then crow, and then dogs. Uh, it shows that. Um, there, uh, there is some feeding relationship in a guild, uh, in uh, and while analyzing all the species feeding together, we can it can be inferred that there is an overall uh, feeding relationship in a guild. And research also suggests that there may be some positive and negative effect of social feeding with regards to them, and uh, the work will establish the studied region as the important feeding site, uh, which harbors these species of conservation importance. 
uh, we can see uh, here in the best bathing individuals uh, this is the kind of behavior where they roll upon the uh, loose dust and they uh, try to groom themselves they, they try to groom their feathers and for hours they do such kind of activity to maintain their plumage to get rid of the ectoparasites also and this is the figure showing that they are socially feeding with uh, other species which uh, like black kites cattle egrets dogs and crows um, at now the egyptian vultures adults sub adults and juveniles we can see the rubbish dump and uh, the roots uh, egyptian vultures roosting on mahani trees at dry the really uh, we have also uh, done the breeding uh, studies and we have observed that the nesting is generally in the vicinity of human dwellings, utilizing the different nest materials from the surrounding. And the nests were made on ancient temples, trees, electricity pylons, water tanks, etc. And the nests are very large and tidy and quite complex with several layers in their nest. And they lay the egg between March and April. This is the observed breeding activity, and the uh, we uh, we have also observed uh, uh, analyzed different factors that were uh, uh, where they choose to nest. It's either it's near to the road, water body, human habitation, nearest neighbor, and what kind, what substrate height is there. So uh, we have observed that the Egyptian vulture prefer high nesting points, usually located in the undisturbed areas away from the human population but sparsely human populated and close to good quality food habitat food and water also a uh, nest material use study was also done and we have uh, we took the abandoned nest to the lab and we uh, analyzed the, the, the there are different materials they use for their nest construction and uh, maximum anthropogenic matter like linen wool clothes, rubber, thread, foam, etc. were used for the nest construction, followed by animal matter, like bones, cow dung, feces, and then plant matter, and some unidentified matters were there, which were dried up. So uh, these are the constituents of Egyptian vulture nest layers. They uh, make the nest very uh, in a very structured way, and uh, to protect their, their eggs, from uh, getting uh, they, to protect their nest from getting disturbed and any away from any kind of threat. The se uh, selection of uh, nest sites, materials, substrates are important in determining the breeding success of the bird species. And the two structured layer of the nest provided it the strength and durability and prevented it from fall falling apart. Old buildings were used and. Uh, most of the nest material was anthropogenic in nature and they prefer mature trees also to build their nest probably due to the fact that the large trees are necessary to hold their heavy nest and the, they uh, they have often seen reusing their nest and at one of our study sites at Rye Bareilly we have been observed and we have uh, did we did the questionnaire survey also and we uh, asked the local people that from how many years they are making the nest here on the temple to see they, they said that they are nesting there from 37 years around so they reuse their nest uh, this is the temple this is a glimpse of bed breeding sites studied in up and the, we can see the green cover and the temples uh, these this kind of temp there there is a, a breeding territory there and uh, there are seven uh, temples like this and egyptian vultures are utilizing all of the temples to make their nest um, they can easily camouflage there and the nest on the water tank we have observed this is the parent hatching the egg and this photo of the egg was taken from the drone because it was on very uh, a great height and uh, this is the courtship display uh, roosting in pair during the breeding season they have been seen roosting for hours in early morning hours and evening hours and the water body uh, in the vicinity of nesting and roosting substrate we have observed let's uh, uh, in general if we uh, uh, try if we uh, try to know about the threat to vultures 
we we say that that diclofenac is responsible for the mass decline of the species uh, vulture species but in case of egyptian vultures there are other threats also like ele electrocution uh, roosting on nesting site destruction feral dogs their aggressive behavior towards egyptian vultures the religious and spiritual or cultural myth if any prevalent and the lack of awareness uh, the maximum lack of awareness was observed in our study sites and we have seen that people uh, at some of our sites we have uh, observed that people are destroying their eggs because they consider them uh, the larger uh, uh, birds which kill the smaller birds and which are not good they are, uh, they uh, uh, they they uh, they generally uh, kill other birds that's why we destroy their uh, eggs from their nest so this kind of uh, lack of awareness and the uh, which is, it is very much harmful for a species which is already uh, globally endangered and if we, uh, we if we are doing maximum awareness on the on those sites then these this kind of uh, lack of awareness could be prevented feral dogs, road accidents, electrocution myths, and habitat destruction are the other threats. Um, this is the glimpse of threats observed in the study areas. Um, sometimes natural calamities are also very destructive for them and their nests get destroyed. Uh, conservation, if we go through the conservation approach, we can see that the, there are a number of vulture restaurants throughout the world which are running uh, uh, vulture conservation and breeding centers, vulture awareness campaigns are very important. Vulture safe zones uh, from BNHS, people are working uh, for making more and more vulture safe zones, vulture sanctuaries. So uh, to get, uh, together uh, at every level uh, in coordination with different departments, like, like archeology span department, also education department and uh, wildlife department, every department, veterinary department should uh, coordinate with each other to identify the threats, to identify the priority conservation areas, uh, and then um, uh, uh, mitigating those threats and doing some conservation efforts in collaboration. Uh, we did community parties, uh, we did uh, mass awareness because community participation plays a vital role in the development of capacity building for the management and utilization of the resources in a sustainable way. And the human impact on the global environment has triggered a mass extinction event of a significance on a geological time scale, as well as causing widespread changes in the global distribution of organisms. And we know that uh, how much it is important to aware people through different uh, approaches like campaigning, participatory learning, informal education, formal school-based interventions. And uh, a very important implication of our study was that the respondents started showing great interest in knowing about Egyptian vultures and their conservation. And this is very effective as overall in the whole UP, we have found that lack of awareness was found as a major causes of negligence, one of the major causes of negligence of the species towards uh, uh, their declination. And the key informants were very uh, helpful during the interview and involvement of local community has proved very much beneficial for the study. And these are responsible for generating the first hand information on the Egyptian vultures in the study areas. Um, we have organized different vulture con conservation workshops and trainings, and our lab uh, is directing to protect the vultures. Uh, and we uh, organize several training programs also among forest officials at school level, at college level, and direct interaction is also being done. Different types of uh, awareness materials, such as pamphlets, booklets, flyers, pocket calendars in local language has also been, has also been distributed among people in different sectors. We have organized workshops among forest officials also, bird watchers also, school students and common people. This is a glimpses of workshops and training programs organized at Katanya Ghat Wildlife Sanctuary um, and at Lucknow with bird watchers at Kastuba Vidyalaya and Suhelva UP. The, these girls were very much active in knowing about vultures and they were, uh, I specifically uh, mentioned this uh, is Kanya Mahavidyalaya because 
the in, in urban areas the school students are are they they are not knowing even that what is what vulture is first and then egyptian vultures is very uh, categorizing them is another task but in in this uh, mahavidyalay kanya mahavidyalay the girls were very uh, active and when i asked them about egyptian vultures they told me that egyptian vultures are white in color and they are different from other vultures and i was very much surprised to know their uh, their rea reaction towards my question and they were very active and in future also i would like to visit this uh, uh, particular uh, school to uh, do something for them because the, the girls are very active there and awareness program among common people is equally important at the study areas and on international vulture awareness day which is on uh, this year which uh, it's on 3rd september we organized several programs workshops among school students and we aware people aware students about vulture we do capacity building also uh, we uh, a team of active volunteers has been made uh, to spread the information regarding egyptian vultures and vultures in general to uh, at all the prominent sites in up and these volunteers are in continuous contact during the entire study and till date and they keep updating the information which is related to the egyptian vulture and vultures and their conservation so uh, we distributed awareness material in hindi also because uh, identification is uh, getting them identified correctly is very important so with pictures to print media and to uh, electronic media also from radio mirchi from every kind of social network like from facebook twitter instagram because the generation these days the present generation is more active on the social media so uh, at every level we should sensitize them we should share the things which are uh, important to know and which uh, which we uh, for it's our duty as a uh, researcher as a wildlife uh, uh, wildlife enthusiast to make people aware about our precious nature and wildlife and in con uh, conclusions uh, it is a responsibility of every wildlife researcher to disseminate the results of the work to the common people not be, uh, not only because science is a public knowledge but also to gain the confidence and support from the common people if researchers hope to continue being supported by local people and other institutions in collaboration they need to educate the people about vultures their importance and the need to conserve and study them so by revealing the scale of threats and by planning the future conservation activities the study will contribute to support the conservation of egyptian vulture in big part of its global range and strong in situ conservation program is also equally required with the present ex situ conservation programs and from our study we have inferred that uh, uh, egyptian vultures are communal roosters they roost uh, for so many arts on the grounds on trees on old buildings and electricity pylons and there are certain congregation sites in up which needs to be uh, protected and the study can be helpful in implementation of conservation policy at divisional level and seasonal scales also it also illustrates the capability of egyptian vultures to utilize different habitats different roof substrate as well as to point out the importance of these sites so uh, the, we we the study could help in developing the strategies and plans for uh, conservation and uh, recommendations are like we should preserve the old isolated and mature trees and there is a relationship with dump ground of slaughter houses and other agro based factories so these sites should be uh, certain like uh, according to the local uh, conditions of uttar pradesh we can have a, a vulture restaurant kind of thing to run here to protect these species and the protection of the legal slaughter houses and we can also go for the establishment of vulture restaurants uh, at the prominent priority uh, the areas which needs to be conserved their uh, communal roost site congregation sites and thus bathing habitats should be protected this is the glimpse of awareness activities done and at my study areas 
we have uh, done several awareness programs. We at every time when we go to the field, we try to educate people. We try to interact with local people to uh, let to know any if any information they have about their nest or and to educate them regarding their uh, status their, regarding the decline of the species. These are the publications and. professional experience, membership and scientific roles, uh, awards, which uh, you have already mentioned earlier in, during my introduction. Um, and I'm thankful to everyone. I'm thankful to each of uh, the, uh, each of you, each, each listener for patiently listening to my talk. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. Thank you, organizers, for inviting me for this national webinar. And sorry for the technical glitches in, in the earlier part of my talk. Let me thank Dr. Shivangi Mishra for uh, some. Uh, presentation highlighting the conservation concerns of Egyptian vulture, which we all know is uh, an important scavenger bird species. Yes, I'm sorry, somebody wants to speak? I'm sorry, sir, two minutes, DJ. Um, I think uh, Dr. Shivangi's passion reflects in her presentation, and uh, we wish her well, and we hope uh, all that she has in mind in a bit to reinstate a good number of Egyptian vultures and hopefully the other vulture species with which um, all species of int uh, interest interacts will also eventually uh, the numbers will revive. Uh, and again, as a chairperson, uh, let me take this privilege of asking her the first question. Uh, Dr. Shivangi, could you please yes. come on camera? That's okay for you. Yes, yes, sir. I'm opening it. I don't think you're anyway. If you're not comfortable, it's okay. I mean, I have one question no, to sir, ask you. I have you. already, already kept it on. on Ma'am, I at least I'm not able to see you. That's fine. But the question is before uh, my co chairperson Swami Singh Saab uh, gives his comments, if I may just be allowed to ask one or two questions. Yes. You spoke about something called the fallen yes. angel display. Uh, that seems to be very yes. curious. Uh, I am not aware of that, number one. Number two is. Did you, at any point of time in your investigation, find out what is the clutch size of Egyptian vulture as a bird? And the third thing which I noticed in your presentation was, which of course kept all of us very engaged and interested, but I felt uh, probably you chose not to share with us the empirical details of your data. So I'm very curious to know when you speak about a nesting material of Egyptian vultures, what has been your sample size for that analysis? Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. And uh, 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 the, for the very first question which you have asked, for the fa fallen angel display, it is it is a kind of dis di display which we have observed during the time time of threat, when they uh, when they face uh, when they when they uh, are in a field and we go near to them, and they sense that uh, any kind of threat is there to them, then they show this kind of display, and there are certain references of this. Uh, display their foraging uh, behavior uh, of this uh, fallen angel display. This is like more of like a uh, the position is like a fallen angel. So that's why they are named as. Well, so I think it's more to do with tonic immobility, if, if that is what you are hinting at. Yes. Tonic immobility. Yes. Sir. Okay, ma'am. Yes. The second thing, class size. <clears throat> the class size is sir, uh, maximum is three, but three is in extreme cases. The uh, only uh, one uh, egg is uh, has been observed to be successfully fleshed, uh, and uh, the maximum plus size is three. Other than that, two or one, and one is the most common which we have observed in our study. For nesting material, ke liye jo apne size sample. Uh... Yes, sir. For nesting material, as they are in uh, globally endangered already, and we know no, no, that no, they can be there. Like Ma uh, you didn't get my question. Your 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 analysis is on the basis of how many nests that you've examined. 
the five nests because that's what i am answering because they are globally endangered and harming their nest or going near to their nest is very matlab uh, i also feel like if they are using their nest for years then they might come and again use it so only five nests which were we have observed for years that they are abandoned and they they are not actively nesting in those five and so we we did like that i from think the, you need a little bit of statistical side. confidence in this part of your data but nonetheless i appreciate your concerns yes i'm done this, this I'm was the extra this was a extra kind of work from my other than from my thesis objects but i was very curious to know how they uh, choose the different nesting materials so that's why i tried to adopt I appreciate the, appreciate this, uh, thank you thank you so much ansari ji Yes, very good uh, build work. Uh, what is the life span of the bird? Life, 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 life span. Uh, how many years it survive? So the life, so the life span is uh, reported to have. Uh, it, it has thirty-seven years uh, in captivity, and in wild, it does not has been published. Thirty-seven uh, years. The size also varies it seems. And and from least concerned to the endangered category, suddenly jumping to that, what are what are the factors that you are? The diclone flag is one factor you have told already. Feral dogs, then other factors, yes. electricity, other factors. So from least it is of course I you are observing it is available everywhere. The the color is white and some yellowish we see, and the sizes also vary. So how is from least concerned to suddenly to endangered that we got? Sir, uh, we know that uh, no literature is there which is uh, reporting that the Egyptian vultures are affected by diclofenac so far. Nobody has done. Upon them that they the diclofenac is affecting Egyptian vultures in particular because the diclofenac is affecting the gyps in the gyps tenurostris and a white bag vulture gyps balances a lot. These three species are very much affected by diclofenac, but uh, on Egyptian vultures no such kind of effect of diclofenac has been reported. So. i uh, b- b- on the basis of my observations like uh, i think i have only uh, done work on egyptian vultures first and I, i'm just collecting the baseline data because nobody if you, uh, sometimes people are like if you google it and then you will get it then no sir because i have worked upon them and the data which i have and the data which i am publishing is from the work which i have done personally because it is my And so I have worked deeper on them, specifically on shin vultures. And so far, diclofenac uh, has been reported. And the, on the basis of my observations, I have observed that lack of awareness, aggressive behavior of feral dogs, and the electrocution is also the emerging threat to their population. And uh, uh, further work could be done on, uh, at this level. And uh, if we go. to the post mortem of the dead individuals and we go well, i think dr shivangi i think we have uh, dr tupali okay. waiting to ask a question please thank you ansari yes, yes dr tupali sir yeah but it's not a any question or something like that some observations and suggestions please, please, please. Uh, yes. wonderful talk and i congratulate uh, dr shivangi mishra because all these uh, rare and endangered species working on it is a challenge particularly field oriented work nowadays nowadays nobody is interested in field oriented work may, yes. they may be interested but you know the facilities they find are not available to them uh, fundamentally uh, the issue here is strategy and action plan for conservation and the sustainable you know management of the populations of these very rare and endangered species what i have observed is an addition to what uh, dr ansari has also said particularly it is the awareness that matters a lot and uh, it is the sepa communication education and public awareness this is what is required as you have also said and you are also surprised that somebody was giving very good information at local level yes. mostly if it is the nest that is damaged or something like that inadvertently or unknowingly this needs to be kind of you know created uh, with more awareness 
the institutional mechanisms that are available for us right now are one is the uh, biodiversity management committees of the biological diversity act where uh, we are preparing uh, people's biodiversity registers in these registers maybe you know uh, it is now i have all been i have all, also been advocating to both nba and the state biodiversity boards it is the qualitative information that is now is you know being recorded in the people's biodiversity registers what we need is the quantitative data if you have vultures there the egyptian vultures in that particular uh, the jurisdiction of uh, the bmc how many are there required simply saying egyptian vultures are there it is not going to help us any more then if we you know uh, experts like you can suggest what are the conservation measures that the you know at the level of uh, bmc it can take that is one thing and also you know the next mechanism what we have are the you know working plans of you know territorial divisions and you know the management plans of wildlife divisions so these also should be you know concentrating more they do concentrate and they get funds but community participated you know conservation mechanisms are the need of the hour because you know the institutional mechanism what we have even the cutting edge of rangers and foresters and other people they want they may not be in a position to devote that much of time so it is the you know uh, institutions like vss or edc or the bmcs these are the institutions that should be roped in and more of you know interdepartmental uh, cooperation that is uh, much required maybe you know uh, as you have we have been uh, working on this subject for quite a long time maybe now it is high time that you have to come out with some policy directions to the state and central governments on this of course there are already there but always a supportive mechanism is needed that is why i appreciate our uh, uh, mishra ji for organizing and bringing together so many people all across india yes, and uh, these are a few suggestions i wanted to make once again congratulations to dr shivani thank you so much thank any more questions please? i do, i i do have a question sir uh, yes, dr thank shivangi you. if you can hear me uh, yes, dr shivangi i am dr pratap singh from bikaner uh, i have been Hello. working on vultures uh, also and uh, yes. my uh, uh, two questions are yes. one is how to differentiate two sub species of uh, neophron Uh, that is percnopteris percnopteris and percnopteris majorensis and second question is why your public awareness programs were focused uh, on egyptian vulture only and why not on more critical uh, species like white backed or long billed okay sir okay sir so for the very first question which you have asked that uh, how we differentiated and although it was uh, also an extra work at another objectives because uh, i was very much curious to when i used to go to my field sites and i have observed uh, that there is a difference in the beak color the at the point uh, beak point is different in the two individuals then i was uh, like i was surprised that why it is the different the, uh, why why that there is a difference in the color of two individuals uh, sharing the same niche then i went through the literature and i i, I have gone through the book by rishad naroji in of in 2006 he mentioned in the book in birds of prey of indian subcontinent he has mentioned about the differences between the two races and then i tried to observe it more keenly and then uh, i have observed that the neophron pernopterus pernopterus has its beak tip uh, slightly blackish while the neophron pernopterus uh, gingianus has uh, ha uh, the beak tip uh, which is slightly pinkish or uh, uh, skin color so uh, other than this major prominent difference uh, other than this there is a size difference also in both the individuals like pernopterus pernopterus is the nominate species and it has a larger uh, size and the pernopterus uh, gingianus is smaller and there are other differences also which i have published and uh, i i have collected all the information which are, which is present globally on the, the two sub races and uh, then i published it uh, under a review section and i have wrote a review on the two sub species of egyptian vultures and the, uh, in detail the differences are mentioned in, the, in that manus manuscript uh, but the major difference is the beak color like the neophron pernopterus pernopterus is 
uh, blackish uh, beak has its uh, beak uh, black tip, tip black yeah. while the new form panoptus dindinianus is slightly pink, pinkish or uh, uh, skin color and the, the question which you have asked it was a very good question and <laughs> Uh, uh, you 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 can uh, ask it from me, but because I uh, my study uh, topic was on Egyptian vultures specifically, so uh, I try to and and the Egyptian vultures are uh, there in Uttar Pradesh uh, more in number in comparison to other vulture species. Like when we were doing the surveys, we have observed Egyptian vultures at maximum places and only certain places which are at the uh, boundary of UP and MP, like at Jhansi. And at other few places, we, we have observed other species also, and we have done awareness regarding them also. But uh, as my work was confined, work was specifically on Egyptian vultures. So uh, while doing the surveys on Egyptian vultures, while going to the study sites, and when we observe that the people there are very uh, ignorant about them, and they call that this is not a vulture. And at, at the very first uh, moment when I got disappointed was that when I, when I used to show the photos of Egyptian vulture to them, then they say, ye chil hai, ye gid hai nahi. So I was, I was like very, very much, it was a disappointing thing for me as I'm working on Egyptian vultures and they don't know that they are having uh, near their surroundings at the rural areas, at the semi-urban areas, that the, the Egyptian vultures are nesting, the Egyptian vultures are... Um, roosting on the specific trees and they don't know that this is a vulture and they only uh, they gen in general they what they know is that this is a chil it, 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 hai, aur hum isko vulture nahi mante. so it was very difficult for me also to make them understand that this is not a chil ye chil nahi hai ye gidd hai aur ye gidd ki sabse choti wali prajati hai to un logon ko ye samjhana is very important because they are living they they are sharing the niche with egyptian vultures they are Living close their nesting sites. And Dr. Shivangi, I think you have answered uh, Dr. Saab's question. And okay. if there are no more questions, then I will Thank request Swami Singhji to kindly do the meeting. Thank, Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. Swami Singh Saab. Sir, aapke awaj nahi aari hai. No, still, we cannot hear you. Hello, are we are here. Abhi sunai de raha hai, sir. Okay. Shivangi, I have two questions from you. And yes, uh, you have also talked about the habitat preferences of uh, vultures. Yes, sir. So, uh, can you tell me what uh, areas are preferred by vultures? especially this uh, yes, Egyptian vulture areas means urban or rural, rural. So, and why sir, as I mentioned in my talk they prefer semi-urban areas more like not the completely urban and neither it is completely rural it is the semi-urban kind of uh, area and why they prefer this specific uh, areas because they utilize the anthropogenic materials for their nest building and they uh, they, they they are very they are not selective in their uh, uh, diet and so they uh, sometimes they have been observed feeding upon the refusals by the human beings so that might be the reason why they prefer the semi urban areas uh, for their okay and nesting. second question is regarding the nesting uh, behavior so what uh, nesting sites they prefer, whether they prefer this, they nest on trees or rocks, old buildings, uh, monuments? So generally, okay, so, uh, question. Uh, generally, they prefer the cliffs, mountain cliff. Every vulture species prefer to cliff, nest on the cliff. But as we know that in Uttar Pradesh, we don't have such kind of cliffs. So they uh, they have seen maximum nesting on, we have observed maximum nesting on ancient temples. There are certain, uh, like in uh, Orcha, we have seen that on Raja Ram Mandir and on Mahalakshmi temple, we have observed that there is a nesting of Egyptian. So, so here in UP, there are certain ancient temples which are uh, very much old, like two, two to three hundred years old. So they 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 have uh, seen uh, they have been observed maximum uh, uh, on those uh, ancient temples and other than that on trees also we have observed their nests on ficus species uh, and on water tanks also 
like like they uh, they prefer the areas which are safer for them and we, they 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 first identify the substrate and then they identify that if there is any feed, feeding site or uh, water body nearby to their nesting so that they can easily go for the foraging purpose and they can have a water body also near their nesting sites okay what are other uh, tree species preferred by the vultures besides this uh, egyptian vulture like for gypsy vultures what are the tree species which they utilize for nest sir semal semal papers are based on the semal trees they have been observed nesting on which vulture uh, ficus is so gyps uh, i i think uh, if if they uh, okay. uh, uh, in ocha i have gone uh, through the ceno taps and the, they are they are nesting uh, on the ceno taps uh, on the old ceno taps so uh, gyps indicus are nesting on there but, but i have i do not know that they do not prefer tree nesting much okay <laughs> but if they if there is any kind of like they, they do not have uh, uh, any other option then in in case of uh, egyptian vultures they prefer and otherwise they do not prefer and in gyps also they do not prefer nesting okay thank you thank you so much they, dr shivangi not get the Doctor, yeah. I would like to add means uh, uh, vultures. They are opportunistic uh, in their breeding uh, habits. I've seen here in desert them uh, breeding on a cedary tree, which is not very huge tree. So means uh, it all depends. Yes, We all know that. It yes, depends upon it all the depends. situation. Yes, yes. What kind of vegetation uh, yes. suits them in the habitat? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Sir, what was my uh, objective of asking this question actually vulture they are heavy sized birds especially the gypsy vultures so unke liye habitat bhi sir aise jo trees like uh, uh, semal bataya madam ne arjun tree hai ya uh, arjun hai yeah kehwa i have seen in my own village in satna district kehwa to ye jo old trees hain bade wide stem जिसका बहुत ज्यादा कैनोपी होता है उनमें जो तो ये नेस्टिंग करते हैं और अभी तो आप देखिए ओल्ड ये सारे ट्रीज आपको मिलेंगे नहीं वन ऑफ द रीजन फॉर देयर डिक्लाइन आई सीन टू स्पीशीज ब्रीडिंग टुगेदर एक यहाँ से 70 किलोमीटर फ्रॉम हियर बीकानेर से आई सीन वाइट दिस लॉन्ग बिल्ड एंड इजिप्शियन ब्रीडिंग ऑन सेम ट्री देख ट्री एंड ब्रीडिंग एट द सेम टाइम it's so not for all the like government development projects uh, whether it's a uh, construction of the highways uh, widening of roads in mein jo aapke jo old trees hain even villages mein it, yes sir. old trees yes, ko sir. yes and it is giving yeah. no it because we have spoiled its habitat quite naturally it will come into the human habitation so you know it's uh, very important as it is raised all uh, age old and even we are saying that uh, certain uh, Uh, trees should be declared as heritage trees these are all on paper yes. you know when it comes to action still we are like thank you i think we've had reasonably good discussions and deliberations and uh, dr shivangi should be happy that you have elicited a lot of interest in your work so if there are no more yes, queries sir. uh, uh dr somi singh ji kindly yes, uh, consult so uh, ye last uh, last session tha aaj ka एक्चुअली दो टॉक जो है वो हो नहीं पाई है भास्कर जो असम से डॉक्टर भास्कर चौधरी का क्योंकि वहाँ पे गुवाहाटी में आज एग्जाम के कारण नेट पूरा बंद है तो वो टॉक नहीं हो सकती थी पहले चार बजे तक था अब छह बजे तक हो गया वहाँ कोई एग्जाम चल रहा है और दूसरा छनगानी साहब जो कि इसमें टॉक देने वाले थे लेकिन कुछ उनसे यूनिवर्सिटी का इशू आ गया है तो उनको इस समय पे जो है जयपुर बुलाया गया है बीकानेर से तो ये दो टॉक हम आगे रिशेड्यूल करेंगे और इन्फॉर्म करेंगे डॉक्टर थोपाली सर वी विल इन्फॉर्म यू रिशेड्यूल प्रोग्राम एंड डॉक्टर अनिरुद्ध मजूमदार सर ऑलरेडी भास्कर चौधरी give uh, me time uh, on uh, 4 september next sunday 4 september evening session uh, 
सर ये जायसन सर चेयर पर्सन एंड यू आर को चेयर पर्सन तो प्लीज गिव योर टाइम फॉर फोर सेप्टेंबर थैंक यू ऑल ऑफ यू थैंक यू शिवांगी मिठा जी आज बहुत कम लोग थे मिठा जी यस सर आज सोलह लोग थे सत्रह लोग थे अरे बच्चों को स्ट्रेस लगाइए सबको हाँ सर बच्चों को हमने यूट्यूब में जोड़ रखा है क्योंकि तो यहाँ पे थोड़ा डिस्टर्ब होता है उनके आ जाने से कई बार ओपन हो रहता है तो ये यूट्यूब में हम करते हैं सर यूट्यूब वाला से चल रही है लाइट चल रही है कल कल टू फिफ्टी से ऊपर उन लोगों ने सुना है और यूट्यूब साथ में हम चला रहे हैं लाइव हाँ हाँ उसमें हम जोड़ते हैं लेकिन कभी कभी डिस्टर्ब हो जाता है बच्चों के कारण तो इसलिए हमने उसको जो है यूट्यूब में लाइव चल रही है ये और बाद में यूट्यूब हम शेयर भी करेंगे पे भी हम शेयर करते हैं मिस्टर अलकेश म्यूट योर माइक का मिस्टर अलकेश सॉरी उसको थोड़ा इंक्लूड करना है हाँ, हम कोशिश करते हैं यदि समय मिलेगा हाँ, तो हाँ जरूर करेंगे या नहीं या अगर अपने पास थोड़ा सा स्पेसिंग मिले तो हम उसको भी आज, करते हैं तो आज का समय जरूर आ, आ, अभी एक टॉक का था क्योंकि दो टॉक नहीं हो पाई थी तो इसमें हाँ सर लेकिन आज क्या हो गया जब मैंने कल रात बात हुई थी और उसके बाद हम सो गए एक्चुअली हमने ट्राई आज भी तीन चार स्पीकर से ट्राई किया लेकिन समय नहीं मिल पाया डॉक्टर सत्यनारायण चेन्नई से जी राम जी राम दो लोगों से और एस पी मेहरा से बात करी उदयपुर में लेकिन सब लोग इंगेज थे इसलिए आज मिल नहीं पाए है एक टाइम प्लाट खाली था उसके लिए मैं बात कर रहा था कोई बात नहीं मैं उससे उसको बोलूंगा आप, आपको फोन से बात कर ले एक्चुअली सर डॉक्टर भास्कर ने ये कहा था कि इस चार बजे के बाद गुवाहाटी में आ, नेट आ जाएगा लेकिन वो टाइम बढ़ के छह बजे तक हो गया ओके सर थैंक यू ऑल ऑफ यू सर थैंक यू थैंक यू थैंक यू मिश्रा जी गुड नाइट इसे बंद कर दें मुझे इसको ऊपर से बंद कर दें अभी तो यहाँ से बंद करना पड़ेगा मैंने बेटा देखो